let's get into endocrine. So endocrine is going to be a long one, guys. So I'll try to go through the main points, okay? So acromegaly. Acromegaly is basically excess secretion of growth hormone, okay? And it's usually seen in older adults after the plates, growth plates have closed, okay? We do not want to confuse this with gigantism, right? So gigantism is found in children. Acromegaly is usually in adults after the growth plates have fused, okay? The most common cause is going to be somatotroph. So it's basically a somatotroph adenoma of the anterior, anterior pituitary, which is secreting growth hormone. It can also be caused um, iatrogenically, okay? and it can also be caused by like ectopic growth hormone release, like from a lung cancer, carcinoid tumors, pancreatic islet cell tumors. So, once again, acromegaly is a disorder of the insulin growth factor, which causes excessive growth of the hands, feet, jaw, and internal organs in adulthood for these patients. So how is this patient going to be presenting? So I briefly mentioned it. Usually in the question stem, it'll tell you a patient where their glove, their ring, their shoes, they don't fit anymore. And with these patients, basically they're going to have a soft tissue proliferation proliferation and coarsening of the facial features. So like I discussed, they're going to have a growth of their hands, their feet, their jaw, their internal organs. These patients are usually um, going to have, they tend to be more prone to getting uh, colon polyps and colon cancer. So that's why we make sure that we want to order a colonoscopy after we diagnose the patient with acromegaly. Also, these patients can present with acanthosis nigricans because they have insulin resistance. And then also these patients can be presenting with like voice changes, excess sweating with these patients. And then they can also get a uh, cardiomegaly. So they can get in a really enlarged heart. And this is usually the cause of death in most of these patients is um, they get like a very, very large heart. So how are you going to diagnose this patient? So the best test and the best confirmatory, confirmatory test for acromegaly is going to be the oral glucose suppression test, okay? So once again, the best test is going to be your oral, um, oral glucose suppression test. And then after you do that, you're going to measure the growth hormone after two hours. Usually the growth hormone is going to be suppressed by glucose. And if it is suppressed during the first test and the patient does not have acromegaly. But if it's not suppressed and the patient has acromegaly. But if it asks you what's the best initial test, then you're going to be your insulin growth factor. Okay. But the most accurate test is going to be the oral glucose suppression test. Okay. Once again, your patient that presents with acromegaly, they're going to have the coarsening of the features, right? They're going to have large hands, like a large jaw, just they're getting bigger in general and you think that it's due to acromegaly, with these patients, what you wanna do, if it asks you what's the best initial test, you're gonna do an insulin growth factor. If it tells you what's the most accurate test, you're gonna do an oral glucose suppression test, okay? With these patients, like we said, we also wanna do a colonoscopy because these patients are more prone to getting colon cancer. And we also do an echocardiogram, okay? Because these patients can have developed cardiomegaly with these patients. And then of course, we're gonna do an MRI also, okay? And, and the MRI is usually gonna show a pituitary tumor in 90% of these patients that have acromegaly. So what's gonna be the treatment? So the first line treatment is going to be a transphenoidal surgery in all the patients. So you're gonna go in there and you're gonna remove the pituitary adenoma. Second line is usually gonna be medical treatment. So you can give them something like octiotride. So these are somatostatin analogs. So octiotride. So once again, first line treatment is going to be what? Transphenoidal surgery for these patients. And then second line is going to be medical treatment like octiotride. Okay. Another one I had a question on for uh, acromegaly was asking me, like, what would you do in clinic and... It didn't have the choice of doing an insulin growth factor. And with these patients, what you're going to do is you're going to compare them to a previous photo. So you're going to ask them if the patient has a previous photo of how they used to look. And you can tell the difference on their facial features. And that can also help you aid in the diagnosis for acromegaly. I had a question on one of these, so I thought that was pretty interesting. 
So in general, this is a very, very highly tested subject and it's high yield. So I'm gonna go over it one more time real quick. So acromegaly is due to what? It's uh, due to an excess secretion of growth hormone. It's seen in older adults after the growth plates have fused. The most common cause is gonna be a somatotroph adenoma of the anterior pituitary. These patients have cardiac problems. They can develop cardiomegaly. It's really important that we do an echocardiogram on these patients and also we do colonoscopy because these patients are at high risk for getting colorectal cancer. The best way to diagnose these patients and the best initial one is going to be an insulin growth factor. The most accurate test is going to be with an oral glucose suppression test, followed by a growth hormone measurement after two hours. Okay. And then the treatment is going to be transphenoidal surgery for these patients. This is curative. If this isn't, if you can't do this for some reason, then you would do. Uh, medical treatment like octreotide, okay? And then with these patients, remember they're going to be presenting with the coursing of the facial features. They'll have like, uh, it'll be a patient that say that their gloves don't fit anymore, their shoes don't fit anymore. What's the one with the hat, remember? So the one with the hat where the hat doesn't fit anymore, we want to think about a pagistis, pagistis disease. But with these patients, they're going to say that their ring finger doesn't fit anymore, etc. Okay, guys, so let's go into Addison's disease. This one's also very, very highly tested. So Addison's disease is also known as adrenal insufficiency. So you have an insufficiency, okay? So in adrenal insufficiency, all of the cortex is damaged. So we have the little hat, right, on the kidney. The cortex is damaged, all of it. And when the cortex is damaged, you lose your aldosterone, your cortisol, and your androgen production. So with these patients, basically, they're, they're going to have a lack of cortisol and aldosterone. And the most common cause of Addison's disease is usually autoimmune, okay? So there's adrenal atrophy. But infection like tuberculosis, HIV, fungal infections is the most common cause worldwide. So make sure that you know this. So the most common cause for um, Addison's disease is going to be usually in the U.S. it's going to be autoimmune, so it's usually adrenal atrophy versus worldwide. An infection like tuberculosis, HIV, is going to be the most common cause of Addison's disease. So how is this patient going to present? So the key findings you need to know about this patient is that they're going to be presenting with weakness, weight loss, and hyperpigmentation. Weakness, weight loss, and hyperpigmentation for these patients. They're also going to be presenting with hypotension. They'll be saying that they crave a lot of salt for these patients. Okay, So for the hyperpigmentation, usually it's going to be like under the, the arm. They also can have it under the creases. And you want to also look for bluish dark gums for these patients. So another thing about these patients is that like we stated, they're going to be presenting with orthostatic hypotension, okay? So they're going to be feeling dizzy, syncope. So what about their lab works? This is something you need to know because you are definitely going to have a question on this. These patients are going to be presenting with hyperkalemia, hypotension, and hyponatremia. Once again, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypotension. So that's going to be how they're going to be presenting also for these patients, okay? And they can also be presenting with hypoglycemia. They'll have a non-ion gap metabolic acidosis, but the ones for sure I got tested on was hypotension, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia for Addison's disease. So how are you gonna diagnose these patients? So basically, you're gonna diagnose them by an ACTH stimulation test, okay? So you're gonna do an ACTH stimulation test for these patients. That's how you're gonna diagnose them. So basically, you administer the ACTH, and then you measure the cortisol and ACTH levels and how it responds, okay? If the cortisol remains low, then you have primary Addison's disease. If the cortisol increases and then you have a low ACTH, then you have secondary cause of um, Addison's disease, okay? And then what are some of the uh, secondary causes? It's usually going to be due to the pituitary, right? So you'll have low ACTH and low cortisol where the pituitary is not responding to the cortico, uh, to the CRH. Okay. 
versus the primary, which is Addison's, which we're talking about, which is involves the adrenal gland. So it does involve the pituitary. So we have the brain up here, the pituitary gland. It doesn't involve the pituitary sending signals to the adrenal gland. That's primary. It's the adrenal gland itself that's not working. Versus secondary, the adrenal gland is working, but the pituitary gland is just not sending signals to the adrenal gland, okay? That makes sense, right? So if you do the ACTH test, okay? So if you do the ACTH test, for example, and the cortisol increases, then you have secondary, which makes sense, right? Because there's nothing telling the adrenal gland, but if you add it yourself, then the adrenal gland's gonna respond. Versus primary, if you do the test and the cortisol remains still low, then you have primary because it's the adrenal gland itself that's not working. So how are you gonna how else are you gonna diagnose these patients? You're gonna do a CT scan of the adrenal glands and then a pituitary MRI if you suspect that it's due to a secondary cause of Addison's um, a secondary cause. But you'll usually do a CT of the adrenal glands if you think it's a primary cause for Addison's disease. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? Treatment's usually gonna be steroid replacement. You're gonna do steroid replacement for life, okay? You're gonna give them glucocorticoids plus mineral corticoids for these patients. So another thing I wanna talk about is Addisonian's crisis, so adrenal crisis. This is basically an acute adrenal cortical insufficiency. This is where there's sudden worsening of adrenal insufficiency due to a stressful event. So if the patient had a trauma, if they had surgery, surgery is usually the most common one you'll see on your question stems. Or if they were had some type of like infection, like a fever, a sepsis, myocardial infarction, or even if they withdrew the steroids um, very abruptly. So this is an emergency, okay? The most common cause is going to be abrupt withdrawal of glucocorticoids. The most common cause of Addisonian crisis is going to be abrupt withdrawal of glucocorticoids, okay? So how is this patient going to present? Basically, they're, they're, these patients are going to have a history of adrenal insufficiency, and it's just the adrenal insufficiency just got worse because the patient was put in a stressful situation, like we said Um whether it was a sepsis, the patient had a heart attack, they just had surgery. And these patients are going to be presenting with basically shock, okay? They'll be hypovolemic, they'll be hypotensive, okay? They'll have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, fever, weakness, lethargy. They can be also be in a coma. For labs, you're going to do a BMP, and it's going to show you what? Remember, we're discussing for Addison's disease, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and then hypoglycemia. Okay, for these patients, you want to get cortisol levels, ACTH, and CBC. And treatment is that we want to correct their hypotension. So we're going to give them IV fluids. We want to correct their hypovolemia. And if the patient's hypoglycemia, then we can give them dextrose. We also give them IV glucocorticosteroids, right? We're going to give them IV hydrocortisone if we know it's Addison's. And then we want to make sure we're treating their electrolyte disorders. So we want to make sure we're treating their hyponatremia, their hyperkalemia, because hyperkalemia is deadly, okay? It can develop into arrhythmias. We want to treat their hypoglycemia, their hypercalcemia. So once again, I want to go over the high-yield topics for Addison's disease because this is a very, very high-yield topic you're going to get on your exam. So what is uh, Addison's disease due to? It's due to a primary deficiency of cortisol and aldosterone due to atrophy of the adrenal cortex. So I had a question where they tried to trick me in regards to the pathophysiology of Addison's disease. So make sure that you know that you know that it's because of the atrophy of the little hat right on the kidney, the adrenal cortex. These patients are going to be presenting with weakness, they'll have weight loss, and usually the one that will give it away is going to be hyperpigmentation, okay? Hyperpigmentation. You're going to diagnose these patients with ACTH stimulation tests. You have a primary cause and a secondary cause. Primary is the adrenal gland itself is atrophied. Secondary it has to do with the pituitary, okay? The pituitary is not sending signals to adrenal gland. Treatment for these patients are going to be steroid replacement therapy for life. And remember, on their labs, they're going to be what? Hyperkalemic. They're going to be hypotensive and hyponatremia. Also, these patients are going to be metabolic acidosis, and they have, they're going to have increased renin. 
All right, guys, so we're done with that one. So why don't we go into Cushing's disease now, okay? Cushing's disease. This one's very common. You were definitely going to have a question with, these, with this one also. So Cushing's disease is due to an ACTH-secreting pituitary tumor. It's due to hypersecretion of cortisol, okay? So there's basically hypercortisolism. There's an excess amount of cortisol, okay? So... Cushing's syndrome is usually caused by a pituitary ACTH secreting tumor, pituitary tumor, I don't know why. Hey guys, I want to apologize. I was just uh, looking through my videos and if I go back and re-record them and delete them, it's going to take me a while. So I want to apologize about my lips. They're falling apart when I was talking and my lips are just very, very sensitive. I'm having to apply drink, I'm having to apply a lot of like lipstick on them and having to drink a lot of water or else they get really dehydrated and they start falling apart. So I fixed them right now, so I'm sorry if it happens again. Sometimes I don't even notice, but they just start falling apart, and I'm sorry about that. It looks really gross. But hey, we're in medicine, so... Um, so the next topic I wanted to discuss was Cushing's disease, okay? Or Cushing's syndrome. So Cushing's... Basically, what happens is that uh, there's an ACTH secreting pituitary tumor that causes hypersecretion of cortisol, okay? So make sure you, you know the difference between uh, Cushing's syndrome and then you know the difference between Cushing's disease. So with Cushing's syndrome, there is hypercortisolism. Basically, there's Cushing's syndrome is a sign and symptom of cortisol excess, okay? Versus uh, Cushing's disease, it's usually caused by a pituitary ACTH secreting tumor, uh, usually the pituitary adenoma. Okay, so... How is the patient going to present with Cushing's? They're going to be presenting with hypertension, hyperglycemia, okay? Osteoporosis, so they'll have metabolic alkalosis, hypokalemia, mood swings, they usually be depressed. They're going to be presenting with diabetes, and it's most commonly found in a female. There's several causes for Cushing's. Basically, you have exogenous causes, and then you have endogenous causes. So exogenous causes is usually iatrogenic. Uh, the most common cause is usually going to be due to a high dose corticosteroid therapy versus for the endogenous causes. The most common cause is going to be um, ACTH over secretion by a pituitary adenoma. Okay, but the most common cause overall for Cushing's is usually going to be a uh, long term high dose corticosteroid therapy. So it's more commonly found in female. Okay. And especially, it's going to be common in females between the age of 25 to 40 years old. How is this patient going to present with Cushing's? So this patient is going to be presenting with hypertension. They'll have weight gain, especially the central trunk obesity. So it's also known as a buffalo hump, right? These patients are also going to be presenting with striae, hypokalemia, metabolic L. Glosis, okay, they'll have the moon faces, so like that round face, the buffalo hump, um, supraclavicular fat pads also. I highlighted that because it was something I had question on. So metabolic alkalosis, supraclavicular fat pads. They'll be presenting with hyperglycemia or insulin resistance, so diabetes mellitus or glucose intolerance. They can also have acanthosis nigricans because remember we talked about acanthosis nigricans being associated with um, hyperglycemia. These patients are also going to be presenting with hypokalemia. They're going to be depressed, like we said. They'll have skin atrophy, easy bruising, uh, increased infections, especially fungal infections, hyperpigmentation also. They'll have symptoms of androgen excess, like for example, hirsutism, which is going to be like they'll have hair and females um, don't have hair, right? So hair in like the face, facial hair, oily skin, rash, and on exam, you'll see the patient's going to have hirsutensin, like we said, purple striae on the abdomen, increased fat around the neck, trunk, and acne, and then hyperpigmentation. So how are you going to diagnose these patients? So what we're going to do is the first test is we're going to do an overnight dexamethasone suppression test for one day, okay? Usually a normal response with these tests, the cortisol is suppressed. But since these patients have so much cortisol, there's going to be no suppression with the dexamethasone test. So this is going to tell us that the patient has Cushing's, okay? Cushing's syndrome. Or you can also do a 24-hour urine-free cortisol, 
where it's going to confirm overnight DEXA, um, that is used to confirm overnight dexamethasone tests. And this is actually going to be the most accurate one. It's going to be the 24-hour urine-free cortisol for these patients. So how are you going to differentiate the causes of Cushing's? Okay, High-dose dexamethasone suppression test is going to help you to do this. Basically, what happens is that if there is no suppression, when you do the high dose dexamethasone suppression tests, and we want to know that we want to think that there's going to be maybe like an ectopic or adrenal ACTH producing temp tumor versus if there's suppression with the high dose dexamethasone test, then it's going to be Cushing's and we can safely say that it's going to be Cushing's disease. Okay. So if we think that it's a secondary cause of Cushing's and we can do an MRI and sometimes we'll find a a pituitary tumor on there. So, if the um, so with this high dose dexamethasone test, what you want to do is you want to check the ACTH levels. Okay, if the ACTH level is low, then we're going to know it's an adrenal tumor, and then that's where we can do a CT scan of their test and abdomen to look at the adrenals. Versus if the ACTH is high, then that's when we think about an ectopic or pituitary tumor. And this is, like I said, this is where we're going to do the MRI. And then we're going to find the pituitary tumor. Treatment is always going to be the removal of the, uh, whatever is causing it. So if it, remember we said the most common cause of Cushing's is usually going to be due to uh, the use of corticosteroids. So the excess use of corticosteroids. So with these patients, what we want to do is that we want to gradually taper their steroids. Why? Because we want to prevent Addisonian crisis. So that's why we want to make sure that we're gradually tapering their steroids. Okay. And if it's a pituitary tumor that's causing the Cushing's and we want to make sure that we go in there and we get rid of it. Also certain lung cancers can cause Cushing's. So the most common one's going to be small cell lung cancer. So we want to go in there and surgically remove it. And then <clears throat> if it's due to a pituitary cause, and of course we can do the transphenoidal uh, surgery, okay? So in general for uh, Cushing's, just make sure that you know that with these patients, they're gonna be presenting with the buffalo hump, right? They'll have that purple striae, they'll have the supraclavicular fat pads, they're gonna be metabolic oclotic, they'll have that moon faces, so that those round faces with these patients. They're gonna have insulin resistance, to diagnose, the first test you're going to do is going to be a low-dose overnight dexamethasone suppression test, okay? This is going to tell you whether the patient has Cushing's or not, and if they have a normal response, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be, the, the cortisol is going to be uh, suppressed, but if they have no suppression whatsoever and the cortisol is still high, then that's when we want to think about Cushing's, right? And then we're also going to do a 24-hour urine cortisol you can do that. This one's going to help you confirm, um, confirm, and this is actually going to be the most accurate, and it's going to be an overnight dexamethasone test, okay? And to differentiate the cause, whether it's uh, due to a secondary cause, like a lung cancer or a pituitary adenoma, that's where we do the high-dose dexamethasone suppression test, right? So basically with these patients, what we do is that if we see that the ACTH is high after the high dose dexamethasone test, then we think it's probably due to a pituitary or ectopic tumor like small cell lung cancer. If we do it and the ACTH is low, then we know it's associated with the adrenal tumor, okay? And then treatment is always going to be removal of the cause. The most common cause is going to be usually uh, the use of steroids, so excess use of steroids. We want to make sure that we gradually taper the steroids, not completely get rid of them, because the patient can go into Addisonium crisis. If it's due to a pituitary tumor, then we want to make sure we go in there like transphenoidally and get remove it. If it's due to small cell lung cancer, we want to go in there and uh, treat the cancer. And then usually Cushing's is due to what? It's hypercortisolism, okay? So if it's a tumor... Um, it's causing hypersecretion of cortisol, okay? So that's basically Cushing's, okay? Let's go into diabetes insipidus. So diabetes insipidus is basically an inability to concentrate the urine, okay? 
basically there's low ADH, so antidiuretic hormone vasopressin that's low, and it's usually due to posterior pituitary disease. But there's different types. We'll go into each one. We have our nephrogenic and the central, which is the most common one. But the posterior pituitary disease is the most common one, so that's why I'm discussing this, just saying that right now. Okay. So basically, the patient is going to have deficient antidiuretic hormone action, which is going to have decreased uh, free water absorption. The patient's going to be passing a large amount of dilute urine with uh, urine osmolarity. Okay, so low ADH causes lots of dilute urine, so more than three liters per day. So how is this patient going to present? Basically, it's going to be more commonly found in females. They can present at any age. And like we discussed, we have central and nephrogenic. Central is going to be the most common one with these patients. So some of the causes for central is usually idiopathic, but the ones you will see on your exam, it's because the patient has some type of head trauma. So it'll say the patient wasn't involved in a motor vehicle accident months ago, years ago. In addition, it can be due to a pituitary uh, tumor or because the patient had neurosurgery. Okay. And all of these, what happens is that they damage the hypothalamus or the posterior pituitary, which causes diabetes insipidus. We also have nephrogenic, which involves the kidney, which is basically kidney resistance to the antidiuretic hormone. Versus central, it's because you have decreased secretion of the antidiuretic hormone. Nephrogenic is going to be kidney resistance to the antidiuretic hormone. Causes of this is going to be certain drugs like lithium toxicity if they have renal diseases, hypokalemia if the patient's pregnant, and like we said, if they're taking certain medications. Also, if they have hypercalcemia, if they have sickle cell, hyperparathyroidism, how is this patient going to present? Basically, they're going to be saying that this patient has polyuria, so they're going to the restroom a lot, okay? And they're urinating, but their urine is not dense. They're also going to be very, very thirsty with these patients. They'll have nocturia, so they'll be going, they'll be going to the restroom at night. So they'll be craving for water and liquids, and they'll be having problems with their fissure defects, which makes sense, right? If they have some type of pituitary tumor that it's obstructing the optic chiasm, they can have visual field deficits with these patients. They'll have inappropriately dilated urine and they'll have increased serum osmolality. So the serum osmolality is going to be uh, larger than the urine osmolality. They may or may not have hypernatremia. These patients are usually going to present with uh, dehydration, hypotension, okay? How are you going to diagnose this patient? The best initial test is going to be with a water deprivation test. So basically, you tell the patient not to take water, and you measure their urine volume, their osmolality, and then their plasma, specifically the sodium. Basically, this patient's going to be unable to increase urine concentration. It even stays dilute, even if the patient has not drank fluids, which is mind-boggling, right? So... When you drink a lot of water, you go to the restroom, your urine's dilute, right? It's like a clearer. With these patients, they aren't even drinking water, okay? And they're still creating dilute urine. Another one you can do is going to be desmopressin challenge tests. And this is going to be done once you've diagnosed the patient has diabetes insipidus and you want to tell whether it's a central or nephrogenic cause. So we've done the water deprivation test, right? And we're like, okay, this patient has diabetes insipidus because they can't concentrate their urine. Then you're going to be like, okay, now I want to know, is it nephrogenic? Is it because their kidneys aren't working? Or is it something centrally with their brain? So this is where you do the desmopressin challenge test, okay? Basically, if you have a positive test, then it's going to tell you that it's something due to the central cause, right? Which makes sense, right? That kidney is working, but it's not receiving the signal from the brain. So that's why if you give the ADH, you do it for you do it, you give the ADH, the kidney is going to respond and this is going to be a positive result. So if you do have this, you want to get an MRI of the pituitary to see if there's any type of uh, tumor going on there. If the patient has a negative result with the desmopressin challenge test, the urine does not concentrate even with the desmopressin, then we want to think about nephrogenic because it tells you that the brain is sending the signal, but the kidneys are not responding. And with this, we want to do an ultrasound of the kidneys. So what's going to be our treatment for these patients. 
So if it's central diabetes insipidus, then we want to do intranasal desmopressin, okay? If it's nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, then we want to do hydrochlorothiazide. Um, this is going to help the patient. We also can give them uh, endomethacin, hydration, dietary salt restriction to avoid whatever is causing also the diabetes insipidus if the patient's on certain drugs to so make sure to tell the patient to stop taking those drugs. Okay. And if it's uh, pregnancy induced, um, then we can do um, also, uh, and if it's pregnancy induced, it's usually due because of vasopressinase from the placenta. So usually the prognosis tends to depend on whatever is the cause of uh, diabetes insipidus. So once again, diabetes insipidus, the patient is going to be very thirsty. They're going to be urinating a lot. They can't concentrate their urine. With these patients, you're going to start with the water deprivation test. This is going to tell you that the patient has diabetes insipidus. They won't be able to increase their urine concentration, even if they haven't drank any water. Once you know it's diabetes insipidus, then you want to make sure to rule out whether it is due to a nephrogenic, so it's the kidneys that aren't working, or is it something centrally in the brain? Once you do that, you're going to do that with the desmopressin challenge test. You're going to give it to these patients. If they have a positive result, basically the urine concentrates with desmopressin, then it's going to be a central cause. You're going to get an MRI of the pituitary. If you get a negative result, the urine still doesn't concentrate. Even with desmopressin, it's going to be nephrogenic, so you're going to get an ultrasound of the kidneys. Okay. Treatment, if it's central, you're going to do intranasal desmopressin. If it's nephrogenic, Diabetes insipidus, you're going to give them something like hydrochlorazide. You can give them amylaride, which is a potassium sparing diuretic, endomethazine, uh, tell them to hydrate, okay? And if it's due to some type of medication that the patient is taking, to make sure that they avoid that agent. All right, guys, so let's go into diabetes. So diabetes is going to be huge, huge portion. So I'll spend some good time talking about diabetes. So we have two types, right? We have diabetes type 1, and then we have diabetes type 2. So the most common type in children is going to be diabetes type 1, okay? This is usually autoimmune. It's an autoimmune destruction of insulin-producing um, beta cells. So basically the islet of the pancreas, which causes permanent insulin deficiency, okay? Versus type 2 diabetes mellitus, this is usually found in older people. Books tend to differ between the ages. Um, I live currently in the valley, that's where I'm going to school, the valley, that's what we call the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, it's like the southern part of Texas. Uh, we have so many diabetic patients here, everyone here has diabetes and their mothers have diabetes. And diabetes mellitus type 2 usually can be found in very, very young patients. So in regards to like textbook wise, I've read textbooks that say that diabetes mellitus 2 is commonly found in patients older than 40. But I don't know if that's the case here in the Valley. For sure not the case. It's definitely found in patients younger than 40. But just for, I think osmosis is the one that said that, just for uh, peace of mind, it's found apparently diabetes mellitus in patients older than 40. And then diabetes type 1 is commonly found in children. So diabetes mellitus type 2 is usually due to insulin resistance and relative insulin deficiency versus Type 1, we said it's due to they're not producing insulin whatsoever or ever at all because there's autoimmune destruction of the beta cells um, islet of the pancreas, okay? Usually type 2 is also associated with obesity. So a diagnosis is going to make, going to be made on four glucose abnormalities. The patient has to have a fasting serum glucose greater than 126. So you have to know this. You you have to know this. It's going to be on your exam. You're going to see it everywhere. You're going to see it in your family medicine exam. You're going to see it on your pediatric COR, your OB-GYN. You're going to see it everywhere. So make sure you know diabetes. So once again, a diagnosis is going to be made where the patient has a fasting serum glucose of greater than 126. Also, you can do a random venous plasma glucose where the patient is not fasting and the glucose is going to be greater than 200 with symptoms of hyperglycemia. So if they have that acanthosis nigricans, which is that velvety plaque that we talked about in the back of the neck, that's usually a sign of insulin uh, resistance. If they have an abnormal glucose tolerance test with a two-hour postprandial serum glucose concentration of more than 200, if they have a hemoglobin A1c of greater than 6.5%, any of these can make a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus.
So a patient can be classified as having impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance. So basically this means that the patient is on the bridge of developing diabetes, but they're not diabetic yet. Also known as like your pre-diabetics, right? That's what they told me I had. They say I'm a pre-diabetic, but to be honest with you, they did a fasting serum glucose and they didn't tell me to fast. And I remember that day I had like a big bowl of like fruity pebbles. So it was really, really sugary. And my fasting glucose was like at 124. And I think I, at the time I had told the person who saw me that I was a PA student. So I think she inferred that I knew I needed to fast, but I think at that time we hadn't gone through endocrine yet. So she diagnosed me as a pre-diabetic. And now that I'm learning this, I'm like, I was supposed to fast before I took this test. That's why my glucose was high because I didn't fast. So I was diagnosed as a pre-diabetic. So a patient can be classified as having an impaired fasting glucose or an impaired glucose tolerance. Impaired fasting glucose is basically a fasting serum glucose of 100 to 125, also known as your pre-diabetics, which where they had categorized me because I was at 124. If they have an impaired glucose tolerance test after a two-hour plasma glucose following an oral glucose tolerance test of 140 to 199, they are also considered as your pre-diabetic patients, okay? So now that we've discussed that, make sure that you know your numbers. Once again, type 1, more commonly found in children, right? It's due to autoimmune destruction of the beta cell in, in the islet of the pancreas. Type 2 is usually insulin resistance and relative insulin insufficiency. It's usually found in patients that are obese, and it's going to be found in older patients usually. You're going to do a diagnosis with the fasting serum glucose, and it has to be greater than 126. A random venous plasma glucose is going to be greater than 200, and these patients are going to be presenting with symptoms of hyperglycemia. They're also going to be having an abnormal oral glucose tolerance test with a two-hour postprandial serum glucose concentration greater than 200 or a hemoglobin level greater than 6.5%. Ooh, that was a lot. Sorry, guys. I'm doing some water. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we've discussed that, do I want to go into type 1 a little bit more into detail? So remember said that type 1 is most commonly found in younger children, right? Because it's due to autoimmune. Usually a child will be born with this. So type 1, as we said, it's due to pancreatic islet beta cell destruction, where the patient is unable to produce insulin. These patients require insulin treatment because they can't produce it on their own. So with these patients, um, basically... How are they going to present? They're going to be presenting with uh, polyuria, polydupsia. They're going to, be going to the restroom a lot. They're going to be very thirsty. They might have a, a weight loss also. They're going to have ketonuria, ketonemia. These are both associated with type 1. Islet autoantibodies are also going to be found in these patients with type 1. And then make sure that you know about the Dawn phenomenon and this emoji effect because this is something you are definitely going to be tested on, so we'll go through it real quick. So Dawn phenomenon is basically where the patient has reduced tissue sensitivity to insulin between 5 a.m. or 8 a.m. So basically, it's associated with hyperglycemia due to decreased insulin sensitivity and then a nightly surge of regulatory hormones during nighttime fasting. So basically, they're going to be waking up with hyperglycemia. So the glucose level is going to be high around 7 a.m. That's dawn phenomenon. The patient wakes up with hyperglycemia. Okay. The treatment for this is going to be uh, PM insulin. So you're going to increase their PM insulin. So you're going to increase the insulin that they're taking at night because it's not enough and it's not lasting them through the entire night. That's why these patients are waking up with hyperglycemia. Like around 3 a.m., they're, they're fine. Their glucose levels are normal. But once they wake up in the morning and time has passed, they're going to be waking up with hyperglycemia. This is going to be the dawn phenomenon. And usually with these patients, it's because they, the, the insulin that they have is not enough. So that's why with these insulin, you have to make sure that you increase it. So you can give them something like NPH to blunt the morning hyperglycemia. You can also tell the patient to avoid taking any type of snack late at night. Okay. So once again, dawn phenomenon this is usually due to reduced tissue sensitivity to insulin between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. This patient's going to be waking up with hyperglycemia in the morning. 
And what you're going to do to treat this is that you're going to increase their insulin that they take at night. You can give them something like NPH, which is going to last them a little bit longer and longer throughout the night with the insulin. That way they're not waking up with this hyperglycemia and tell them to avoid any type of carbohydrate. Okay. Now let's go into Samoji effect. So Samoji effect is basically nocturnal hypoglycemia followed by a surge of counter-regulatory hormones that, that cause hyperglycemia by 7 a.m. Okay, so what's the difference between both Samoji and Dom phenomenon? So basically, Samoji effect and the Dom phenomenon, they both cause higher blood sugar levels in the morning, right? But the Dom phenomenon happens naturally, okay? So it's the body doing it naturally versus the Samoji effect that happens because there's problems with the diabetes management routine, okay? So just make sure that you know the difference between these. So... This is going to be associated with hypoglycemia because there's going to be too much insulin given at dinner time. The glucose level at 3 a.m. the next morning is low. And what happens is at 3 a.m. the patient's going to have hypoglycemia and then at 6 to 7 a.m. there's going to be hyperglycemia. This is usually treated with a decreased PM insulin or a nighttime snack to prevent the hypoglycemia. So another thing you want to know is that Dom phenomenon and Samoji effect tend to be associated with type 1 diabetes mellitus because these are treated with insulin. So it's most commonly associated with type 1 diabetes mellitus. So how are you going to treat diabetes type 1? We're basically going to treat it with a combination of rapid and long-acting insulin. Make sure that you know your insulin, okay? We'll go through it real quickly, but make sure that you know which ones are short-acting, which ones are intermediate-acting, and which ones are long-acting. So just to go through them real quick, the very short acting are going to be your Lispro, your Aspart, and then your uh, Glulacine. Your short acting are going to be your regular, and then your intermediate acting are going to be your NPH, also known as your neutral protamine um, Hagedorn. Your long acting are going to be your Glargine and Detamir, okay? The reason why they're called long acting, short acting, intermediate acting is because of how long they last. So if you have a patient that presents with DKA, you want to give them a insulin that's going to act quickly, right? So that's why you need to know the difference between these. So now that we've completed type 1, uh, let's go into type 2. So 90% of all diabetic patients in the U.S. have type 2. So it's a lot more common than type 1. And like we said, it's usually found in older patients. And it's because there's usually increased insulin resistance with these patients, okay? Obesity is the most common and important environmental factor that can lead to insulin resistance, especially if these patients have a waist circumference that's very high. So if they have a waist circumference that's greater than 40 inches in men and greater than 35 inches in women, it's associated with an increased risk of having diabetes mellitus, okay? So it's going to present in patients that are overweight and obese. It occurs in adults, like we, we said, but now it's occurring even in children and younger adolescents. And I'm seeing this a lot. I saw it a lot during my pediatric rotation, and it's because of the diet, right? A lot of the children that we saw during my pediatric rotation were obese, and my doctor would get after the parents, like, what are you feeding your children? So that's a common cause nowadays. So basically... Um, they say that it's gen that if you have a family member that has diabetes mellitus, then there's a 50% chance that that person will also develop diabetes mellitus. So they think that there's, it's also genetically associated. Okay. So there's about more than 30 genetic loci that have been associated with increased risk of type two diabetes mellitus. So how is this patient going to present? So remember I discussed, according to osmosis, they said it's going to be a patient that's going to be older than 40, and they're going to be obese. They're going to be presenting with similar symptoms as diabetes mellitus 1, so polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia. But the thing about diabetes 2 is that weight loss is not going to be very common, or ketonuria, okay, versus we talked about diabetes 1. These patients have weight loss, and they have ketonuria. That's not common in type 2. Another thing that we want to think about is that females that are more prone to getting vaginal infections, especially if they are fungal vaginal infections, and then we want to think about diabetes mellitus, okay? So if you keep having like 
candida infections, like yeast infections. We want to think about diabetes mellitus too. We want to work them up for that. Another thing that I've discussed over and over again is going to be your ankylosis nigricans, right? Your like velvety, like dark, like plaques on the back of the neck. Um, sometimes it can be found in like, um, like under, like right here in the armpits, even in like the groin area and like the folds. Uh, patients with this can also have, um, it's associated with diabetes mellitus too. So we want to think about that also. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? Remember, we discussed we're going to do the plasma glucose fasting. If it's greater than 126, we diagnose these patients, okay? Um, it has to be uh, greater than 126 on more than one occasion in order to be diagnosed with these patients. So it has to be on two occasions. And usually, the fasting plasma glucose is usually the gold standard, okay? You can also do an oral glucose tolerance test like we discussed. It has to be greater than 200. And then the hemoglobin level, if it's uh, greater than 6.5%, then it's diagnostic for um, diabetes. And once again, it has to be on two separate occasions. So you do it, for example, today, and then the patient has to come back to do it a second time to be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Also, these patients, uh, other things that are associated is that they usually have hypertension. They have atherosclerosis and dyslipidemia, which makes sense, right, because most of these patients are obese. So what's going to be treatment for this? The first line treatment is going to be a biguanide. Make sure that you know it. it's a biguanide metformin because you have a question, you know it's type 2, and it won't give you metformin. It will give you like a class of drugs like SGL2 inhibitors, etc. And you need to know it's a biguanide. So it's going to be metformin. This one's going to be the first line. It's usually used as monotherapy, or it can use, be used in combination with another medication like an SGL2 inhibitor, okay? So some of the common side effects of Metformin is that it causes GI upset. And um, usually with these patients, another thing that it can cause is it can cause lactic acidosis. Make sure you know this. I had a question actually on my exam a few months ago. It was actually a month ago. It was my pack rat and it was a question on metformin and you need to know that it caused lactic acidosis. You know what? It was on my family rotation exam. Yeah. So family rotation, it gave you a patient that had diabetes, and then it told you what does, what is the main adverse effect or black box warning that causes that is associated with the first line drug treatment for this patient. So it didn't tell you that it was metformin, but you need to know it was metformin, and that it causes lact lactic acidosis. Okay, you can also give them sulfonylurea, it's like a glipizide. Okay, but usually metformin is going to be the first line for these patients. Okay, make sure that you know that. All right, guys, so now we're going to go into hypercalcemia. So this one's the one where they have increased calcium, right? Um, what are our normal calcium levels? It's between 8.5 to 10.5, I believe. Let me just make sure I'm correct. Yes, yeah, so it's between 8.5 to 10.5 for hypercalcemia. Um, if it's greater than 10.5, it's hypercalcemia. So the normal range is between 8.5 and 10.5 for um, calcium levels. Although, like, once again, this differs between textbooks, but according to what I'm studying, 8.5 to 10.5, it's greater than 10.5, then you have hypercalcemia. How is this patient going to present? It's going to be your classic bones, stones, groans, and psychiatric overtones, right? So they'll have uh, abnormal bone remodeling, okay? They'll have increased risk of kidney stones, and what type of kidney stones? Calcium oxalate, right? Groans, they'll have abdominal crampy, nausea, ileus constipation, and then psychiatric overtones, which are going to be your lethargy, depressed mood, psychosis, cognitive dysfunction for these patients. That's how the patient's going to present. So what are some of the causes for hypercalcemia? It's this really cool mnemonic. So it's called chimpanzees. Okay, so let's go through it. C is calcium supplementation. They're taking too much calcium supplementation. H is going to be hyperparathyroidism. Okay, this is actually the most common cause of hypercalcemia in patients that are outpatients. I is going to be iatrogenic or immobility. So if you're taking certain drugs, what drugs? So what drugs are associated with hypercalcemia? You have your diuretics, especially your thiazide diuretics are associated with hypercalcemia. Lithium also. M in the chimpanzee's mnemonics, it's going to be milk alkali syndrome. P is going to be Paget's disease. It's because there's uh, increased amount of osteoclast resorption. A is going to be adrenal insufficiency, like Addison's disease. 
N is going to be neoplasm. Okay. Also for A, you can say acromegaly. So acromegaly, Addison's disease, any type of adrenal insufficiency. N is going to be neoplasm. So if they have some type of bone metastasis, like multiple myeloma also. Z is going to be Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. So remember we talk about Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. It's that gastric acid tumor that produces an increased amount of acid in the stomach. E is going to be excess vitamin A. The second E is going to be excess vitamin B. Okay. Vitamin D is required for intestinal calcium absorption. So if there's a lot of vitamin D, then it's going to be absorbing a lot of calcium. R is going to be for, um, I'm sorry, S is going to be for sarcoidosis. So increased GI absorption, that's what happens. So once again, hypercalcemia, the mnemonic is chimpanzees, okay? Other causes like renal failure, that's the most common one I saw in like inpatients during my rounds, during my internal medicine rotation with my doctor. We saw this a lot, especially in the patients that have COVID since their kidneys aren't working anymore. Um, and then, of course, if they have familiar hypocalceric hypercalcemia. So how are you going to diagnose this patient? You want to make sure that you measure the calcium twice. If you confirm that the patient has hypercalcemia, then you want to make sure that you confirm and find where it's coming from. Is it due to hyperparathyroidism? So what you're going to do with these patients, you're going to check the PTH, you're going to check the phosphate, the creatinine, and the vitamin D levels. Basically, if the PTH is elevated, and you have increased calcium, then you want to think that it's due to um, a parathyroid hormone, pituitary tumor, right? I'm sorry, pituitary tumor. It's going to be due to a parathyroid hormone. So another thing that we want to talk about is basically if it's hyperparathyroidism and you confirm it and surgery is indicated, how are you going to diagnose this? It's basically, you're going to do a system abby parathyroid scan to look for the adenoma. So it's usually an adenoma on the parathyroid gland. So we have the, the thyroid gland, right? And then you have the, the little para, um, the little um, parathyroids there. So it's usually due to hyperparathyroidism, okay? If it's due to hypercalcemia, just make sure you know that serum calcium is tied to albumin. And if the serum calcium is low, make sure that you also check the albumin. Okay, so let's talk through how we're going to evaluate a patient with hypercalcemia because as you can see, I'm having trouble with this one. Uh, endocrine has always been my weakness, so I'll be honest with you guys. So please correct me if I have any mistakes on anything I've said, okay? Because as you can see, I'm struggling with endocrine. It's not my one of my strong suits. So how are we going to evaluate a patient with hypercalcemia, okay? So basically what we're going to do is that we're going to confirm, of course, that the calcium is increased, right? And we said the levels were between 8.5 to 10.5. It's greater than 10.5 and they have hypercalcemia. We're going to ask about their history and then also whatever we see on physical findings. So basically, if it's acute or they don't know how long it's been going and the parathyroid hormone is increase it's high we want to think about primary hyperparathyroidism we also want to consider the men's syndromes okay so the, the men remember the men multiple endocrine neoplasia that's what it is and then if the parathyroid hormone is low and it's an acute or unknown duration and they're presenting with hyperkinesemia then we want to think about maybe a malignancy okay so say that they are having a chronic duration of hypercalcemia and their PTH is low. We want to think about granulomatous diseases like sarcoidosis, milk alkali syndrome, medications like lithium or thiazides, vitamin D or vitamin A intoxication. But if the PTH is high in chronic duration, then we want to think about hyperparathyroidism. Also, we want to consider the men's syndromes. How are we going to treat these patients? Basically, we're going to increase their urinary excretion. So we're going to give them, we're going to hydrate them. So we're going to give them vigorous hydration with IV fluids, especially like normal saline. So we're going to give them a lot of fluids for these patients, okay? It's usually going to be your um, isotonic saline hydration. We want to restore their intravascular volume and increase the urinary calcium excretion for these patients. We can also give them a loop diuretics, okay? Loop diuretics like LASIK, we want to stay away with from thiazides, right? Because we said thiazides cause hypercalcemia. So make sure that if it gives you a question and you see it's a diuretic, it has to be a loop diuretic, okay? You can give them a loop diuretic like LASIK, okay? also known as your uh, furosemide. You can also give them biphosphonates or calcitonin. And then if the patient has a renal failure, then you can give them hemodialysis. 
So just make sure that the first line is going to be isotonic saline hydration. So you're going to give them IV fluids for hypercalcemia. And you're going to give them also loop diuretics for these patients. You can also give them a denosumab. Denosumab, this is usually preferred if there's some type of malignancy that's causing hypercalcemia, okay? And if the patient's refractory to biphosphonates. And then you're also going to, like we said, give him a loop diuretics, only loop diuretics, not thiazide diuretics. You can also give him calcitonin as an acute treatment. You can give him biphosphonates, but usually it's going to be uh, isotonic saline hydration. It's going to be the first line. All right, guys. So please let me know if I made any errors on this. Like I said, I really struggle with the electrolyte impulses. So that was hypercalcemia. Make sure you know that anything that's greater than 10.5 is going to be hypercalcemia. The patient's going to be presenting with your moans, groans, uh, psychiatric overtones and stones and the causes, right? We had the chimpanzees mnemonic and then we're going to uh, measure basically the calcium two times and then we want to see whether it's due to hyperparathyroidism or if the patient is just like maybe intaking too much calcium or if they are taking certain medications that's causing this. And then treatment's going to be usually first line is going to be with just IV fluids. Second line, you can do something like loop diuretics, something like furosemide, Lasix. Okay. You can also do biphosphonates, calcitonin. Okay. So next one's going to be hypocalcemia. It's defined as calcium that's less than 8.5. Like I said, this can vary from books. I know I read the book that said that's less than 9.0, but it's going to be a calcium level that's less than 8.5 or less than 9.0, depending on what book you're studying. And what are some of the causes for hypocalcemia? The most common cause is going to be hypoparathyroidism, okay? So remember we said that hyperparathyroidism is associated with hypercalcemia. If they have like some type of adenoma on the parathyroid glands, it's going to be causing the, hy the hypercalcemia. So we have the thyroid and then we have the um, parathyroid glands. Okay, and then usually if you have an adenoma, it'll decrease, it'll increase the amount of calcium. And if it's due to hyperparathyroidism, you just go in there and you get rid of the adenoma. So for hypocalcemia, it's usually due to hypoparathyroidism. That's the most common cause. And it usually happens after a patient had thyroid surgery. So they went in there, they took out the thyroid, they don't have the parathyroid glands anymore. So that's why they're becoming hypocalcemic because the parathyroid glands are the ones that help with uh, calcium in the body, uh, creating calcium in the body. So hypoparathyroidism is the most common cause of hypocalcemia. It's also associated with acute pancreatitis. Also, if the patient has renal insufficiency, so they have decreased vitamin D production or vitamin D deficiency. Remember we discussed it's associated with calcium. So if they have decreased amount of this, it can cause hypocalcemia. Other causes can be hyperphosphatemia. If the patient has hypomagnesemia, if they have malabsorption, like short bowel syndrome, if they have a blood transfusion, since calcium tends to bind to citrate, okay? The George syndrome also, where they have the absence of the thymus. So with these patients, what's going to be the pathology, okay? Basically, they have increased neuromuscular irritability. Some of the conditions associated with hypocalcemia are rickets and osteomalacia. And why rickets and osteomalacia? Because that's associated with vitamin D deficiency, right? Makes sense. Rickets, it's found in what? It's usually found in children. And then osteomalacia is usually found in older adults that do not have adequate vitamin D intake. Interestingly, um, yeah, that's it. So how is this patient going to present? Basically, they're going to be presenting with tetany. Okay, that's where like they're just not moving. A tetany. They'll be presenting with seizures. It's going to be your grand mal seizures. So have numbness and tingling. And their fingers and their toes, circumoral. Signs are going to be hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. What you need to know is the signs for hypocalcemia. So if you're reading the vignette and it gives you any of these signs that I'm going to about to discuss right now, you want to think about hypocalcemia. So you're going to have Shavostik sign, which is basically where you tap the facial nerve. It's going to contract the facial uh, muscles. You're going to have... Uh, Trousseau sign where you inflate the blood pressure cuff to a pressure higher than the patient's systolic pressure and it's going to cause uh, carpal spasms. So Trousseau's and then you have Shavatskits, okay? 
How are we going to diagnose this patient? So we're going to do an EKG because hypocalcemia can cause arrhythmia, specifically which type QT prolongation versus hypercalcemia will have QT shortening. Hypocalcemia will cause uh, prolonged QTs, okay? We're going to do a lipase, LFTs. We're also going to measure the parathyroid hormone, okay? Uh, the parathyroid hormone is going to be low in hypoparathyroidism and then high in vitamin D deficiency. So basically, how are we going to evaluate a patient with hypocalcemia? So you've done the calcium, they have low calcium, right? So if the patient has low phosphate in addition to low calcium, then you want to think about high parathyroid. Um, you want to think about um, vitamin D deficiency, especially if they have a high parathyroid hormone. Okay, so if they have low calcium, low phosphate, and they have a high parathyroid hormone, you want to think about vitamin D deficiency, pancreatitis, anti-epileptic drugs, biphosphonates, blood transfusions like we discussed. What if they have hypocalcemia, low calcium, and then a low parathyroid hormone? We want to think about hypoparathyroidism or hypomagnesemia. What if they have a hypocalcemia and they have the low calcium levels and they have a higher normal phosphate level and they have a high parathyroid hormone? We want to think about acute renal failure, rhabdomyolysis. Okay. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? If they're symptomatic, we're going to give them uh, IV calcium gluconate Okay, because we're going to make sure that we're repleting all that calcium. But usually long-term, is going to be they're going to be taking oral calcium carbonate and vitamin D. If it's due to parathyroid hormone deficiency, then we want to make sure that we're placing it with vitamin D, like calcitriol, plus um, high oral calcium intake. And then we want to make sure that we're also correcting the hypomagnesemia for these patients. Okay, so real quick, hypercalcemia is going to be a level of calcium greater than 10.5. These patients are going to be presenting with your stones, groans, uh, psychiatric uh, overtones, and then your um, stones, bones, groans, and psychiatric overtones, okay? They're going to have what on EKGs? You're going to have short QT. Lab findings, you're going to see that they have increased calcium. You're going to have a shortened QT interval. First line treatment is going to be usually AV saline, IV saline. And you can also give them a furosemide like Lasix. These are going to be first line. We want to make sure that we avoid the thiazide diuretics, okay? Because they can switch this question up. They'll give you a hypercalcemia patient and they can ask you, what do you want to avoid in these patients? Thiazide diuretics, so hydrochlorothiazide, for example. You can also give calcitonin and biphosphonates in severe cases for these patients. This is for hypercalcemia, okay? If it's due to a parathyroid hormone, then the patient's going to be presenting with uh, increased calcium, they'll have an increased uh, PTH and then a decreased phosphate. While if it's due to something else and it's parathyroid hormone independent and it's due to a malignancy, then they're gonna have an increased uh, PTH related protein, but a decreased intact PTH, parathyroid hormone. So what about hypocalcemia? So hypocalcemia, Basically, hypoparathyroid is the most common cause overall of hypocalcemia, okay, where there's usually parathyroid gland destruction because it's either the patient had a sur surgery, they got the entire thyroid gland removed, or it's autoimmune, okay? Other causes can be like chronic renal disease, vitamin D deficiency, and then hypomagnesemia, especially if the parathyroid hormone levels increase, then you want to think about chronic renal disease. How's this patient going to present? They're going to have the tetany, right? They're going to have the Shavatskit sign where you press on the facial uh, nerve and it causes the facial spasm. Trousseau sign, which is inflation of the blood pressure cuff. It's going to cause the carpal uh, spasms. They're going to have QT prolongation, okay? And treatment with this is usually going to be with calcium gluconoid IV if it's severe. If it's mild, then you can give them oral calcium and vitamin D. Okay, guys, so let's go into hypernatremia. So this one's another one that I really struggle with, so I'll, I will try to get through it. My doctor actually did a really good job explaining it to me, my uh, nephrologist, but I feel like I still draw, struggle with it. And it was interesting because he gave a lecture to the residents here, and they were also struggling because it's something that is seen a lot in the patients with COVID. So they were struggling on how to treat it. So we'll go through it together, okay? 
So hypernatremia, it's most commonly found because there's an inadequate water intake and loss. My doctor would say hypernatremia is usually due to dehydration, okay? So let's talk about our normal levels of sodium. It's between 135 to 145. Anything that's greater than 145, it's considered as increased amount of sodium, also known as hypernatremia, okay? So basically, with these patients, how are you going to treat them? If it's an acute hypernatremia that occurs less than 48 hours, you want to correct it, and it's going to be with hypotonic saline solution, so like 0.45% uh, normal saline solution. If it's chronic hypernatremia, then make sure you want to correct it slowly over 48 to 72 hours. So chronic hypernatremia, that's the one you have to be careful and you want to correct it slowly because if you correct it too quickly, you can cause brain damage with these patients, okay? Also, I'm going to talk about this real quick. So there's different types of hypernatremia. You have hypovolemia, hypernatremia, you have euvolemia, hypernatremia, and you have hypervolemia, hypernatremia, okay? So hypovolemia, hypernatremia is basically you're losing more water than sodium, okay? with these patients. Euvolemia is basically uh, due to causes that are like iatrogenic, like uh, hypertonic saline, sodium bicarb. And then hypervolemia, hypernatremia is basically you're gaining more sodium than water. And in these patients, some of the co common causes is going to be diabetes insipidus. Okay. So once more to go through it for repetition. So we have hyponatremia, right? We do the serum osmolality. If it's normal, it's isotonic hyponatremia. We want to think about hyperlipidemia and hyperproteinemia. If the serum osmo osmolality is low, so if it's less than uh, 280 uh, milliosmoles per kilogram and the patient is hyponatremic, these patients are considered hypotonic hyponatremia. And then from there, that's where we're going to look at the volume status, whether volume status, whether the patient is hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic. If the patient's hypovolemic, some of the causes are going to be dehydration, diarrhea, and vomiting. Okay. And this is if the urine sodium is less than 10. Okay. It's usually due to an extra renal salt loss versus if the urine sodium is more than 20 and hypovolemia, um, hypotonic hyponatremia. And the urine sodium is greater than 20, it's going to be due to diuretics, ACE inhibitors, nephropathies, mineral corticoid deficiency, and cerebral sodium wasting syndrome. All right, now let's go to euvolemic. So it's hypotonic, hyponatremia, euvolemic. The most common one you need to know is going to be syndrome of inappropriate diuretic hormone, so SIADH. While if it's hypervolemic, hypotonic, hyponatremia, it's usually going to be to edema edematous states like congestive heart failure, liver disease, and nephrotic syndrome. So basically, in a nutshell, hyponatremia is basically that you have an excess of total body water in relation to sodium, okay? It's a primary disorder of water homeostasis. Some of the signs and symptoms a patient's going to be presenting with is going to be nausea and vomiting, confusion, lethargy, disorientation, weakness, cramps. If they have severe hyponatremia, like less than 120, certain books that I've read said even less than 115, they can present with seizures, coma, or death, Okay. Some of the complications of um, hyponatremia is that if you correct it too quickly, you can cause central pontine myelinosis, which is basically where there's an osmotic shift of water out of the cells, which causes brain swelling and herniation and permanent neurological deficits, okay? Some of the signs and symptoms is going to be lethargy, coma, uh, spontaneous cerebral bleeding, ataxia. They can also have quadriparesis. So how are you going to diagnose this patient? You're basically going to do an, a serum osmolality, and it's going to be less than 135, okay? Also, you want to make sure that you measure the serum glucose. Treatment for hyponatremia, if it's greater than 48 hours and it's chronic, it puts the patient at risk for what? Osmotic demyelination syndrome. So you want to make sure that you correct it slowly by 10 to 12 in the first 24 hours or more than 18 in the first 48 hours. All right, guys, so now that we've discussed that, let's go into syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So we talked about diabetes insipidus, what syndrome, syndrome of, of, of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. 
Basically, the pathophysiology of SIADH is going to be that they have excess water retention, which causes, which usually dilutes the body fluids. Okay. Some of the causes of SIADH can be pulmonary. So if they have tuberculosis, if they have some type of pulmonary effusion, pneumonia, uh, CNS is usually if they have tumors like a subarachnoid hemorrhoid, meningitis. Also, if they have small cell carcinoma of the lung, can be associated with SIADH. They're taking certain medications like your SSRIs, your TCAs, nicotine, uh, cyclophosphamide also. And it's usually uh, what causes or how is the patient going to present with signs and symptoms? It's going to be water intoxication. So they're going to be presenting with headache, confusion, anorexia, nausea and vomiting, coma, convulsions, weight gain. The patient can also be asymptomatic. How are you going to diagnose the patient? You're going to do a urine osmolality, and basically it's going to show more than 100, okay? And treatment for this is usually, if it's acute, you're going to treat whatever is the underlying disorder for these patients. So if it's a cancer, they want to treat the cancer. But most of these are uh, self-limited, and they tend to go away by themselves. You can also give them vasopressum antagonists if needed. So you're going to give them something like Vaptin or uh, conivaptin. And if it's chronic, then you want to make sure that you restrict the water restriction to less than one liter per day. And you can also give them, once again, oral vaptin or tovaptin. So, what's the difference between diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone? So, let's differentiate between both of them. So, diabetes insipidus is due to high urinary output, they're going to have low levels of ADH and they're going to be hypernatremic, they're going to be dehydrated, and they're going to be losing too much fluid, okay? SIADH, they're going to have low urinary output. They're going to have high levels of antidiuretic hormone. Basically, how I um, memorized it is that SIADH is syndrome of high diuretic hormone, okay? That's how I memorized it. They're going to be hyponatremic, they're going to be over overhydrated, and they're going to be retaining too much fluid. So that's how you tell the difference between diabetes and diabetes and SIADH, but both of these are going to be presenting with excessive thirst for these patients. Okay. All right, guys. So now why don't we go into hyperparathyroidism? Okay, so hyperparathyroidism. So hyperparathyroidism is the most common cause of hypercalcemia, as we discussed. It's usually characterized by excess increased parathyroid hormone production, okay? This patient is going to be presenting with the symptoms similar to hypercalcemia, so your kidney stones, um, osteoporosis, or pancreatitis, fractures from um, osteoporosis. Um, malignancy is also the most common cause of hypercalcemia in hospitalized patients, okay? So with these patients, we want to make sure that we're ruling out any type of malignancy, so some other causes of hyperparathyroidism is, like we said, the most common cause is going to be because they're going to have an adenoma on the parathyroid glands, like, like we discussed. Also, they can have parathyroid hyperplasia. It can be also associated with MEN1 and MEN2. They can have familiar hypocalcuric hypercalcemia, parathyroid carcinoma. So how are you going to treat hyperparathyroidism. Basically, you're going to give them intensive hydration with normal saline. You can also do loop diuretics. And then if it's due to a secondary cause, we want to make sure that we treat the underlying cause. And usually, you can also do a parathyroidectomy if it's extremely severe and the patient's not responding to any of the loop diuretics. Okay. All right. And then, of course, like we said, uh, patients that are not candidates for parathyroidectomies, you can also treat them with uh, biphosphonates. So now that we've done hyperparathyroidism, let's go into hypoparathyroidism. With hypoparathyroidism, basically, this one's very rare. It's characterized by low calcium and low parathyroid hormone. And hypomagnesemia is usually associated with hypocalcemia. So remember, we said the calcium levels, it's normal between 8.5 to 10.5. Anything that's less than 8.5, it's considered hyper, hypocalcemia. So the most common cause are usually autoimmune or it's post-surgical. So like we said, if a patient had their thyroid removed, 
then they can have hypoparathyroid because the parathyroids are found on the thyroid gland. So like we said, some of the causes are going to be thyroid surgery. If they had also parathyroid surgery, if it's autoimmune, infiltrated, familiar, or sometimes idiopathic. So how is the patient going to present? They're going to have tetany. Okay, they're going to have the same symptoms related, similar to hypocalcemia. They're going to have Shavatskid's kind, which is basically the contraction of the facial mass muscles. Whenever you tap on the facial nerve, they're going to have the Trousseau sign, which is when you put the blood pressure cuff and they have the spasm of the um, carpal spasm, paresthesias and the finger trips, perioral, and they're going to have a prolonged QT interval, right? With hypoparathyroidism, which are the symptoms of hypocalcemia. How are you going to diagnose this? Basically, if it's a low PTH, it's going to be primary. This is going to suggest that the cause was from a thyroidectomy. If there's a high PTH, then it's going to be secondary. It's going to be due to renal failure or vitamin D deficiency. And then, of course, you want to treat what is, whatever is the underlying cause. And you can also treat them with calcium carbonate or calcium gluconate and tell them to have a low phosphate diet. All right, guys, so we're done finally with all the electrolytes abnormalities. And I'm so sorry if I completely butchered these guys. So please correct me if I had any mistakes on these, okay? It's something that I struggle with and I'm trying to be good at it because I have the pants that's coming up. So let's go into hyperthyroidism, okay? Hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism, it's more commonly found in females than males. It's most commonly found in the ages of 20 to 40 years old. And the most common cause of hyperthyroidism is going to be Graves' disease, okay? Even though there's several causes, like for example, it can be a painless or transient thyroiditis, toxic adenoma, toxic multinodular go uh, goiter, but the most common one's going to be Graves' disease. Real quick, let's go through Graves' disease. Graves' disease is an autoimmune disease disorder that results in the overproduction of thyroid hormones, and it typically affects women between the 20 to 40 years of age. Okay, it's the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. The patient with hyperthyroidism that has Graves' disease is going to be presenting with tachycardia or arrhythmias. They'll have exophthalmas, which is basically where they have the eyes that are enlarged. They'll be diaphoretic. They'll have tremors, and they'll be having loose stools for these patients. Okay, so with these patients, they're going to have also TSA receptor antibodies. Okay. Because the most common cause of hyperthyroidism is basically TSH receptor that is stimulating the antibodies, okay? And then let's go into Plummer's disease, which we said was the second most common cause, which is a toxic multinodular goiter. Basically, it's autonomous functioning nodules, and this is very commonly seen in elderly versus Graves' disease was seen in younger women, right? 20 to 40, and they're females. This one's going to be seen more commonly in elderly. The patient is going to be presenting with symptoms of hyperthyroidism. They're going to have an enlarged thyroid with palpable nodules. They're not, there's not going to be any skin or ocular changes. And they can have symptoms of dyspnea, dysphagia, strider, and hoarseness. That makes sense, right, if it's compressing the, if it's compressing the um, laryngeal nerve. So other causes can be medications like amiodarone. That's a huge one that is associated with thyroid problems. So like we said, signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism in general is that they're going to be presenting with tachycardia. Um, they can have AFib, okay, atrial fibrillation in these patients. They can have palpitations, anxiety, tremor, jitteriness, diaphoretic, okay. They have brisk peripheral reflexes. They can be very anxious, so have increased lacrimation with these patients, They'll have intolerance to heat. They'll have fine straight hair, bulging eyes, uh, facial flushing, and enlarged thyroid. They'll say that they're losing a lot of weight and then muscle wasting also. And they'll have diarrhea. Basically, they'll have increased amount of bowel movements. So they're going to the restroom more often with these patients. So how are you going to diagnose these patients? So the best initial test is going to be a serum TSH. So best initial test is going to be your TSH that's going to tell you whether it's hyper or hypothyroidism. So that's the best initial test. And then once you get the TSH, that's when you can go and do the radio iodine uptake scan. This is going to help you differentiate to see what is the cause of the hyperthyroidism. Okay. 
If the TSH is normal, abnormal, then you can get free T4 levels, but you rarely get any T3 levels. Usually you just do the TSH and then you get the free T4 levels. To be honest with you, in clinic, like I said, all they did was they got a TSH and that was it. Okay. Real quick, if the TSH is low and the T4 and T3 are high, then we want to think about primary hyperthyroidism, okay? Now, if the... Okay, so we don't know. And I'll go back and I'll discuss the TSH levels. Okay, so we've done the TSH and we say that there's an abnormality, right? And it's low. So now we're going to do a radio iodine uptake scan, okay? And this is going to tell us what is the cause of the hyperthyroidism. If on the radio iodine uptake scan there's a low uptake, then we want to think about thyroiditis, okay? So low uptake, it's going to be thyroiditis. If it's a high uptake with homogeneous radioactive iodine distribution, it's going to be Graves' disease. Sometimes on the question stem, they'll just give you a description of the radio um, iodine uptake scan, and you want to make sure that you know how to interpret it. So once again, if it's low uptake, it's going to be usually due to a thyroiditis, ectopic thyroid hormone. If it's high uptake with homogeneous radioactive iodine distribution, then we want to think that it's Graves' disease. If it's high uptake and then you see radio uh, iodine distribution, but it's nodular and there's multiple patches, patches that are heterogeneous, then you want to think about toxic multinodular goiter. If there's high uptake with nodular radio iodine distribution and then a single area of accumulation, then it's going to be one single toxic adenoma, right? So another test that you can do is the serum TPO antibodies, especially if you're thinking about Graves' disease, right? Because Graves' disease is usually due to autoimmune. And then treatment for these patients is basically if your patient is symptomatic, you want to treat their symptoms. So you're going to give them something like a propranolol, right? Or a tenolol, your beta blockers, because these patients present with tachycardia. And then you're going to give them methamazole as first line, okay? Unless they aren't in their first trimester of pregnancy, then you would do PTU. But usually methamazole is usually first line for hyperthyroidism. Unless the patient is pregnant in their first trimester, then in this case, you're given PTU, okay? Otherwise, then PTU is usually second line for these patients. But the preferred treatment for Graves' disease is surgery and radioactive iodine ablation. So if it tells you what is the best preferred treatment for Graves' disease, it's going to be radioactive iodine ablation or surgery. Make sure that you know this. I missed this question and I was so angry. So once again, with these patients that have a hyperthyroidism, you can, you're going to give them methamazole for pharmacological treatment. You can also give them a beta blocker for their tachycardia. But the preferred and best one treatment for Graves' disease is going to be surgery and radioactive iodine ablation. Okay. So real quick. Okay, so we discussed that, guys. Okay, so let's go into thyroid storm. That's the one I also wanted to discuss. This is going to be an emergency, okay, and it has an increased mortality rate. Basically, what happens with these patients is that they have a known or they're suspected to have an undiagnosed or they are not treating their hyperthyroidism, okay? Or sometimes they can have certain precipitating events like we discussed, like with Addison's, that can cause the hyperthyroidism. So if they have infection, if they had surgery, if they had um, iodine load like amiodron or contrast day, if they're pregnant, okay, it's very rare. And some of the signs and symptoms with these patients is that basically they're going to be presenting with palpitations, tachycardia, they'll have atrial fibrillation, high fever, psychosis, tremors. This can also progress to coma and hypotension. They may present also with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, but usually the classic hypertension is going to be hyperthyroidism symptoms plus fever, tachycardia, and altermental status. Hyperthyroidism, fever, tachycardia, and altermental status, you want to think about thyroid storm, okay? Diagnosis is usually going to be a clinical diagnosis. You can do a TSH, but it's usually going to be extremely high. Free T4 is also going to be very, very high. So treatment with this is that you want to make sure that you rule out the infection. You want to do your ABCs while your airway, breathing, and circulation. And then you're going to give them high dose, like super physiological high doses of glucocorticoids for these patients. And then you also want to make sure 
that you give them IV propranolol or osmolol since these patients are going to be tachycardic and they can be an AFib also. You're also going to give them PTU for these patients, and PTU is actually preferred over methamazoxazole. Okay. So once again, we're going to give them a high dose amount of glucocorticoids for these patients. Okay. And then we're going to give them PTU and then your propanolol. Okay. So it's like the three P's, propanolol, PTU, and then your uh, steroids like a, a prednisone. It's going to be high dose. All right, guys. So now that we've discussed that, let's go into hypothyroidism. Okay. So hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is going to be the opposite of hyperthyroidism, right? So hypothyroidism is basically the failure of the thyroid gland to create sufficient thyroid horm hormone to meet the metabolic demands of the body. This includes Hashimoto's, and this is the most common one. Hashimoto's is like an autoimmune destruction of the thyroid follicles. Once again, it's more commonly found in females and males. The age is going to be between 30 to 65, and the most common cause, like I said, of, of hypothyroidism is going to be Hashimoto's if the patient also had a thyroidectomy, okay? If they had radioactive iodine administration, if they have a family history of um, or personal history of diabetes mellitus or Addison's disease, and if they have thyroiditis. But the most common cause of hypothyroidism is going to be Hashimoto's. And then we said the most common cause of hyperthyroidism was what? It was Graves' disease. So what's the best initial test? Well, I'm sorry, let's go back. How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with weakness, lethargy, myalgia cold intolerance versus hyperthyroidism was what they had heat intolerance. These patients have cold intolerance. They're going to be complaining of constipation. They'll have brittle hair. They'll have the lateral eyebrow hair loss. They'll be complaining of irregular menses, bradycardia. They'll have a goiter. They can also have mixed edema coma, cool and dry skin, and then decreased deep tendon reflexes. So as you see, hyperthyroidism, everything's like super fast. Hypothyroidism, everything's a little bit slower, even their heart rate, bradycardic, okay? So the best initial test for hypothyroidism is going to be your TSH. Remember we discussed this? TSH is going to be the best test, okay? So if the TSH is greater than 10 units and the patient has decreased free T4, you can make the diagnosis of hypothyroidism along with the history and a physical, Okay. They will also have high titers of antibodies, so you want to look for anti-TPO, especially if the patient has Hashimoto's, because Hashimoto's is autoimmune, right? So let's interpret thyroid function tests in a patient with hypothyroidism. So if they have an increased CSH and then they have a decreased free T4, that's primary hypothyroidism. So that's going to be something like Hashimoto's, like we discussed. What if their TSH is increased, but they have a normal T4? This is going to be subclinical hypothyroidism. What if their TSH is decreased and they have a decreased free T4? This is going to be secondary hypothyroidism. You want to consider hypopituitarism. What if their TSH is decreased or they have a decreased normal T4 and they have a critical illness? This is usually euthyroid 6 syndrome, and they usually don't require treatment because they're going to get better once they, their body is fighting off whatever disease or infection is going on. Okay. So what's going to be the treatment? If the TSH level is greater than 10, then we're going to treat them with levothyroxine. That's usually the number one treatment for hypothyroidism. So once again, it's going to be levothyroxine, okay? So with these patients, the thing that can happen is mixed edema coma. That's usually an emergency for these patients, okay? So mixed edema coma is an emergency for these patients, that present with hypothyroidism. So once again, hypothyroidism is treated with what? Levothyroxine. The most common cause of hypothyroidism is what? It's Hashimoto's. It's an autoimmune disorder. Okay. Usually their TSH is going to be what? It's going to be decreased and it's going to be, I'm sorry, it's going to be increased. So TSH is going to be increased and their T4 is going to be decreased versus hyperthyroidism. Okay. This is going to be the most common cause is going to be Graves' disease and it's autoimmune. Their TSH is going to be decreased and their free T4 is going to be increased. So it's the opposite of hypothyroidism. How are you going to treat these patients? You're going to put them on a beta blocker, 
okay? And then you're also going to put them on methamazoxazole. Methy Unless the patient is having a thyroid storm, then you would put them on PTU. Okay. So let's go on to the next one, okay? Let's go into Paget's disease. So I had me briefly mentioned this uh, when we were discussing acromegaly. So with Paget's disease, it's going to be that patient where their hat doesn't fit them anymore. So the most common symptom associated with Paget's disease is going to be bone pain. It's more commonly found in males and females, and it's going to be commonly found in older patients, especially if they're older than 60. So it's usually a, ge a genetic cause, but you can also have viral causes like paramyxoviruses like measles, RSV for these patients. And then it's basically a localized disorder of accelerated bone remodeling, okay? And the primary abnormality is in the osteoclast. I kept getting this wrong. I kept putting blast, but it's an osteoclast. So once again, it's a localized disorder of accelerated bone remodeling, and it's the abnormality in the osteoclast. Basically, the collagen and the bone deposits are significantly disorganized, and they have a mosaic appearance, also known as a woven bone. So this new bone that it's creating, it's going to be weaker, more porous, hypervascular, and more easily fractured. So how is the patient going to present? So they're most commonly going to be asymptomatic, though they may be complaining of bone pain, like pelvis, lumbar, pain, spine, skull, and proximal femur pain. They might also have some neurosymptoms like uh, headaches, uh, deafness. But usually they'll have that frontal bossing of the forehead or the maxilla. And how are you going to diagnose these patients? So basically you're going to diagnose them with labs. You'll see that they have an increased alkaline phosphatase. This is usually the first sign. It's the most useful one. So once again, labs, increased alkaline phosphate is the first sign. It's going to be the most useful sign. They'll have hyperuricemia, hypercalcemia, and hypercalceria. You're going to do an x-ray. On the x-ray, you're going to see areas of lysis and sclerotic areas. you also see cortical thickening. You'll see bowing of weight-bearing bones like the femur or tibia. This is actually that's something pathognomonic for uh, Paget's disease. Okay, so it's going to be the bowing of... So it's going to be the bowing of the weight-bearing bones like your femur, tibia, humerus, and ulna. You can also do a total body scan, a total bone scan. This is going to be done with the technidium labeled biphosphate, and it's going to be the most sensitive one. Okay, and you can also do a histology. This is where you're going to see an increased number and size of osteoclasts and nuclei. And what's the treatment for this for Paget's disease? So it can be treated with aspirin, Tylenol, and NSAIDs. You can also give them biphosphonates and calcitonin, but biphosphonates are more effective effective because they will control the remodeling rates, okay? But you want to make sure that you're checking the alkaline phosphatase annually and you're performing x-rays in patients that keep having symptoms or their symptoms are changing. So once again, okay, pad to disease, the number one abnormality is going to be where in the osteoclast, okay? This patient, it's going to be usually an older male, greater than 60, they're saying that their hat doesn't fit them anymore. They're going to have that frontal bossing on your uh, physical exam, okay? They can also present with uh, kyphosis. They'll have the bowing of the limbs, especially like the weight-bearing limbs, okay? And they'll be complaining of bone pain, especially in the back and in the hips with these patients. You're going to do diagnostic labs. You're going to see that they have increased alkaline phosphatase. On x-ray, there's going to be areas of lysis. And the total body scan is the most sensitive one. The pain is usually treated with aspirin. You can give them Tylenol and NSAIDs, but usually you can also give them biphosphonates and calcitonin, specifically biphosphonates. Those are better at controlling the increased remodeling rates. All right, guys, so we're done with that one. Let's go into pheochromocytoma. This one is extremely rare, but it's highly tested on the exams. I was talking about pheochromocytoma the other day with my nephrologist doctor, and he's been working for more than like 40 years. And he said in his 40-year career, he's only seen two cases of pheochromocytoma. And he said that whenever he saw these patients, that they looked completely wasted. They are extremely skinny and they're completely wasted. Well, it makes sense, right? Because you're basically on your norepinephrine, epinephrine all the time. It's increasing everything, increased heart rate, everything. 
So he said these patients looked wasted and they have a very low, um, very high mortality rate and they don't have a long survival rate for these patients. So these patients um, usually will, he said the one that he had only survived to like age 30 and the other one survived to age 40. So they don't have a, they don't survive that one, unfortunately. So real quick, the medulla is the inner core of the adrenal gland that secretes norepinephrine and epinephrine. In pheochromocytoma, you have a catecholamine secreting adrenal tumor that develops from the chromophome cells and norepinephrine and epinephrine autonomously and intermittently are secreted. Some of the triggers that cause pheochromocytoma can be surgery, exercise, pregnancy, medications like your tricyclic antidepressants, histamine, uh, methylclopramide, and opiates, okay? 90% of the tumors are benign, but 10% of these are malignant. Usually, they, like I said, they're having an excess of norepinephrine and epinephrine, okay? What does this cause? Sympathetic overdrive. So everything is going to super duper duper fast. This patient is going to be presenting with the triad. So they're going to have the, um, the headache. They'll have uh, palpitations, tremors. They can have anxiety and flushing. But usually hypertension is the most consistent finding. So if you have a patient and you're evaluating them for hypertension, and you're treating the hypertension, it's not going away. You've tried already like more than three medications and they're all maxed out on the medications for hypertension. Then you wanna think about secondary causes of hypertension like pheochromocytoma, okay? And this is very commonly found in these patients is that they're hypertensive. Also, the patient can be complaining of paroxysmal or episodic uh, hypertension or headaches. So what's the best initial test? So the best initial test for this patient, you need to know this, you're going to get a question on this. It's going to be a high urinary and plasma fractionated metanephrines and catecholamines and vandalum mandelic acid. So that's going to be the best diagnostic test for these patients, okay? And then um, the most accurate test is going to be CT or MRI of the adrenals, and then that's when you'll you'll see that um, basically, you'll see that on the ad, um, adrenal medulla, that tumor on the adrenal medulla, okay? So how are you gonna manage these patients? What you need to know is that you're gonna give an alpha blocker first to control the blood pressure. So you're gonna give phenoxybenzamine. It's funny because my doctor said that he's never prescribed phenoxybenzamine, except for this case where this patient was going to surgery to have it removed, okay? So he said that he gave them an alpha block at first. You always need to do that. So once again, you're going to give them an alpha block at first, phenoxybenzamine first to control the blood pressure. Okay. So then the advantage of basically giving phenoxybenzamine first is that it minimizes the hypertensive effect of catecholamine release during surgery. So you're going to give the alpha blocker first. You're going to give phenoxybenzamine first, and then you're going to give propanolol after the alpha blocker, okay? And then that's when you can go and do the surgery. You're going to do surgical or laparoscopic resection. You're going to remove it. So once again, how do you treat these patients? You're going to do an alpha blocker first. You're going to do phenoxybenzamine, and then you can do a beta blocker, and then the patient can go into surgery, okay? So... The thing about pheochromocytoma, like my doctor had said, he said that most of these reoccur. So he said that he had removed, that they had removed one from a patient. And then like three months later, the patient had another one. So these are very, very likely to come back. And the thing about pheochromocytoma, he said that they're located everywhere. Okay. So even though we're sitting here and it says that it's a catecholamine secreting tumor that originates from the chromophone cells of the adrenal medulla. It's located everywhere. He said there was one on the intestines. So they're, they're found everywhere. They can go everywhere. So once again, just to talk about the high yield, what is fucochromocytoma? And the reason why, because this is going to be very highly tested. It's a catecholamine secreting tumor that originates from the chromophen cells of the adrenal medulla. Okay. This patient's going to be presenting with palpitations. They're going to be diaphoretic, headache. Hypertension, usually it's going to be resistant hypertension to medication. And the definitive treatment is going to be surgical resection of the tumor. Okay. We're going to start them on an alpha blocker though before they go to surgery. And then we add a beta blocker. The most common alpha blocker is going to be your phenoxybenzamine. So 
Another thing that I wanted to discuss is that uh, pheochromocytoma is associated with MEN2A and MEN2B. So make sure that you know that. So pheochromocytoma, MEN2A, MEN2B. So let's go into our next one. It's going to be our pituitary adenomas. So these arise from glandular epithelium, and they're the most common tumors found in the pituitary. Okay. Most of them are benign, okay, but there can be functional and non-functional. Basically, if they're functional, they're going to cause, cause a hyper secretion of the pituitary gland hormones. If they're non-functional, basically the adenoma doesn't secrete enough levels of hormone to be detected on blood work or to have clinical manifestation, then it's a non-functioning tumor. They can also be compressive, so they can compress on the optic chiasm, and then they can cause bitemporal uh, hemianopsia, hemianopsia. The most common one is going to be a prolactinoma, okay? And basically, how is this patient going to present? The most common symptoms of a pituitary adenoma is going to be headache and visual changes, okay? They can also present with hypopituitarism, okay? They can present with the headaches, like I said, and then the visual changes. And the most common nerve affected is going to be the optic nerve. That makes sense, right? Because they are compressing the optic chiasm. They're compressing, they're affecting the optic nerve. Okay. And sometimes you're fine incidentally. Uh, when you're doing imaging, you can find an incidental uh, pituitary adenoma. How are you going to diagnose this? Usually it's going to be with an MRI with gadolinium. And they are going to be defined depending on their size. So, if it's greater than one centimeter or greater than 10 millimeters, this is going to be characterized as a macroadenoma, okay? If it's so large, it can cause hypopituitarism and hydrocephalus and cranial nerve palsies because it's going to start compressing other areas in the brain, right? Okay. So the most common cancer is an adenocarcinoma with the pituitary adenomas, but these are very, very rare. So overall, the treatment for a pituitary adenoma is going to be a transsphenoidal uh, surgery or a stereotactic radiosurgery. So once again, with the pituitary adenomas, it's the most common tumor found in the pituitary. Uh, the majority of them are benign. Okay, You have your functional that are secrete uh, pituitary gland hormones, and then you have your non-functional. These can grow so large that they will compress the optic chiasm, and they can cause bitemporal hemianopsia. So if you have a patient that presents with like visual problems, then you want to think about a pituitary adenoma. The most common one is going to be a, a prolactinoma, and usually the patient's going to present with symptoms of headache and visual changes. Diagnosis is going to be with an MRI with gadolinium, and the tumor can be defined on its size. If it's a macroadenoma greater than one centimeter, greater than 10 millimeters, then um, this is a macroadenoma, okay? And treatment's going to be usually transphenoidal surgery or stereotactic radiosurgery. All right, guys, so let's go into our last topic, which is going to be the thyroid cancers, okay? So we have different types of cancers, and just overall, thyroid cancer is most commonly found in females. Uh, during my surgery rotation, my doctor did a lot of uh, thyroidectomies, so we removed a lot of thyroids. We did a lot of uh, needle biopsies on the thyroids, and the majority of the patients that we saw were females. And we would get a lot of patients also that they were referred from their job because they had like a free um, clinic that came and they were seeing the patients free and they found incidentally like a like a little small um, nodule on the thyroid. So then they would refer them to us and my doctor would work them up for like thyroid cancer. But the majority of them were females. So it's most commonly found in females for the thyroid cancer. Okay, guys, so let's go into the different types. So we have different types. We have papillary, follicular, medullary, and anaplastic. The most common type is going to be papillary, and this one's the least aggressive, which is good. The worst one and the most aggressive one is going to be your anaplastic one. This one's the worst one and the most aggressive one. Okay, so let's talk about papillary, which is the most common type. So like we said, this one's the least aggressive. It grows very slow, okay, and it spreads very slowly. It's usually characterized histological by some MoMA body. So make sure you know that P, P, right? Papillary, P has some MoMA. Papillary thyroid cancer, some MoMA bodies, okay? Risk factors for papillary thyroid cancer is if the patient had a history of head or neck radiation. So if a patient had, I know I have like a, a question on a patient. The patient was a male, so it threw me off. And it was a male. The patient was treated for Hodgkin's lymphoma when they were younger, and they had to go through... 
a lot of um, radiation and the patient had papillary thyroid cancer. So um, if it tells you in the question stem that the patient has a history of record head or neck radiation, then you want to think about papillary thyroid carcinoma. Okay. Um, signs and symptoms, like I said, most of these will be asymptomatic. They're usually just found incidentally on exam. Okay. Like I said, these patients that would be that would be referred to us because their job had like this free clinic where they did like ultrasound of the thyroid and then they found a nodule and they referred them to us. Like I said, these are incidentally found. It's usually just a thyroid nodule. You're going to diagnose this patient by doing a TSH, T TSH, T3, and T4, and you're going to do a thyroid ultrasound. This is going to help you differentiate from a solid nodule from a cystic nodule, okay? But usually the fine needle aspiration is going to be required for diagnosis, okay? And like I said, that's where my doctor would go. He would go in there, he would use the ultrasound, and then he would aspirate it, and then he would let the patient know um, what, what they found. So some of my bodies, once again, are associated with papillary cancer. With the treatment, it's going to be a total thyroidectomy, okay? And some of the complications of a thyroidectomy is that they can have vocal cord paralysis, hypoparathyroidism, like we discussed, and um, hypothyroidism also with these patients. So let's go into our next one. It's going to be medullary cancer, uh, medullary thyroid cancer. This one's associated with MEN2, okay? Basically, it's a neuroendocrine tumor of the parafollicular or C cells of the thyroid gland that produce calcitonin. So this is the only one that produces calcitonin from all the other types of thyroid cancer. And like we said, it's associated with MEN2. So MEN2A or MEN2B, it's associated with these. Symptoms and signs, a patient's going to be presenting with trouble swallowing. They'll have hoarseness. It makes sense, right? If it's growing so large, it can compress the laryngeal nerve. Diarrhea, facial flushing. And the diarrhea and the facial flushing is because they has these secrete, um, the, these secrete the calcitonin and serotonin. So that's why these patients are having this diarrhea, facial flushing. On exam, you'll see that they have a palpable solitary nodule, and it's usually going to be in the upper portion of the thyroid gland. They might also have cervical lymph nodes that are palpable. How are you going to diagnose this patient? You're going to do an ultrasound of the neck. It's going to show an hypo, uh, hypoechoic microcalcification. On labs, they're going to have a elevated calcitonin level, and then they'll have an elevated CEA. Remember, so that CEA is also associated with what? Colorectal cancer. But usually a fine needle aspiration biopsy is going to be diagnostic once again. So for all these cancers, you have to go in there and you have to biopsy to see what type it is. And treatment is going to be the total thyroidectomy once again. Okay. And usually with help maintenance, you want to make sure that you measure the serum calcitonin and CA two to three months after surgery to rule out there that there's any residual disease. And then you want to do an ultrasound six to 12 months post-op. And then I'm going to briefly measure mention the other one. So the follicular one, uh, this one's a herthal variant that has low affinity for radioactive iodine. This one metastasizes to the lymph nodes, bones, and lungs. So this is going to be the follicular one. And like we said, the anaplastic one, that's just the most severe one. And that's the one that's the most aggressive. Okay. This one rapidly enlarges and um, it's a rapidly enlarging mass with distant metastasize. So this one's rapidly growing and metastasizes really quickly. And which one did we say was the most common one? It's going to be the papillary one. The most severe one is going to be the anaplastic. Which one secretes calcitonin? It's going to be medullary. Which one has somoma bodies? That's going to be your papillary right. Okay. All right, guys. So that was endocrine. So we're done with the endocrine. Let's go into critical care. This is going to be 7% of your exam, okay? So there is a topic on there on the blueprint that talks about, it just says acute abdomen. So make sure that you know about what are some of the causes that can cause acute abdomen. It's not only GI. I mean, there's so many other causes that can cause acute abdomen, okay? So basically, acute abdomen refers to a sudden severe abdominal pain that lasts less than 24 hours. So some of the causes of acute abdomen we want to take, talk about is maybe acute peptic ulcer, if the patient has the diabetic ketoacidosis, if they have the diverticulitis, in females, if they have a topic pregnancy, right, ovarian torsion, even some males can present with abdominal pain uh, with testicular torsion. They can have also pyelonephritis, which is an inflammation of the kidneys. 
adrenal crisis. Another one that's very common is the triple A, right? Your abdominal aortic aneurysm sickle cell anemia crisis, and even kidney stones. So, I mean, there's several causes for acute abdomen. Usually the workup for these patients, we want to do a KUB and or a CT scan. And if the patient is unstable, then we want to give them IV fluids and do a fast ultrasound, okay? And if we see any type of free fluid there, like we suspect, then we can um, send the patient to surgery. Okay, so let's go into our topics. So I had briefly mentioned this earlier when we were talking about Addison's disease, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So acute adrenal insufficiency, also known as Addisonium crisis. So basically what happens with these patients is that once again, they have Addison's disease, okay? And either they weren't complying with their medication or any type of stress, whether it was an infection, whether they had surgery, a trauma, cause the adrenal crisis. These patients are going to be hypotensive, okay, and they're going to be extremely ill. They're going to be very acutely ill. These patients are going to be presenting with anorexia, fatigue, lethargy, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. They're going to be in shock, okay. They're going to have severe hypotension. And then when we do our labs, remember what is associated with Addison's disease? It was your hypo, uh, hyperkalemia, hypotension, and then hyponatremia, right? They're also going to be hypoglycemic. They're going to be metabolic acidotic with these patients. They're going to have renal failure. The cortisol is going to be low. And you're going to diagnose it with an ACTH stimulation test or a cosentropin test, okay? And basically, the cortisol will not elevate. How are you going to treat these patients? You're going to give them an IV hydrocortisone, and it's going to be high doses. Remember, we discussed this, okay? We're going to give them IV fluids. So now that we've discussed that, let's go into our GI bleeds. So before we go into our GI bleeds, we want to make sure that we know the difference between an upper GI bleed and a lower GI bleed. What's going to tell you the difference? Where do you mark the di where do you mark upper and GI? I mean, what anatomical point in the body is going to say this is an upper GI bleed and this is a lower GI bleed? So it's going to be the suspensory ligament of trites. Anything that's above the suspensory ligament of trites, it's going to be characterized as an upper GI bleed. Anything that's lower than the uh, suspensory ligament of trites, it's going to be defined as a lower GI bleed, okay? So what do we want to consider in a patient that has an upper GI bleed? So some of the considerations is that we want to think about esophageal varices. Remember, we discussed these uh, esophageal varices in patients that have cirrhosis or lower failure. Also, if they have portal hypertension, once again, if they have peptic ulceration, if they have gastritis, Mallory Weiss tear also. What was another one we also discussed about? It was which one? The Borhav syndrome, right? Some of the risk factors is if the patient has been using NSAIDs, aspirin, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, if they drink a lot of alcohol, if they had a previous GI bleed, if they have any type of liver problems, okay? Um, it's really interesting for those of you who are fans of Dr. House. There's an episode where there's a patient that has an acute upper GI bleed. And the patient had came in the previous day with Dr. Chase. And she had told her that she had, she had told the doctor that she was having like abdominal pain. And the doctor told her to take, I think, like uh, NSAIDs. And so she did take the NSAIDs. And it ended up that she had a ruptured peptic ulcer and then the next day she came in and she was like bleeding out really bad and I remember the doctor Dr. Chase was like really worried because he had almost killed the patient I don't remember if he killed her or not but that's why it's really important that with these patients that have any type of peptic ulcer disease we want to make sure that they avoid your NSAIDs because those are associated with your GI bleeds so how are these patients with upper GI bleeds going to present they're going to be presenting with hematemesis which is basically vomiting blood or coffee ground emesis. They're going to have melina, black, teary stools, okay? So whenever we see hematemesis that they're vomiting blood, we're thinking about a bright, we're thinking about an upper GI bleed, okay? Because that's not going to be associated with a lower GI bleed. That's too far in the GI system. And then if we see melina, which are your black, teary stools, then we want to think also about an upper GI bleed, okay? Because that's not associated with the lower GI bleed.
And then sometimes you can see hematochoesia, but this is usually if the patient is having like a mass, massive upper GI bleed. This patient on exam is going to be tachycardic. They're going to be guarding. They're going to be, have abdominal tenderness. They're going to have um, uh, hypotension. So with these patients, how are you going to diagnose them? Basically, you're going to do a type and screen because if the patient needs blood, you need to transfusion. You're going to do a hemoglobin level, a platelet count, a coagulation study, liver enzymes, albumin. You want to look at their kidney levels, so BUN and creatinine. You want to make sure that you do a nasogastric lavage to look if there's any type of intragrassic blood. And then you want to do an endoscopy once the patient is stable to see what is the cause of the GI bleed. And the treatment is usually going to be nothing by mouth. You want to give them oxygen, IV fluids also because you want to correct their electrolytes. Okay, you want to treat them with IV uh, PPIs uh, until we confirm what is the cause of the bleeding. And then, of course, we want to consult GI and then treat whatever is the underlying cause. Okay, guys, so let's go into our lower GI bleeds. So this is going to be what, once again, is the anatomical, the anatomy that's going to tell, tell us what that it's a GI bleed at a lower GI bleed it's going to be the suspensory ligament of trites right so anything that's below that is going to be considered a lower GI bleed so these patients are going to be um some of the things that we want to consider is going to be diverticulosis remember we said that's the most common cause of a GI bleed in a patient that's older so that's going to be the most common cause of blood in the stool diverticulosis um, we also want to think about colon cancer, proctitis, inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis, right? These patients are going to be presenting with hematochoesia, which is going to be the passage of bright red blood. They may have also melina. They're going to have hyper hypotension or shock, depending on how severe it is. With these patients, we want to do a CBC. We want to look at their liver test, coagulation studies. We want to monitor their hemoglobin. We want to monitor their heart, so they're going to do AKG. We're going to do a colonoscopy to make sure that we rule out any type of upper GI bleed. And then you, we can do a CT or mesenteric angiography. Okay. Treatment for this is usually going to be supportive. We're going to give them oxygen. We're going to put an IV axis. We're going to give them flu, fluids and blood resuscitation if they lost a lot of blood for these patients. So just make sure that you know the difference between an upper and lower GI bleed and what are some of the causes of the upper and lower GI bleed, okay? And we want to know that the anatomical location that's going to tell us the difference between an upper and a lower GI bleed, it's going to be your ligament of trites. Okay, so I know I had to briefly describe acute abdomen. Why don't we go into a little bit more detail, basically, on what you can expect depending on which organ is involved. So if it's anything related to the renal so we want to think about a right-sided flank pain, right? And it's usually going to be a colicky right-sided uh, flank pain. The patient is usually going to be complaining of nausea, vomiting. Sometimes they say that they'll have some blood in their urine. The CVA tenderness is also going to be tender. So once you do the exam in the back, right? So you place your hand, you go like this on the back, they're literally going to jump off or it's going to be painful for them. With these patients, what we want to do is that we want to do a BUN and creatinine, right? We want to look at their kidneys, see how their kidneys are working. We want to do a UA. We want to do a CT of their abdomen. We also want to do a renal ultrasound. We want to do blood cultures and then a KUB. Okay. So what are our differential diagnoses for these patients? We want to think about kidney stones, right? So nephrolithiasis, renal cell carcinoma is a big one that we want to make sure that we don't miss, usually with renal cell carcinoma. They'll be presenting also with a mass that's very palpable. Pyelonephritis also. And then anything that's also related to the GI can also present in the flanks. We also want to think about glomerulonephritis and, of course, splenic rupture in a patient who had trauma. So what about pancreas? Anything that's related with the pancreas? The patient's going to be complaining about epigastric pain that radiates to the back. And usually the epigastric pain is going to be characterized like a dull pain. The workup for these patients is going to be a CT abdomen. We want to do a complete blood cell count, so CBC. We want to look at their electrolytes, right? Especially since these patients, if they do have pancre pancreatitis, they're usually vomiting a lot like we discussed earlier. We want to look at their amylase, lipase, AST, ALT, bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, and ultrasound of the abdomen. 
So what are going to be our differential diagnosis for anything that's related with the pancreas? And they're complaining of the epigastric pain. So we said uh, pancreatitis for sure. Pancreatic, pancreatic cancer also. Peptic ulcer disease, which can also present with the epigastric pain. Cholecystitis and then cholecystitis also. Okay. So what about if the patient presents with the right upper quadrant pain? right upper quadrant pain. What are we going to be thinking about? So remember we said anything that's usually right upper quadrant pain, we want to think about the liver or the gallbladder. So if it's a gallbladder, what's going to be the workup for these patients? So we want to do an ultrasound of what the right upper quadrant ultrasound. We also want to do a CPC, a CMP, a HIDA scan also, an MRCP slash ERCP. We want to look at their amylase, their lipase, their alkaline phosphatase, and then their bilirubin also. Our differential diagnosis are going to be cholecystitis, cholecystitis, hepatitis, Ascending cholangitis, also Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. For those of you who are not familiar, familiar with that, it's basically what happens with when pelvic inflammatory disease is not treated. If the patient has not treated or they don't seek help for that, it can develop into Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome, which is, involves the liver. And these patients will have like these violin-like lesions on the, on the liver. So that's what Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome is. Uh, acute subhepatic appendicitis also. So what about if the patient has right upper quadrant pain and we're suspecting the liver is involved? So if the liver is involved, the patient's usually going to be complaining also of fever. They might be complaining of anorexia, nausea, vomiting, dark urine, and then also a clay stool. So remember we said that if the patient is complaining of a clay stool, we're thinking about um, bilirubin is the one that gives our stools the color brown. So if our stools are clay color and they're not that brown color anymore, then we're thinking about maybe an obstruction that's not allowing the bilirubin to go through the body. So with these patients, how are we going to work them up? We want to do a CBC. We want to do a lipase amylase. We want to look at their liver enzymes. Uh, sometimes we also want to think about the causes that can cause um, hepatitis. So we, we think about uh, A, B, C, uh, D, and E also. So with these patients, we also want to do the viral hepatitis serologies. Uh, we want to do a urine analysis, ultrasound of the abdomen, ERCP, and MRCP. Also because the patient can have some obstruction, like we said, some gallstone can get stuck in the common bile duct, which can be causing that also. Differential diagnosis is going to be hepatitis, right? Acute hepatitis. The patient may also be complaining of acute cholecystitis. Like I said, if that stone gets lodged up in the common bile duct, then we can think about... Um, uh, also ascending cholangitis, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, primary sclerosis, and cholangitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, and glomerulonephritis. So what if it involves the spleen? The patient's usually going to be complaining of left upper quadrant pain, okay? With these patients, it's going to be this pain on the left upper quadrant that radiates to the scapula. It's going to be the left scapula. And then sometimes these patients also might have a history of mononucleosis because remember with patients that have mononucleosis, they'll be presenting with an enlarged spleen. So how are we going to work up these patients? We want to do a CBC, chest x-ray, uh, CT or ultrasound of the abdomen, right? If it's a CBC, we want to look at their neutrophils, what blood cell count, okay? And differential diagnosis for us is going to be whether there was a splenic rupture, if the patient had some type of trauma, also, a splenic infarct, so basically the kidney, I'm sorry, the spleen just infarted. Usually this is common in patients that have sickle cell anemia. We also want to think about maybe kidney stones, a rib fracture, pneumonia even can present with a left upper quadrant pain, and of course a perforated peptic ulcer. And then stomach, anything that's related with the stomach, the patient's usually going to be complaining of brain epiaster pain after they eat. We want to work these patients up by doing I amylase, lipase, lactate, AST, AOT, bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase. We want to do an upper endoscopy. We want to look for H. pylori because usually H. pylori is a culprit for anything that's related with the stomach. Upper GI series, if we can, we can also do a rectal exam to look if there's any occult blood in the stool. What we want to think about when a patient's complaining with uh, stomach pain, we want to think about peptic ulcer disease the emergency one, which is a perforated peptic ulcer, gastritis, gastroesophageal reflux disease, right, cholecystitis, mesenteric ischemia, especially if the patient's older and they have a history of coronary artery disease, and then chronic pain.
pancreatitis. So these are just some of the acute abdomen that you want to have in the back of your mind, just in case you get a question on this. I think I had a few questions on these on my internal medicine ER. Okay, so let's go into glaucoma. What's glaucoma? It's basically we have an increased intraocular pressure with optic nerve damage, okay? So we have our acute angle, we have acute glaucoma, and then we have our chronic glaucoma, okay? And then what we wanna think about glaucoma is we have two types. It's usually gonna be due to angle closure, or we have the open angle glaucoma also, but for your exam, the one that would be emergency would be your um, closed angle or angle closure, okay? Glaucoma. So basically, how is this patient going to present? They're going to present with a sudden, dull, or severe eye pain that's going to be bilateral. It's going to be worse in dark rooms. That's usually pathognomonic for acute angle closure glaucoma, okay? And the thing you need to know about the acute angle glaucoma closure, basically the pathophysiology for these patients is that basically the peripheral iris blocks outflow of aqueous humor from the anterior chamber into the canal of Schlem. So this causes pupil uh, papillary dilation. So this is why it's an emergency. Okay, It's more than an emergency than your open angle because it's open versus this one's closed. Um, usually with closed, it's more immediate. So the patient's going to be presenting a blurry vision. They're going to have a uh, decrease visual acuity. They also are going to be presenting with a headache. They'll be even having some symptoms of nausea and vomiting because it's so painful. On physical exam, you're going to see basically that the patient has a cloudy, steamy, or stifled hazy cornea. And usually they're going to say it's uh, mid-position or mid-dilated in a non-reactive pupil. Like I said, this is an emergency. So what you're going to do on your exam, you're going to do a tonometry. Basically, it's going to show you that there's increased intraocular pressure greater than 50. And usually the gold standards textbooks that I was reading, the gold standard is going to be the, go the gonioscopy. So G-O-N-I-O-S-C-O-P-Y. Okay. What you need to know, that though, is that basically the normal intraocular pressure is between 10 to 21 um, mmHg. So make sure that you know that because when they do it, uh, Basically, a tonometry on this patient, it's going to have an increased intraocular pressure. It's going to be more than 50, okay? So how are you going to treat these patients? Of course, you're going to refer them immediately, but there, since you're going to treat them and the question is going to say what's going to be the next treatment, you're going to do first topical agents that decrease the amount of aqueous humor that's going to be produced. So this is going to be your beta blockers like your Timol, okay? So that's going to be usually what you're going to do first line. And then you can also add IV acet uh, acetazolamide, IV acetazolamide, or you can do an osmotic diuretic like IV mental. Okay, so if it tells you what's the first line, you can do a beta blocker, and then you can add adjunctive cyclopegic agents like IV acetazolamide. And the definitive treatment is usually going to be a laser iridotomy. Okay, and this is usually going to be done by an ophthalmologist. So this is acute. What if it's a chronic primary open angle? So this one isn't as severe as your, I mean, they're both severe, but it, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't happen as an emergency, okay, with your primary open angle in comparison to your closed angle one. So with these patients, it's going to be found in African-American patients most commonly. It'll be a patient that's going to be older, like usually older than 40. They'll have a family history of glaucoma or diabetes. And basically what happens with this one is that there's an outflow obstruction through the trabecular meshwork like we described earlier with our acute closed anger, angle glaucoma. So what you want to know is that this one's actually more common than acute, but usually on the questions, it'll the ones I've had, it's usually closed angle because that's like an emergency. With these patients, they're going to be complaining of gradual loss of peripheral vision, but this one's going to be painless, okay? Versus the other one we said for open angle uh, glaucoma, this one's going to be very severe eye pain, okay? Versus the one that's going to be open, it's going to be painless. So with, this pa with these patients, basically what you're going to do is you're going to refer them and then we're going to do the same treatment. You're going to give them topical medications like beta blocker, um, alpha agonists, and then you can also give them prostaglandin analogs or 
cholinergics, and then of course uh, laser or surgical treatments, usually the definitive treatment for these patients. Okay guys, so now that we've done glaucoma, let's go into acute respiratory distress syndrome, okay, ARDS. So acute respiratory distress syndrome is basically an acute hypoxemia respiratory failure following a systemic or pulmonary insult without evidence of heart failure, okay? Some of the risk factors is going to be sepsis. That's actually the most common one. If the patient aspirated, if they have severe trauma, um, if they are overdosed on certain drugs or toxins, also intracranial hypertension. And then, of course, what's the most common one we're seeing now? We're seeing COVID-19 that can cause acute respiratory distress syndrome. Basically, these patients are going to be presenting with a rapid onset of dyspnea. It's going to be about 12 to 48 hours after whatever caused it or whatever precipitated it, whether it was sepsis, COVID-19. These patients are going to be presenting with labored breathing. They'll be breathing really, really fast. Also, they have tachypne tachypnea. They'll have tachycardia. You can see that they're even having like retractions because they're having trouble breathing. They'll have crackles. They'll be uh, having hypoxemia that basically you're giving these patients oxygen and they're still becoming hypoxemic. So they're not even responding to the oxygen with these patients. So what's going to be the diagnosis for these patients? Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to do a chest x-ray. You're going to see diffuse bilateral pulmonary infiltrates with air bron bronchograms. That's usually the pathognomonic one of them. Uh, it described a patient with acute respiratory uh, distress or failure, and I read that they had um, diffuse bilateral pulmonary infiltrates with air bronchograms, and that's when I, I'm like, okay, this is ARDS. And then, of course, you're going to do the pulmonary artery catheter. It's going to tell you that the pulmonary catheter wedge pressure is going to be low. And then, of course, you can do a bronchoscope with uh, bronchoalveolar lavage if the patient is very, very ill, and then, of course, if you want a gram stain. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? So most of these patients are usually going to be intubated, and you're going to mechanically ventilate them with PEEP, so basically with positive end expiration pressure with these patients. And then if the patient's overloaded, which was the case that I saw a lot during my internal medicine rotation with patients over COVID, we would actually put them on diuretics for these patients that were volume overloaded, okay? And then, of course, we want to treat whatever is causing it. If it's sepsis, we want to make sure that we get the sepsis under control. So that is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, what do we go into acute respiratory failure, which is basically a respiratory dysfunction that leads to trouble with oxygenation or ventilation that's so severe that it threatens the function of vital organs like the heart, the lungs, and the symptoms are going to be presenting, these patients are going to be hypoxemic or they're going to be hypercapnic. So these patients are going to be presenting with dyspnea. They're going to be presenting with a headache, a delirium. Also, they'll be cyanotic. They'll have peripheral and conjunctival hyperemia. They'll, have, they'll be confused, which makes sense, right? Any patient that has trouble breathing or they're not properly getting rid of the carbon dioxide or properly receiving it, they're going to be confused, they're going to be bradycardic, uh, they're going to be breathing really, really fast, so they're going to be tachypnic, tachycardia, hypertension, they'll have asterixis, and they can also have signs of um, increased optic nerve pressure like papal edema. With these patients, we want to do an ABG and basically treat whatever is causing the acute respiratory failure with these patients. But of course, we're going to make sure that we are adequately helping them with respiration. So either with ventilator support, with a BiPAP, which is usually the one that's preferred, or intubating these patients. Okay. Okay, guys. So now that we're done with that one, let's go into myocardial infarction, okay? So myocardial infarction, we want to think about an acute myocardial infarction or heart attack in a patient that has any history of coronary artery disease, and if they present with hypotension and bradycardia, okay? So with this one, you have to make sure that you know the leads. Remember we discussed earlier 2-3 AVF, that's gonna be the very, very highly tested that you're gonna see. 2-3 AVF is gonna be associated with what? We said it's gonna be associated with the um, inferior part of the heart. And also, 
cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrest is usually due to what? Um, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. This is usually the majority of the percentage of patients that will have a cardiac arrest. With these patients, what do you want to treat them with? We want to give them the beta blockers, oxygen, um, morphine, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. Okay. So cardiac arrest, what is that? It's basically the sudden loss of cardiac output. This is usually reversible. Okay. That's if we do what I said earlier, if we give them oxygen. And then we have sudden cardiac death. What is sudden cardiac death? This is where the patient unexpectedly dies within one hour of the symptoms, secondary to some cause of uh, cardiac cause. And then we have pulseless electrical activity, which happens when electrical activity on the monitor. So you see electrical activity on the monitor, but the patient is basically pulseless. They don't even have a pulse. This is what pulseless electrical activity is. Which, that's why it's named that. So the patient has, you see electrical activity on the monitor, but the patient has no pulse. And what are the, some of the causes that we want to think about? So according to the Physician Assistant Exam Review Book, which is where I get most of my information from, they say that you want to think about the five H's and the five T's, which is going to be your hypoxia, hypovolemia, hyperkalemia or hypokalemia, and then your acidosis, so your H+, plus, and then your hypothermia. So those is going to be your five H's, okay? And then, of course, you want to think about your five T's, so cardiac tamponade, tension in thorax, any toxins, uh, thromboembolism, like uh, pulmonary embolism, and then thrombosis of myocardial infarction, okay? So this is what we want to think about for pulseless electrical activity, PEA, these five H's, and then these five T's. All right, guys, so why don't we go on to our next one, which is going to be... DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. So DKA is more common in what diabetics? It's more common in diabetics that are type 1, okay? So DKA is more common in patients that have type 1 with these patients. So what is the cause of DKA? Usually what happens is that the patient, that there's lack of insulin. So there's lack of insulin, which is going to cause mobilization of fatty acids from adipose tissue because of the unsuppressed adipose cell lipus activity that breaks down triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol. Basically, these patients are going to presenting with your common symptoms of the diabetes, which is going to be a polyuria, polydipsia, but they're going to have also nausea and vomiting. They're going to be very toxic appearing when they show up. They're going to have abdominal pain, okay, which is going to mimic your acute abdomen that we discussed earlier with these patients. And the thing that helps you differentiate DKA from any type of acute abdomen, because like I said, these patients can present with the nausea and vomiting, acute abdomen, which is going to maybe might tell you, hey, maybe this is not DKA. What's going to differentiate it that, and tell you that it is DKA is the presence of polyuria, okay? This is going to tell you that the patient um, indicates osmotic diuresis, and then this is going to help you differentiate DKA from GI. The patient's also going to be presenting with Kuzmal breathing, okay? Kuzmal breathing, which is a tachypnea with deep respirations. And then they're going to have ketosis on their breath. So they're going to have that sweet, fruity breath that you probably learned about during your didactic year in PA school. They're also going to be presenting with ultramental status. So it's going to be the workup for these patients. Basically, these patients are going to be hyperglycemic, okay? Their pH, their arterial pH is going to be less than 7.3, which makes sense, right? Because these patients are going to be what well, metabolic acidotic. The serum bicarb is going to be less than 15. What are the normal levels for serum bicarb? 22 to 26. So it's going to be less than 15. Once again, metabolic acidotic. They're going to have pseudo hyponatremia, and that's because of the hyperglycemia. They may or may not have an elevated BUN with these patients. But just know that they're going to have hyperketonemia, they're going to have acidemia, and they're going to have hyperglycemia, okay? They're going to be what? Metabolic acidotic. Usually it's going to be a high anion gap. So how do we want to treat with these patients that have diabetic ketoacidosis? So what we want to do is that most of these patients are going to be vomiting, right? 
and we want to assume that they are severely dehydrated. So we want to give them IV normal saline or lactated ringers to make sure that we are helping them with their renal perfusion and then we're helping them with the fluids that they have lost. After we've done that, then we want to give them insulin. Okay, it's going to be done via IV fusion. And then remember that we might have to correct for the hypokalemia for these patients. But we want to make sure that we do not add the potassium until we've added the IV fluid. So then we can add the potassium. Okay. So what are the, some, some of the common complications and basically the most serious complication if a patient has a DKA and it's not treated in a timely manner or if it's not treated in general? So if a patient has diabetic ketoacidosis, the most serious complication is going to be cerebral edemia and herniation. And that's going to be usually because of fluid administration. Like we learned if fluid administration is or IV fluids are given too quickly, it's going to shift. There's going to be rapid shifts in osmolality and fluid balance. So these patients are going to be presenting with severe headaches, vomitings, uh, change in their visual and their vital signs uh, like bradycardia, hypertension, apnea, they'll have dilated pupils, seizures, and with these patients, we want to intubate them. Give them IV mannitol to decrease that cerebral edema, right, and then ventilate these patients. So DKA basically is going to be common in a patient that has diabetes mellitus type 1, right? With these patients, they're going to be presenting with polyuria, polydipsia, nausea and vomiting. They also might have some um, abdominal pain. They're going to have the Kuzmal breathing, okay? Ketosis on their breath, which is going to be a fruity breath. They'll have altered mental status. Majority of these patients are going to be hyperglycemic. Between 200 to 1,000 is going to be their glucose level. Their pH is going to be less than 7.3, and their bicarb is going to be less than 15. So these patients are going to be what? Metabolic acidotic. Usually they'll be a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. These patients are also going to be um, hyperketonemia. They'll have acidemia, hyperglycemic, like I said. Treatment for these patients is going to be with what? We want to give them fluids, okay? Fluids, 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 but we want to make sure that we correct the fluids in a proper manner because if we do not collect, correct them in a proper manner, the patient can develop uh, cerebral edema and herniation. But we're going to give them basically IV normal saline or lactate ringers, ringers, and then we want to give them insulin. And then if we have to correct for the hypokalemia, then we correct for the hypokalemia. Okay, guys, so now let's go into hypoglycemia. So we talked about DKA, which is basically hyperglycemia. Let's talk about hypoglycemia, which is going to be the opposite. Okay. So... Fasting hypoglycemia. What we want to think about if a patient presents with this is basically an insulinoma, okay? And a healthy patient, so we want to think about insulinomas. We also want to think about Addison's disease, mixed edema, if the patient has acute alcoholism, okay? But the most common cause is usually going to be an adenoma of the islet of Langerhans. How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with confusion, blurred vision, diplopia, anxiety, and seizures. The diagnosis is basically going to be a glucose that's going to be less than 45 for these patients, but they start having symptoms once their glucose levels are less than 60. Another thing that we want to do for these patients is that we want to do a serum insulin, a pro-insulin and C-peptide, and then we want to make sure that we get... Um, other lab studies like uh, serum ketones, antibodies to insulin, and the treatment and maintenance for these patients is basically we want to monitor their glucose, so you're going to tell them to go have a home glucose monitor. We want to measure the time of symptoms and the prior consumption of carbs. And then we want to make sure that if it is an, an insulinoma, which is going to be the most common cause, we want to make sure that we resect the, the insulin secreting tumors, Okay. So fasting hypoglycemia, the most common cause is going to be an insulinoma, which is basically the patient becomes hypoglycemic, which makes sense, right? Because what does insulin do? They help move the glucose um, in your cells. So that's why if you have too much insulin, the patient's going to be hypoglycemic and their serum glucose is usually going to be less than 45. They'll be presenting with symptoms of anxiety, seizures, diplopia, blurred vision, and confusion with these patients. All right, guys. So the next topic I'm going to go over is going to be hypertensive crisis, okay? 
So we have two types. We have a hypertensive urgency and then a hypertensive emergency. If you talk to certain doctors, they'll tell you that hypertensive urgency doesn't exist. It's just hypertensive ur emergency. But in regards to your textbooks and to the end of rotation exam, we're going to go over both of them, okay? So what is basically the pathophysiology of hypertensive crisis? It's usually an abrupt rise in blood pressure that's associated with increased systemic vascular resistance. Basically, there's a very high increase in blood pressure that's going to be very dangerous and it's sustained. This can lead to endothelial cell deterioration. deterioration. And if there's increased pressure, what's going to cause it's going to cause capillary leakage with exudation of fibrinogen and proteins, leading to swelling and fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel wall. Okay. So how is the patient going to present if they have hypertensive urgency? Basically, this is defined as an increase in blood pressure where the patient has no apparent acute end organ damage or symptoms, okay? Once again, it's gonna be defined as an increase in blood pressure with no apparent acute end organ damage or symptoms, okay? So increase in blood pressure, but they don't have any damage to like their eyes, to their kidneys, they're fine. They just have an increase in blood pressure. That's why there's a huge debate on whether hypertensive urgency exists or not. So with these patients, what we want to do is that we want to decrease our blood pressure over hours. So we don't want to decrease it quickly. We want to decrease it over hours. It's going to be de decreased very slowly with these patients. So we're going to decrease it with oral agents like recaptopril, clonidine, or labetalol you can use. And our goal is to reduce the blood pressure to 160, less than 160 and uh, less than one over 100. So less than 160 systolic over less than 100 diastolic for these patients, okay? So I was listening to a podcast the other day, and like I said, there were some doctors that were discussing hypertensive urgency, and they said whether you should refer these patients to the emergency room or not. But during my ER rotation, we saw a lot of these patients that their hypertension was just off the roof and they presenting with, they're perfectly fine. They just presented probably with a mild headache. We did our physical exam and everything and the patient was fine. We worked them up and it was fine. All we did is just lower the blood pressure, like I said, with the medications. My doctors preferred labetalol, so that's what they used. And that's basically what they did. They just decreased their blood pressure. And the thing that there was a debate over on the podcast I was listening to was that the doctors were arguing on whether the patient should go to the emergency room or not. Because what happens when a patient sees that their blood pressure is out of control, they get scared. They call usually like the nurse hotline on the back of their insurance card if they have like Medicaid or Medicare on the back of their card and they tell them to go to the emergency room. So they do. And so that's why uh, these doctors are getting upset over the phone because they said these patients can be managed in the clinic if they're not having any severe symptoms like visual problems or anything that can that you might want to think that a, that an organ is being damaged but usually with hypertensive urgency they just have a very very increased blood pressure usually going to be over 120 so it's going to be 180 over 120 so 180 systolic 120 uh, diastolic so it's going to be usually greater than that and these patients are gonna freak out and they'll call their, their hotline and then the hotline's gonna tell them to go to the emergency room. And so they were saying that it, if that happens, they should just call their family care or their primary care doctor and they can go to the clinic and then the doctor can evaluate them and then give them a medication. For example, like clonidine, my doctor, my nephrologist likes to give clonidine, especially in these situations, and then just follow up with them the next day. But once again, this is just something that they were debating about. I thought it was a, a good, good tool. So take it however you want to take it. <laughs> All right. So that was for hypertensive urgency. Once again, it's a increased blood pressure. Usually it's going to be greater than 180 over 120. And this patient's not going to be presenting with any signs of, of basically end organ damage or any symptoms of end organ damage. They just have a high blood pressure. That's it. What you want to do with these patients is that you want to decrease the blood flow, um, the blood flow, the blood pressure, but you want to do it very slowly. It's going to be usually done over hours, okay, not within minutes. Some of the things you can give them is labetalol, captor pro, or clonidine, okay. So, once again, the mean arterial pressure should not be lower 
for by more than 25%, someone books a 20% over the first several hours for hypertensive urgency, okay? All right, guys, so let's go into hypertensive emergencies. So this one is an emergency. With these patients, they have a sudden increase in blood pressure or sudden onset of hypertension. Usually the systolic blood pressure is going to be greater than 180. We discussed and diastolic blood pressure is going to be greater than 120. But with these patients, they are going to have uh, end organ damage. So they'll have symptoms and signs of end organ damage. This is what differentiates hypertensive urgency to hypertensive emergency. With hypertensive emer emergency, they are going to have signs and symptoms of end organ damage. So what are the signs and symptoms these patients are going to be presenting with? They can present with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. They can present with a stroke, seizures, uh, encephalopathy also. With these patients, what we want to do is we want to do a neuro exam, right? And then we want to make sure that we order a CT to rule out any uh, stroke the patient might be having. This patient can also have damage to their heart. So they might have aortic dissection, right? Aortic dissection, which is a the really bad, um, the chest pain that radiates to the back. They're gonna have acute coronary syndrome, acute heart failure, and pulmonary edema. With these patients, we wanna do what we usually do an EKG for any patient that presents with anything that's cardiac related. We wanna do a chest X-ray just to make sure that we're ruling out aortic dissection, especially if we have an older patient, if they're male. And then, of course, we want to make sure if they look for any pulmonary edema on the chest x-ray. And then we want to do CK and B intraplanin labs if we think that this might be a heart attack. Also, the patient is going to be presenting with deteriorating renal function. So they'll have damage to their kidneys, like acute in kidney injury. So we want to look for proteinuria, which is protein in the urine, uh, blood in the urine, like hematuria. So for this, we want to do a urine analysis. And then we also want to do blood work. Uh, we want to look at the BUN and creatinine, and usually it's going to be elevated for these patients. Okay. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? Oh, I'm sorry. One thing before I forget, because this is important, they're also going to have ret uh, retinopathy. So basically, when we look in the eye, they're going to have papillary edema, retinal hemorrhage, and exudates, okay? So... How do we treat these patients? It's once again, we want to lower the blood pressure, but we want to lower it in minutes for these patients, okay? Lower the blood pressure in minutes. With this, what we're going to use is we're going to use a parenteral nitroprusside. This is first line. And then we can also use labetalol and nicardipine also. So we want to basically target blood pressure goals no more than 25% reduction within two minutes to two hours to a range of 160 over 100. Okay, that's according to the book that we are reading. Because once again, if we lower the blood pressure too fast, then that can be bad. So there are only two exceptions where you lower the blood pressure extremely fast. And that's usually gonna be if the patient has an ischemic stroke, if it's an acute phase of an ischemic stroke, then that's where we can lower the blood pressure quickly for these patients. Or if they have an aortic dissection, then that's when we can lower the blood pressure within 20 minutes. But if not, we want to make sure that we're lowering the blood pressure not extremely fast for these patients. So basically, what is going to be our treatment of hypertensive emergencies? So I discussed that it was sodium nitroprusside, right? That's usually going to be our first line according to the textbook that I'm reading that's going to be our first line but what if the patient has renal failure then what do we want to give them if the patient has renal failure we can give them something like a nicardipine okay for these patients okay so next topic is going to be our pneumothoraxes right we have retention pneumothorax and then just the um, regular pneumothorax or spontaneous pneumothorax so let's talk about spontaneous pneumothorax. Basically, with this patient, it's not as emergent as our, as our tension pneumothorax. So make sure that you differentiate which one is usually like an emergency and which one isn't. Uh, tension pneumothorax is more of an emergency than uh, spontaneous pneumothorax or primary pneumothorax. So what is a uh, spontaneous pneumothorax? Basically, what happens is that in these patients, it's going to be a very healthy male they're gonna be described as a tall, lean male. 
And what happens is that there's a spontaneous rupture of the subpleural blebs. That's what happens in these patients with a spontaneous primary pneumothorax. And that's usually how it's going to present in the patient. Also, it can be traumatic, but usually you'll see that it's a tall, lean man. And they're going to be complaining with ipsilateral chest pain. And it's going to be sudden onset. They'll have trouble breathing. So they're going to be dyspneic. They're going to be coughing. And then on your physical exam, you're going to see that there's going to be decreased or absent tactile fremitus. Also, you're going to do a chest x-ray. On the chest x-ray of these patients, you're going to see mediastinal shift towards the affected side. They're going to have decreased breath sounds over the affected sides. And there's going to be hyperresonance, which makes sense, right? Whenever there's air, it's like you're playing a drum. That's why it's hyperresonant for these patients. So you're going to diagnose it with a chest x-ray. And once again, where is the mediastinal shift going to be? So it's going to be towards the pneumo towards the affected side, okay? So towards the pneumothorax. That's going to help you differentiate between a spontaneous pneumothorax and then a tension one, okay? So we said spontaneous, it's going to be towards the affected side. And we're going to do a chest x-ray. Usually with these patients, if it's small and the patient's asymptomatic, then all we're going to do is going to observe them. But if it's a large pneumothorax, then we can put a chest tube in these patients. So what about our tension pneumothorax? So these are the bad ones. With this patient, they're going to have air in the pleural space, okay? Uh, the tissue that surrounds the tissue surrounding opening acts as a valve. So basically air can enter but cannot leave with these patients. That's why they're going to have an accumulation of air that's going to have increased pressure with these patients. So what's going to happen is that the lung on the area that's affected, it's going to collapse and the mediastinum is going to shift, okay, it's going to shift away from the affected side. So that's how we're going to differentiate it from a spontaneous pneumothorax and then a tension pneumothorax is going to be the, the the basically the the mediastinum. So the mediastinum is going to be in a spontaneous towards the affected side, and then in a tension, it's going to be away from the affected side. Okay, make sure that you know that. Some of the causes is going to be the most common one's going to be trauma. Also, if the patient was mechanically ventilated, the patient's going to be presenting how sick they're going to be hypotensive. They're going to be have uh, distended neck veins. Okay decreased breath sounds, hyperresonance. Diagnostics, basically we're going to do a chest x-ray and this is where we see the mediastinal shift that's going to be away from the affected area. So if it involves this lung, it's going to be away on tension pneumothorax. If it involves this way lung and it's and it is a spontaneous pneumothorax and it's going to be towards it, okay? So how are we going to treat these patients? We're going to treat them differently than a, a spontaneous pneumothorax. So with these patients, what we're going to do is we're going to do chest decompression with the large bore needle. Where is it going to place? It's going to be, be placed on the second or third intercostal space mid-clavicular line. Okay, make sure that you know that. So first line for these patients, you're going to do chest decompression. You're going to put a large bore needle. It's going to be placed in the second to third intercostals mid clavicular line okay and then after that you're going to do a chest tube placement versus our spontaneous pneumothorax it's observation right if it's small if it's large then that's when we do a chest tube placement so make sure that you know the differences between both of these so spontaneous pneumothorax it's going to be a tall thin skinny male on physical exam, you're going to see that the patient for spontaneous pneumothorax, they're going to have hyperresonance on when you do the physical exam on the side that's affected, and also they're going to have decreased breath sounds also. You're going to do a chest x-ray. On the chest x-ray, it's going to show you that the mediastinum or the trachea is moved towards the affected side, okay? Treatment's going to be a chest tube. If it's a large, if it's small, it's just going to be observation. And it's usually due to what? A spontaneous rupture of subpleural blebs. Okay. I had questions like there was a patient that they were just, they were, and it describes that they're skinny and tall and that they were driving and they had an accident. And then you're thinking, oh my gosh, it's tension pneumothorax because tension pneumothorax is associated with accidents. But then you see the chest x ray and it tells you that it's the trachea is towards, or sometimes I'll show you just text x, chest x-ray and you see that it's towards the affected side, you're like, okay, no, it's a spontaneous pneumothorax. 
versus attention pneumothorax, this is going to be more of an emergency, okay, with these patients, the trachea or the mediastinal shiv, it's going to be away from the affected side, okay? On physical exam, the patient's going to be hypotensive, they'll have distended neck veins. Once again, it's going to be hyper-resonance on the affected side, and then the patient is also going to have um, decreased breath sounds on the affected side. You're going to do a chest x-ray, and then for these patients, first line we want to do is put a needle. Make sure that you know that because it's going to ask you what's the next best step. So the next best step is going to be a chest decompression with a large bore needle. Where is it going to go? In the second or third mid-clavicular intercostal uh, space. And then after that, once you've done that and you decreased all the air, then you're going to do a chest tube placement, okay? Okay, so next one, we're going to go into pulmonary embolism, okay? You are definitely going to have a question on this one, so make sure that you know it. So pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary embolism is basically where you have a thrombus from another region of the body that embolizes to the pulmonary vascular tree, okay? This can be done via the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery. And this is more commonly found in males than females, according to the textbook I'm reading. What are some of the risk factors for pulmonary embolism? If the patient's older than 60, if they have a hypercoagulable state, if they have a family history of a family member having a history of a DVTs, what are some of the hypercoagulable states? The one I kept seeing was a factor 5 Leiden, Leiden. so sometimes... They'll give you a question sim with a patient that has a pulmonary embolism or even a DVT, and it asks you which one of these, um, which one of these is usually a risk factor for these patients, or which one of these was found in the history of the patient. So usually it was factor five laden, which was the answer for this. Also, they can have antithrombin three deficiency or protein C or S deficiency. With these patients, also the risk factors that they're going to have is that they've been immobilized for a long time, either because the patient's acutely ill or maybe they just had like a, a surgery, like a hip surgery or some type of bone surgery. Also, the one I also read a lot was a patient that just traveled, so they just got back from a long car ride or a long airplane ride. If the patient's obese, also if they're pregnant or if they use oral contraceptives. And remember, we want to think about the virtuose triad. Virtuose triad for DVTs and pulmonary embolism. So what's a virtuose triad? The mnemonic I have was SHE, which is going to be S for stasis, H for hypercoagulability, and then E for endothelial damage. So if you have these, they are going to make you more prone to possibly getting a DVT or pulmonary embolism. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to be dyspneic, okay? That's going to be the most common symptom the patient's going to present. They're going to be presenting you with pleuritic chest pain. And guys, what I want to talk about pulmonary embolism, that it's really important that you don't miss these when these are in clinic because they can be missed, okay? If a patient tells you and they come in and they say they have chest pain whenever they cough and it's <laughs> worse when they <laughs> cough then, and they're on oral contraceptives, and then we want to make sure that we work them up for pulmonary embolism because sometimes they can just have a small pulmonary embolism and that's why they're complaining of that chest pain. And then also ask them about when they cough. So is it worse when they <clears throat> inhale, okay, or exhale? When is it worse? So with these patients, they're going to have pleuritic chest pain. Like I said, it's going to be worse with inspiration. They're going to be coughing. These patients, we also want to make sure that we look at their thighs, okay? We look at their legs. So if they come to us, and this patient, like I said, they're painting us a picture of a pulmonary embolism, make sure that we get them in a gown and we look at their extremities, okay? I remember there was a PA that told us that he had a patient that he almost missed this diagnosis of pulmonary embolism because the patient just was complaining of a mild cough. Like I said, you want to look out for these small pulmonary embolism. So this patient was complaining of a, of a cough and it was just minor, but thankfully the nurse prior that had seen the patient had disrobed the patient, so the patient was in a gown. So what the PA went and did is that he went and he did his physical examination and he looked at the extremities and he said that one of the extremities was like purple. And so he asked the patient, hey, did you notice that your leg was purple? Like, did it hurt you? And the patient was like, no, I didn't even know it was there. So he would have totally missed it if the patient was not disrobed and if he would have 
have not examined the extremities. So that's why to make sure that, that we examine the extremities in these patients. So once again, they might have a calf or thigh um, swelling, and it's going to be very painful or sometimes not painful in these patients in clinic, but textbook wise, it's going to be painful. They're also be, going to be complaining of uh, hemoptysis. And how's the patient going to present? They're going to be tachypneic. They're going to be breathing really, really fast. Okay. They're going to be tachycardic. They're going to have rels, decreased breath sounds on whichever area is affected. They're going to have jugular venous distension and they're going to have a fever. Okay. So how are we going to screen these patients? Basically, we're going to do a chest x-ray, but usually the gold standard for this patient is going to be a CT pulmonary angiogram with contrast. That's going to be the gold standard. Once again, CT pulmonary angiogram with contrast is going to be the gold standard for these patients. We can also do a Doppler ultrasound of the lower extremity, okay? And then also with these patients, another question I got on is that you do an EKG on these patients, how is the EKG going to present? It's going to show S1, Q3, T3. So just make sure that you know that, okay? It's basically going to have nonspecific ST and T wave changes on your EKG. So S1, Q3, T3. So make sure you know that. So how are we going to treat these patients? Basically, we're going to give them oxygen if the patient is basically unstable when they present with us. We want to give them something like a vasopressors like norepinephrine, and we want to anticoagulate the patient, okay? So usually we're going to give TPA, especially if the patient has a massive pulmonary embolism, and it's usually going to be done within three hours. What's so going to be some more contraindications for a TPA? If the patient had some type of head trauma or a hemorrhagic stroke, because we give them TPA, it's going to make them bleed out if they have this. So it's going to be some of the contraindications for these patients. All right, guys, so let's go into our next topic, which is going to be seizures and status epilepticus, okay? So seizures and stati staticus status epilepticus. I'm sorry about that. So what is usually the cause of seizures? So seizures usually occur because there's increased depolarization. What is depolarization? That's when the neuron, uh, depolarization of the neuron leads into phase zero of the action potential. So basically this is where sodiums move into the cell. To block this, we have to basically block the sodium and the calcium channels. And then we have uh, calcium, yeah. So basically we have two types. We have our partial focal seizures and then we have our generalized seizures. So what's the difference between both of these? With partial, it's confined to a small area of the brain, okay? Only like a, a certain hemisphere of the brain, but these can become generalized, but usually it's only confined to a small area of the brain. Versus generalized, it's diffused brain involvement and it involves usually both hem hemispheres versus partial, it can only involve a focal part of one hemisphere, but with generalized, it involves both hemispheres. Okay. So usually, how do we differentiate from a patient that has a pseudo seizure? So patients that fake seizures, and usually if they do fake seizures, they might have some type of psychiatric um, disorder, like conversion disorder. So how do we differentiate this? Um, usually with prolactin levels. So prolactin levels are going to be elevated in seizures, okay? And then, of course, we can also do an EEG, which is an electroencephalogram. This will also tell you if the patient is having a pseudo seizure or not. And it's also going to help you establish the diagnosis and localize lesion. So let's get into our seizures, guys. So we have, like we discussed, our partial and our generalized. So let me start with our partial focal seizures. So we have our simple partial where the consciousness is basically maintained. So the patient is conscious and the EEG is gonna show focal discharge at the onset of the seizures, okay? So how is the patient going to present? Um, they may be followed by transient neurological deficit, also known as Todd's paralysis, that's lasting up to 24 hours. And that's usually gonna be a, sim uh, a simple seizure. So once again, patient's gonna have a seizure, but they're gonna be conscious. What's gonna be a complex partial seizure. So with these patients, they're going to have uh, their consciousness is going to be impaired. Okay. The EEG will show intraectal spikes with slow waves in the temporal area. Okay. 
with these patients. And these patients are usually going to have auras, which is going to be um, impaired consciousness. And these complex partial procedures can basically last a variable amount of time, but it's usually less than three minutes, and it's followed by a phase of preserved awareness that the patient can later describe. So what are the auras? It's basically a sensory or autonomic motor uh, symptom of which the patient is aware of. And then with complex partial seizures, these patients can also present with auto automatisms uh, like lip smacking, manual picking, patting, coordinated mover, motor movement like walking. So once again, simple, simple versus complex. With simple, the consciousness is going to be maintained. With, part, with complex partial, the consciousness is not going to be maintained. And this patient is usually going to have a, uh, an aura. Okay. And with these patients, basically, the seizure lasts less than three minutes. So we've discussed those. So what about our generalized ones? So let's go into each one of them. So we have our absence, okay? Generalized seizure. These are the ones that are commonly found in your, your children, right? When they're in school and the teacher says that the child just stares into space and they talk to them and the patient doesn't, the child doesn't respond to them. They're just like staring into space and they like snap out of it. This is going to be your absence, petite small seizures with these patients. It's basically a brief lap of consciousness, and the patient is just basically unaware of attack. So the child doesn't know what's going on. So if you have a teacher that's like screaming at the child, and they're like, or even if they're learning, they're taught learning about zebras, and then next thing you know, the teacher has moved on to like giraffes, and the child's like, what? Like they just miss that entire gap, and they don't know what's going on. So they don't know that it's happening. Basically, a child's going to have brief staring episodes. They're going to be having their eyelids that are going to be twitching, and they tend to last between 5 to 10 seconds, okay? These episodes, they can also occur in clusters, and one patient may have even dozens or even hundreds in one, a, what you, in one day, okay? So what you need to know about this one is that they're going to have no post-ictal phase, so, like I said, it's most commonly found in childhood. They tend to go away by the age of 20. And what you need to know about this one is how to treat it and how is the EEG going to look. I had so many questions on this, so make sure you know this. With absence petite mal seizures, you're going to see on your EEG bilateral symmetric 3 hertz spike in wave action. Okay? Usually they'll describe a patient and sometimes they will not give it to you. Sometimes they won't say it's a child. They'll just describe a patient and they said that the EEG showed that there was bilateral symmetric three hertz spike. And that's when you're going to think about, oh, you know what? This is an absence seizure. Okay. So if they don't give you that, it'll be just a child that at home, they're not paying attention or they're just staring off into space and the mother's, wor the mother's worried or the teacher has notified the mother. And this is where we want to think about absence, petite, small seizures. And this is the only one that you treat with ethosuximide. That's usually going to be first line. So make sure that you know this. So if you notice, I'm going through these stuff. The things that I stop and I explain and I differentiate or actually focus more because as you notice, when I'm going through these, some of the, these topics I'll just go through, I won't stop to discuss it. And it's because I didn't see it on the exam. But if I stop and I discuss it, like this one, it's because I had a question on it. And I had several questions, whether it was on the EORs I took, whether it was for pediatrics, I don't remember which ones, or for my practice questions, it's because I had a question on it. So make sure that you know these topics because you'll see patterns whenever you're studying and you're doing practice questions, which are the topics that are commonly asked. And this is one of them, your absence seizures. You are definitely going to get a question on this one. So make sure you know how it presents, okay? So once again, absence seizures, it's usually going to be a small child. They're in school. They will usually just stare off into space. They won't bleak, just staring off into space, okay? And this is a petite small or a absence seizure. They are not going to have any post-ictal phase, okay? The patient is usually unaware of their attacks. They don't know what's happening. And then the EEG is going to show bilateral symmetric 3 hertz spike. And the treatment is going to be what? Ethosuximide. Ethosuximide for absence petite small seizures. Okay. All right. So we've done that one. Now let's go into our second generalized seizure. Tonic-clonic, also known as grand mal seizure. 
So it's called tonic-clonic because you have a tonic phase and then you have a clonic phase. Okay? With these patients in the tonic phase, you're going to have loss of consciousness, you're going to have rigidity, and then sudden arrest of respiration. And this tends to last less than, 30, than 60 seconds, and then they're going into their clonic phase. Okay. The clonic phase is basically the repetitive rhythmic jerking that lasts less than two to three minutes, and then they're going to go to their post-ictal phase. The post-ictal phase with these patients are going to have flaccid coma or sleep. The duration can usually uh, differentiate. And basically, they're going to have depressed neurological function following a seizure. And usually when they uh, wake up, they're going to gradually wake up and get their energy back. And it's common to have confusion or and, and or agitation after a tonic-clonic phase. So once again, with these patients, they're going to have lots of consciousness. Consciousness, they're going to be very rigid. And then they're going to go into their clonic phase, which is going to be the repetitive rhythmic jerking, jerking, which is going to last less than two to three minutes. This is going to be your tonic clonic. That's why it's called tonic clonic or grand mal seizure. With these patients, sometimes they're going to be, uh, they might be biting their tongue. They might have incontinence, so they might just um, defecate themselves or go to the restroom. They might also have aspiration. And usually with these patients, they'll have auras that's going to let them know that they're going to have a seizure. And on EEG, you're going to see generalized high amplitude rapid shaking, and it'll be normal between seizures. And what's going to be the treatment for this? We're going to give them our anti-seizure medications, right? Usually valproic acid is the first one that I keep seeing on my exam. So valproic acid, you can also give them something like phenytoin, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, but make sure that you know valproic acid. And that's usually first line. Yeah, it's usually first line for your, your tonic-clonic seizures. So next one's going to be our myoclonus seizures. With this one, what happens is that they have sudden, brief, sporadic, involuntary twitching, but they don't lose consciousness. So no loss of consciousness with these patients. And it may be associated with a post-ictal phase where the patient might have simple motor seizure in their left arm, followed by uh, post-ictal weakness in their left upper extremity. And I actually, for those of you who are fans of Dr. House, there's an episode of a patient who has a myoclonus. Basically, they just had like this knee jerking. And then that's when the, the Dr. House went and asked the patient if they had a history of seizures or anything like that. So I thought that was interesting. So you can connect that. Um, like I said, usually they'll have a sudden brief sporadic involuntary twitching. They won't have any loss of consciousness. And they can have a simple motor seizure in the left arm. And that's what happened with this patient like, he just had like a little seizure of his leg and he didn't even know he was doing it. So it tends to involve usually one muscle. It can involve uh, several groups of muscles and then treatment for these patients. Once again, it's going to be what? Well, proc acid or you can give them clonazepam. So what about our generalized seizures, um, like atonic seizures? With these patients, it's basically a drop attack. They just fall and then they lose postural tone. So atonic, just fall. That's all it is versus our status, our status epileptic, epile, epilepticus, I'm sorry, as you can tell, I keep having trouble saying this one. So status epilepticus, with these patients, are gonna have repeated generalized seizures without recovery for more than 30 minutes. Now, what I wanna say before I start getting comments with these is that this is according to the textbook that I'm reading. I know I've read several textbooks that they differentiate, but according to this one, it's basically a patient that's gonna have a generalized seizure and they're not going to recover, okay? They're not going to be recovering at all with these patients, and it's going to be lasting for a long time. But according to the textbook, repeated generalized seizures without recovery for more than 30 minutes. So as you notice, we were discussing these seizures. They tend to last less than five minutes. They don't last more than five minutes. With this one, they're and then they tend to last less than five minutes, and then they're fine, okay? They recover. With this one, it's repeated, and they don't have any recovery for more than 30 minutes with these patients. The treatment for these patients is going to be your uh, benzodiazepines, like you can give a lorazepam or diazepam, also phenotoin or phenobarbital. Okay. The thing about these patients that you want to have, you'll have a question on, is that you're going to place them in the left lateral decubitus position. We want to make sure that we place them from away from any type of harmful object. Okay. 
you are going to have a question on this. It'll usually say there was a medical student and they had a patient that was having a seizure all of a sudden and the seizure won't stop and then the medical student doesn't know what to do. Place the patient in left lateral decubitus position. Okay. All right, guys. So now that we've discussed that, why don't we go into shock, okay? Shock is going to be our next one. What is shock? Basically, shock is when there's an underperfusion of tissues. How's the patient going to present? They're going to present with shock-like symptoms. They're going to be what? Hypotensive with these patients. They're going to be tachycardic. Though You're going to see that they're, the organs are going to be shutting down. So you'll see lactic acidosis. Uh, the patient's not going to be pres uh, making any urine. It starts involving the kidney. So they'll be oliguric and annular anuric they're going to be presenting with ultra mental status so what do you want to do with these patients we first want to make sure that we stabilize these patients and we want to make sure that we determine the cause so we want to make sure that we look at the cause whatever is causing the shock we want to give them fluid bolus like um, 500 to 1000 liters of normal saline or lactated ringers we want to get a cbc a cmp a creatinine lever level look at their pt and ptt so look at their bleeding times right you want to do an EKG and a chest x-ray. You want to put also an oximetry meter in them so to measure how much they're breathing and if they're breathing well. And then, of course, we want to do the ABC assessment, right? Look at their airway, um, their breathing, their circulation. So with this one, what you need to know is you need to know the differences of shock, okay? So we have cardiogenic, hypovolemic, neurogenic, and then we have our septic shock. So... Make sure you know the difference between them. So why don't we go into each one? So with cardiogenic, this is what happens when the heart isn't able to generate enough cardiac output to maintain tissue perfusion. So it's not pumping out enough blood for the rest of the tissues. Usually the most common cause for this one is gonna be anything of course cardiac related, but the most common cause is gonna be if the patient just had a myocardial infarction, and then of course your cardiac tamponade. Usually with these patients, they're going to be presenting with, with wet hypotension, so their systolic blood pressure is going to be less than 90. They're going to have jugular venous distension. Their urine output is going to be less than 20. They're going to have pale skin, hypotension, and tachycardia. So with these patients, we're going to do an EKG. We'll see that they have ST elevation. Um, we also want to make sure that we do an echocardiogram to make sure we rule out something like cardiac tamponade, right? Or if they have any type of like valvular defect. And then of course, we're gonna do our ABCs first, which is our airway, breathing, circulation. And then we wanna make sure that we identify whatever is causing the cardiogenic shock. So if it's a cardiac tamponade, we wanna make sure and do pericardiosynthesis, okay? And then we wanna give them vasopressors. So we wanna give them dopamine starting, and then we can add something like dobutamine we also want to make sure that we give them nitroglycerin and then IV fluids also in these patients. So what is hypovolemic? Hypovolemic is basically where they have decreased blood flow or circuitary blood volume, which causes decreased preload and cardiac output. Usually this is due to a patient that's losing a lot of blood. So whether they had some type of trauma, like they were shot, um, someone stuck a knife into them, if they have some type of GI bleed, usually with these patients, that's gonna be usually um, hemorrhagic causes, and then we have our non-hemorrhagic causes of so the patient's vomiting, if they're severely dehydrated, okay, if they have diarrhea. Burns is a huge one for a non-hemorrhagic cause. So for hypovolemia, we wanna think about two, whether it's a hemorrhagic one like we discussed or a non-hemorrhagic where the patient's just dehydrated, okay? If the patient has a burn, burn is actually the most common ones for our non-hemorrhagic one. So with these patients, what we want to do is that we want to do a central venous line or pulmonary artery catheter for these patients, and then we're going to intubate them, mechanically ventilate them, okay? And then if the patient's like bleeding, then we want to make sure that we address the bleed. And then we want to make sure that we give them IV fluids. And then neurogenic. So this is usually due to the nervous system. It's a failure of the sympathetic nervous system to maintain vascular tone. This is usually due to like some type of head injury. 
if they had an injury to the spine, if they overdose on certain drugs. And usually with these patients, they're going to be presenting with hypotension, bradycardia. They'll have peripherally vasodilated um, extremities, uh, warm extremities, and good capillary refill with these patients. Okay. So what do you want to do with these patients? We want to give them IV fluids. We also want to give them vasoconstrictors to restore that venous tone. Put them in a supine or trendolin bird position also, and then maintain their temperature. And then we have septic, right? This is due to hypotension, which is caused by sepsis. They have persistent um, hypotension, even though these patients, we've already given them IV fluids, they're still hypotensive. And these patients are going to uh, present with multiple organ failure. So some of the causes of septic, right? Meningitis, if the patient has an abscess, like even cellulitis, cholangitis, peritonitis, pneumonia even. So with these patients, they're going to have the signs of SIRS. They're going to have signs of shock. So hypotension, once again, like acidosis. So they'll have fever. Okay. They'll have flushed, warm skin. And then for these patients, what we want to do is that we're going to do cultures, right? We're going to do two cultures, and they both have to be positive. Okay? And then, of course, we want to locate the source of infection, whatever is causing the septic. Remember, you had a patient once come in, um, which is hopefully this... I like to talk about cases because sometimes it helps sediment the whatever we're talking about. So we're talking about septic shock. We had a patient that came in the previous day. They were being seen for urinary tract infection. And usually, I worked in the ER, usually what happens is that during December or during flu time, like we are packed in the ER. It was packed. Sometimes we would put patients in the hallways. And I mean, it was just bad. It was packed. And so... I remember we had a patient come in. She came in, like, I think it was like a Thursday. She came in for urinary tract infection. And during the, sometimes in these times, we have hours wait, not one hour. We have like where the patient waits hours, sometimes like eight hours in the waiting room. And with this patient, she had a urinary tract infection. She didn't have a primary care doctor. And she was waiting and decided not to wait anymore. So she went home. And then the next day, she comes in and his her sister brings her in and I remember her wheeling her in in the wheelchair and I remember the patient from yesterday from that previous day because I had checked the patient in and the the sister was telling me that her sister like didn't wake up that morning and when she tried to wake her up she wasn't really moving like she was just completely out of it and you can see when she was in the chair the patient was pale she was like literally like this like nothing compared to the previous day and so then we brought her back into the ER and then they run a co they ran a code on her and the patient died from septic shock and she they think it was attributed to the urinary tract infection, which is crazy, right? Another case, that's why you have to make sure that you treat these urinary tract infections. Who knows? Maybe she had a UTI and developed into polynephritis and then that was the reason why she she had septic shock. But you have to be careful with these patients. Another case was during my ER rotation, we had a patient with a urinary tract infection. She didn't have insurance. And so she went to Mexico, which is what a lot of the patients here in the Valley of Texas, the Southern Texas, because we're right next to Mexico, we're like right there. It's like 30 minute drive. And of course, if you don't have insurance, it's a lot cheaper to go to Mexico and get treated and get medications than here in the US. So we have a lot of patients that go to Mexico and they seek treatment. My parents do the same thing. <laughs> and so we had a patient that had a urinary tract infection she went to Mexico. She got treated for the, the, the urinary tract infection, but somehow they gave her incorrect antibiotic that doesn't even treat the strain that she had, the strain of bacteria. Because remember, we learned that for urinary tract infection, the most common bacteria is going to be E. coli. But there's other bacteria that can cause urinary tract infections, not only E. coli. So they had treated her for the incorrect bacteria. So the patient comes back. She's being seen in the ER because she developed fever. She was like pale. Well, anyways, when she came into us, she was like going into septic shock. And we were trying like to give her these antibiotics. And the doctor needed to be careful on which type of antibiotic to give her because she had just been on an antibiotic regimen. And so it was really hard to treat these patients. So basically what I'm trying to say is that these patients can go into septic shock very, very quickly. So I just remember that patient, like I said, the one that died. She was perfectly fine the previous day, and then she showed up with septic shock, and then she passed away the following day. She was young. She was like 22, 22 or 23. So 
Yes. So usually the treatment for this, uh, for septic shock, of course, is going to be IV antibiotics, right? Broad spectrum at max doses. And then we want to make sure that we give them IV, IV fluids to increase the blood pressure. So that was septic shock. Next one's going to be thyroid storm. This is a thyroid emergency with a very high mortality rate. I was talking to my, because I'm currently in my family medicine rotation. Due to COVID-19, we already took all of it. All of, all of our end of rotation exams. And so now we're just finishing the rotation so we can graduate. So I'm currently in my family medicine rotation. It's only a two week rotation because they want us to get grad graduate soon and before um, our time. So I graduated in December. So my family doctor, he was saying that he's, he's never seen a thyroid storm ever. So he said it, it's very rare, but just for a case of the exam, you'll see a thyroid storm a lot on your exam. So make sure that you're familiar with it. Because if the patient does go into a thyroid storm, they have a very high likelihood that the patient's going to die. So make sure you know how to treat them. So usually what happens with a thyroid storm is usually a patient that has hyperthyroidism. And usually the patient does not is not taking their medications for the hyperthyroidism. Or sometimes the patient just doesn't know that they have hyperthyroidism. Or sometimes certain things can cause the, a hyperthyroid patient to go into a thyroid storm. So precipitating events like if the patient had surgery, if they had a really bad infection, okay? If they took medications like amiodarone even or contrast day, or even if the patient is pregnant. And like I said, this one's very, very rare. Even the textbook says it, it's rare and it only occurs about 1% to 2% of patients with hyperthyroid. My doctor, he's been practicing since like the 19... 80s and he said that he's never seen a case of hyperthyroidism so that's how it tells you how rare it is so how is the patient going to present if they have hyperthyroidism so basically they're going to be presenting with tachycardia they'll have heart failure symptoms hypotension they'll have atrial fibrillation also they'll also have hyperpyrexia so basically they're presenting with a fever a very high fever 100 greater than 104 degrees fahrenheit They'll be agitated, they'll be having psychosis, they'll have stupor and coma. How are we gonna diagnose this? Usually it's a clinical diagnosis, but you're gonna do a TSH level. That's usually what we do for all our patients that are hyper or hypothyroid, right? And usually the TSH is level so um, low, it's immeasurable. And then of course, we're gonna do a T4 level. It's gonna be extremely, extremely high. So usually the classic presentation for a thyroid storm, it's going to be hyperthyroidism plus fever, tachycardia, and ultramental status. Okay, that's going to tell you that the patient is in a thyroid storm. And usually the treatment for this is going to be, of course, we want to rule out any infections. We want to do our emergency measures like our ABCs, like our airway breathing circulation. And we want to give them beta blockers. So we want to give them beta blockers like propanolol. We want to give them PTU. Okay, for these patients, and then also corticosteroids for these patients. Okay, so it's usually how I memorize it is our, our three P's: uh, PTU, prednisone, and then we have our propanolol because we want to make sure that we're taking care of that cardiac arrhythmia, arrhythmia that the patient can die from, like AFib. Okay, usually these patients are placed in ICU. And usually the corticosteroids are giving what via IV. And we want to make sure that we avoid aspirin, okay, in these patients because even though these patients, like I said, are going to be having a very high fever, we want to make sure that we avoid aspirin. Why? Because aspirin is going to increase the level of the free thyroid hormones, okay? So it's going to increase T3 and T4 release, which will worsen the condition. So that's why we want to make sure that we avoid aspirin okay and then of course we want to put cool in blankets but what you need to know is that these patients we're going to place them on our three p's which are going to be propanolol or ptu and then of course finally our um, prednisone like a, a, a steroid and it's going to be usually a high dose iv steroid for these patients okay all right guys so we are done with critical care and then our next topic is going to be immunology and hematology so we'll, we'll get into that let's start with our leukemias especially our acute leukemias okay so we have two types of leukemias we have acute leukemias you have our acute lymphoblastic leukemia also known as ALL 
and we have our acute myeloid leukemia, also known as AML. So ALL is basically the most common type of cancer in children. So definitely for your pediatric COR, you're going to have a question on this one since this is the most common type of cancer in children. So AL tends to affect boys more frequently than girls, and then, and usually the average age of onset is between two to five years old for ALL. So basically, what you want to know is that with leukemias in general, is that leukemias are diseases characterized by unrestricted growth of leukocytes and leukocyte precursors in the tissues. It can either be acute or chronic, and some of the risk factors are family history, okay? If they had exposure to ionizing radiation, which is something you have to know. I had a question on this one. So if they had an exposure to ionizing radiation or certain alkaline agents, and then incidence tends to increase with age. Once again, ALL is more common in children, okay? ALL is the most common malignancy in children, especially if they're less than 15 years old. And we said it's most, usually the average is between, age onset is between two to five years of age, and it's more common in boys than girls, okay? Versus AML, AML is a disease of adulthood, and it tends to start at a median onset of age 60. So, how's the patient going to present with ALL. So these patients are going to be presenting with bone pain. They'll have lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and central nervous system involvement. So usually with ALL, it'll be a child who is bleeding a lot. They're very prone to getting infections. They'll have lymphadenopathy, fever. He said bone pain. And why bone pain? The bone pain is because there's lymphoblasts in the bone marrow, okay, or peripheral blood. They'll also be complaining of gingival bleeding, epistaxis, menorrhagia. Also, they're more prone, like I said, to getting infections like uh, cellulitis, pneumonia, and it's usually infections that are caused by gram-negative bacteria or fungi, okay? But in general, for the, your acute leukemias, in general, both kids and the adults are going to be presenting with fatigue, abrupt onset of fever, lethargy, headache, and bone pain. But for ALL, the bone pain usually is going to be in your sternum, your tibia, and femur. They're going to have symptoms of anemia, okay? So these patients are going to have thrombocytopenia, gingival hyperplasia, rashes, or cranial nerve palsies. They're going to have lymphadenopathy, like I said, and hepatosplenomegaly. And this is actually more commonly found in ALL than AML. And usually the hallmark is going to be pancytopenia with circulating blasts for these patients. And how are you going to diagnose them? Usually a bone marrow biopsy is going to help you confirm the diagnosis. And in ALL, usually there's going to be a mediastinal mass that can be seen on chest x-ray. Another thing that you need to know is that terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase is present in about 90 for percent, 95% of all cases of ALL. Okay? So make sure that you know that. What about for AML? So on AML, what you're going to see is going to be rod-shaped structures that are also known as our rods. That's usually pathognomonic for AML. So once again, AML is going to be what? It's usually a leukemia that's found in older men. It's usually going to be patients that are greater than <clears throat> 60 or 65. Okay. With these patients on your labs, you're going to see our rods. So if you're reading a question stem, the patients are presenting with your common symptoms of like fever, um, central nervous system signs, and then it says that they have hour rods, then you wanna think about AML, especially if the patient's gonna be older or older than 60, versus if it's a child less than uh, 15 years old, they're about like three, we said three or five years old, and these patients are complaining of bone pain, they're more prone to bleeding, they have usually pancytopenia, then we want to think about ALL, okay? Because we said ALL is the most common leukemia found in children. So once again, with AML, <clears throat> we want to discuss AML real quick. 
So AML is going to be a malignancy involving the myeloid line of precursor cells. That's why it's called acute myelogenous leukemia versus acute lymphoblastic leukemia, also known as the ALL, the one found in children. This is basically due to clonal proliferation of neoplastic immature lymphoid cells. AML involves the myeloid lines of precursor cells, okay? Usually the majority of the, what you're gonna see is that there's gonna be more than 20% blasts in bone marrow for AML. And once again, what did we say? There's gonna be our rods, okay? Our rods, our rods. And it typically affects what? Adults that are eight, greater than 60 or 65, depending on what textbook you're reading. And these patients are gonna be presenting with leukostasis, central nervous system, central nervous system symptoms, and also they're gonna be presenting with uh, DIC also. Okay, so what's going to be the treatment for these patients? Usually it's going to be chemotherapy for your acute leukemias, a chemotherapy, so induction plus consolidation therapy. So in general, with your leukemias, they're going to have symptoms of weight loss, fever, frequent infections, like we said. It's going to involve sometimes the lungs, so the patient might be presenting with trouble breathing. They'll have weakness, they'll have pain or pain in the joints or bones. They'll have fatigue, loss of appetite, the lymph nodes are gonna be swollen. They're gonna have an enlarged spleen or liver, and they're gonna have night sweats, easy bruising, bleeding, purplish patches or spots also. So once again, remember we said with ALL, it's more commonly found in children versus AML, it's more commonly found in older adults, greater than 65, okay? With AML, it's gonna be usually found in a patient that's gonna be greater than the age of 65, right? And it's gonna be our rods. Children, it's usually gonna be found less than 15. So make sure that you know that, guys, okay? You're definitely gonna have a question. If you know the patient population and how it presents on your exam, then you can differentiate between its ALL or AML. And these are gonna be acute, acute right? So they're gonna have more blasts, more babies more baby cells, okay? So it's usually gonna be lymphoblasts that are gonna be involved because these are gonna be babies. So it's gonna be the leukocytes and leukocyte precursors for these patients. Okay, so now we're gonna go into chronic leukemia. So we have our CLL, which is our chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and then we have our CML, which is our chronic myel myelogenous leukemia. Basically, the, uh, let's go into each one. So CML is a myeloproliferative disorder. It's present in young to middle-aged adults. And there's three phases. You have your chronic, accelerated, and your acute phase. The acute phase is where you have a blast crisis, where more than 30% blasts are in the blood or bone marrow. With CML, the patient's going to be presenting with fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, low-grade fever, and excessive sweating. They might also have splenomegaly on exam. And usually the hallmark for CML is that they're gonna have leukocytosis with a medium white blood cell count of 150,000 and they're gonna have a Philadelphia chromosome, okay? Philadelphia chromosome is pathognomonic for your CML, okay? How I memorized it was CU in Philly, okay? Philadelphia chromosome, CML, CU in Philly. That's how I memorized CML. And what you need to know about CML also is that usually what happens is that there's a BCR ABL gene that has been replaced, okay? So that's why you wanna look for the Philadelphia chromosome to establish the diagnosis. Usually the uh, treatment for these patients is going to be, you can give them a metineb mesylate, okay? And then of course, allogenic bone marrow transplant is usually gonna be the initial uh, therapy and it's the only treatment to be proven to be curative. So once again, we said ALL was found in what? It's found in children, okay? And then we said AML is what? It's found in older people greater than 60 or 65 and it's going to be presenting with our rods versus CML. It's a chronic type of lymphocytic leukemia. With these patients, you're going to have Philadelphia chromosome, right? So see you in Philly. What is a Philadelphia chromosome? Basically a translocation of uh, chromosomes 9 and 22. 
922, okay? So let's go into CLL, so also known as uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's basically due to a clonal malignancy of B lymphocytes. It's more common in men than women. And with CLL, with these patients, it's usually often harmless, but it's resistant to cure, okay? There's usually seen uh, peripheral lymphocytosis and lymphocytic invasion of the bone marrow, liver, spleen, and lymph nodes. These patients are going to be presenting with what? Recurrent infections, splenomegaly, and lymphadenopathy also. Usually the hallmark is that you're going to see isolated lymphocytosis with the leukocytosis of greater than 20,000 cells. And then you're going to see increased mature small lymphocytes. And then smudge cells are what's going to be pathognomonic for these patients. They're also going to be presenting with anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia. Once again, CLL, smudge cells, and usually palliative care is usually the, the treatment for these patients. So CLL, what is it? It's a clonal malignancy of B lymphocytes. It's the patient's going to be presenting with lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and it affects adults greater than 65 years of age for CLL. Treatment's gonna be palliative care once the disease is Diagnosis it's usually advanced for these patients. And smudge cells are pathognomonic, okay? Once again, CML, we said, what is, what are you going to see? You're going to see the Philadelphia chromosome, right? See you in Philly. That's usually due to translocation of chromosomes 9 and 22. So once again, CML, see you in Philly, right? ALL is more commonly found in children, usually if they're less than 15, between the ages of 3 to 7 years old. And then we said AML is going to be what? We're going to have our hour rides, usually found in older patients. So if the patient's going to be older than 60 or 65 years old, so AML, hour rides. We said for CML, it was what? The Philadelphia chromosome. We said for CLL, it's what? It's smudge cells, and it's also found in older patients if they're greater than 65 years of age. Okay. All right. So now that we're done with that, we're going to go into our clotting disorders. Okay. So let's go into von Willebrand disease. Von Willebrand is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. Okay. Once again, von Willebrand disease is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. So usually on the question stem, it'll say that it's someone that's bleeding, right? And it'll say that their family member also suffers from the same thing. So you want to think about von Willebrand's disease. So let's talk about von Willebrand factor real quick. Von Willebrand factor, factor it's basically important in primary hemostasis. What it does is that it binds platelets and then it binds to endothelial components. It forms like an adhesive bridge between the platelets and vascular subendothelial structures, and it contributes to fibrin clot formation. It carries factor eight. Okay. So von Willebrand factor and factor eight together. This is a really cool mid comic. I really, really recommend if you're a visual person to look it up. It's basically um, von Willebrand factor, and it's literally like carrying factor eight. So cute. So another thing you need to know about von Willebrand factor is that it's an autosomal dominant disorder. You're going to get a question on that. It'll tell you, it'll describe von Willebrand factor and then it's asked you, how is it, what is it, how is it, um, is it autosomal recessive, uh, et cetera, ex league recessive. This one's autosomal dominant. Why? Because we said that it is the most common inherited bleeding disorder, okay? So once again... Von Willebrand's disease, autosomal dominant. How is the patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with easy bruising, be presenting with skin bleeding, prolonged bleeding from mucosal surfaces like the GI, and then also they'll have menorrhagia. Okay, and then basically, how are you going to work these patients up? For prolonged bleeding time, there's going to be a prolonged bleeding time with a normal platelet count. So once again, they're going to have a normal platelet count. They'll have a normal PT and INR, and then a normal APTT with these patients, but they're going to have a prolonged bleeding time, okay? They're going to also have a decreased plasma von Willebrand fractor with these patients. So like you notice, these patients are going to have what? A normal PT and INR, which is usually 
sometimes not normal for the other bleeding factor, for the other bleeding disorders we're going to talk about. So these patients with von Willebrand, they're going to have a normal PT and INR, normal APTT, and they're going to have a normal platelet count, okay? How are you going to treat these patients? Basically, we're going to give them desmopressin, okay, DDAVP. So desmopressin, we want to make sure that we avoid aspirin and NSAIDs with these patients because it's going to what exacerbate the platelet tendency. So once again, with these patients, we're going to treat them with desmopressin, okay? So just to recap, von Willebrand's disease, it's the most common inherited bleeding disorder. It's usually going to be what? Autosomal dominant in these patients, okay? These patients are going to be presenting with easy bruising, skin bleeding, prolonged bleeding from mucosal surfaces. They're going to have normal platelet counts, but they're going to have a prolonged bleeding time. They're going to have a normal PT and INOM, and then a normal APTT also. Treatment's going to be with desmopressin. Okay, guys, so let's go into our hemophilia. So we have hemophilia A and hemophilia B, okay? So these are both X-linked recessive. So make sure that you know this, X-linked recessive. So hemophilia A and B, X-linked recessive. And then you need to know to differentiate between A and B is basically what factor is involved because they're both going to present very similar in how the patient is. And like we said, we both it's X-linked recessive. So we have to know what factor is involved. So let's start with hemophilia A. Hemophilia A is X-linked recessive, and it's due to decreased synthesis of which factor? Factor 8, okay? And once again, hemophilia A, X-linked recessive, factor 8 is involved, and it tends to affect males primarily. So it's more commonly found in males. How's the patient going to present? So the most common we're going to see is hemarthrosis, Okay. You see hemarthrosis in a question stem, you're going to think about hemophilia. Basically, what hemarthrosis is, is that the patient has painful swelling around a joint. Okay, it's going to be usually the knees. The knees are the most commonly involved if it's an adult. And if it's a child, the ankle is just most commonly involved. And it's going to be painful swelling around these joints. Okay, these patients can also present with intracranial bleeding. This is actually the second most common cause of death. Any type of head trauma for them is life-threatening, okay? So another thing about these patients is that they can have hemato hematuria or hemospermia also, which makes sense, right, because they are missing this factor. They're missing factor eight, so that's why they're more prolonged. They have more higher frequency of bleeding. So once again, with hemophilia, the common symptom you're going to see is hemarthrosis, okay? Hemarthrosis. Arthrosis, painful swelling around a joint. The knee is the most common site involved in adults, and the ankle is the most common site involved in children. So, how are we going to work these patients up? Basically, what you're going to see on their lab work is that these patients are going to have a prolonged PTT. So, remember our PTT and then our PT. PTT is going to be our what extrinsic or intrinsic. How I memorize it is playing table tennis inside, right? Playing table tennis inside. So PTT is going to be intrinsic versus PT is going to be extrinsic. How I memorize it is playing tennis outside. So that's how I memorize it. PTT, playing table tennis inside. So it's going to be intrinsic pathway. PT, playing tennis outside. It's going to be extrinsic. So factor eight is involved with the intrinsic pathway, which makes sense of why they're going to have a prolonged PTT. Versus von Willebrand's factor, just the factor that carries the factor 8, I'm sorry, von Willebrand is going to be what carries factor 8, okay? And von Willebrand's disease, von Willebrand is missing. So that's why in these patients, they're going to have a normal PT and then a normal PTT and then a normal platelet count, but they're going to have increased bleeding time. Versus hemophilia A, these patients are going to have prolonged PT because they're missing that factor. They're, they're missing factor 8 in hemophilia A. So they're going to have prolonged PTT and then a normal PT, okay? And then they're going to have low factor 8 coagulant level and then normal fact levels of von Willebrand factor, right? Versus von Willebrand factor, they're going to have what? They're going to have decreased factor, decreased uh, plasma von Willebrand factor, And in hemophilia A, they're going to have normal levels of von Willebrand factor. 
So if we have a patient that we suspect that has hemophilia and they had some type of head trauma, we want to make sure that we do a CT scan for them because they can have um, intracranial hemorrhage. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? It's usually going to be with recombinant factor 8, okay? You can also give them desmopressin, but it's usually going to be with recombinant factor 8 or desmopressin. And then once again, what do we avoid in these patients if they have this hemarthrosis that is that they're complaining of? We want to make sure that we avoid aspirin or NSAIDs because it's going to make them more prone to bleeding. So with these patients, all we can do is just immobilize the joint, apply ice packs, and that's it. We can't give them NSAIDs or aspirin. So hemophilia B is going to be the next one. This is usually caused by a deficiency of factor 9. It's also known as Christmas, Christmas factor. So once again, hemophilia is what? It's X-linked recessive. It's going to present with what? Hemorthrosis. That's the most common one, most common in males. So hemophilia A was due to factor 8. Hemophilia B is due to factor 9, okay? Factor 9. So how is the patient going to present? It's going to be the similar to your hemophilia A with hemarthrosis. So that's why you, in order to differentiate these two since they present similar, is that you have to know which factor is missing. So factor A is hemophilia A. Factor 9 is going to be hemophilia B, okay? How are you going to treat this patient? You're going to treat them with recombinant factor 9, okay? All right, so now let's go into DIC, also known as disseminated intravascular coagulation. So DIC, it's characterized by abnormal activation of the coagulation sequence that forms microthrombi throughout the microcirculation. What causes, what happens after you've activated this coagulation sequence and it starts clotting everywhere, it's going to cause consumption of all the platelets, the fibrin, and the coagulation factors, okay? So then bleeding and thrombosis is going to occur at the same time. Some of the causes for this is usually infections like uh, your gram-negative uh, bacteria. Also, if the patient's septic, it's very common also in OB-GYN complications, okay? Also, if they had trauma, if they had burns, if they had fractures, if they have any type of malignancy also, uh, if they're in shock, and also snake venom can be some of the causes of DIC. How is the patient going to present? Basically, they're going to be presenting with a bleeding tendency. So they might have like superficial hemorrhages. They're going to be bleeding from a GI tract, the urinary tract, the oral mucosa or the gingiva. Also, they're going to be oozing from any procedure sites or also any incisions. They're also going to be presenting with thrombosis, okay? They're going to have mental status changes. They'll have oliguria where they're producing very, very minimal urine. They'll have renal cortical necrosis. Okay? And what are you going to see on the labs for these patients? What you're going to see is that they're going to have PT, PTT, bleeding time, and T, um, PT, PTT, and bleeding time are all going to be increased, okay? So all of this is going to be increased, which makes sense because they're bleeding out. They're getting rid of all their factors, okay? So PT, we said what? Playing tennis outside. That's going to be the extrinsic pathway. PTT is playing table, table tennis inside. So that's going to be what? Your intrinsic pathway. And then their bleeding time is going to be increased. Also, their D-dimer is going to be increase. The only thing that's going to be decreased is their fibrinogen level, okay? And then also their platelet count. But just to make sure that you know that their D-dimer is going to be increased, their PT, PTT, and bleeding time are also going to be increased for these patients. You can also see schistocytes if you do a peripheral smear for these patients, and that's because there's damage of the red blood cells, okay, as they're going through the circulation. So how are you going to treat these patients? You want to make sure that you manage whatever is causing the DIC, but it's usually going to be supportive measures, especially if the patient is like severely bleeding. So you're going to give them fresh frozen plasma to make sure that you replete all these clotting factors. You're going to do platelet transfusions. You can also give them low doses of heparin IV to stop the clotting and to prevent consumption of all the clotting factors since these patients are clotting and they're bleeding at the same time. You're going to give them, of course, IV fluids, and you can also give them cryoprecipitate. Uh, but usually on the question stem, 
what I see is going to be fresh frozen plasma for DIC. Okay guys, so now that we're done with that, why don't we go into G6 PD deficiency? You are definitely gonna have a question on this one. So make sure that you are familiar with G6 PD deficiency. So the G6 PD deficiency is an X-linked recessive disorder that is characterized by red blood cell hemolysis after exposure to oxidative drugs, faba beans, or infection. So once again, this is going to be what? It's X-linked disorder. It's more commonly found in men. And hemolysis occurs with infection, like we said, and then certain medications. So what are those medications that you need to know? Are going to be your sulfonamides, macrobid, primaquin, dimercable, dimercable, also your faba beans, okay, uh, nitroferontone, dapsone also. So if these patients have a history of taking these medications, then you want to think about G6PD, okay? So the most common ones I saw was like sulfonamide. So like they were given Bactrim for a urinary tract infection and now they're presenting with the symptoms of G6PD deficiency. So what are the symptoms of G6PD deficiency? It's an episodic hemolytic anemia that is usually drug-induced. They have dark urine and jaundice. So it's a type of hemolytic anemia, okay? So what are you going to see on your peripheral blood smeal? You're going to see these bite cells, okay? You're going to see these bite cells, which is basically red blood cells that were caused after the removal of Heinz bodies that look like literally like something has taken a bite out of them, okay? And usually the bin areas are because um, they were phagocytized, um, phagocytized of Heinz body by uh, macrophages. So they were phagocytized by macrophages. That's why they have these bite cells. You're also going to see Heinz bodies also. And there's going to be a deficiency in G6PD on SA. Usually the measuring the G6PD level is what's going to give you the diagnosis with these patients. But what you need to know is that you're going to see bite cells and Heinz bodies with these patients. Treatment is basically avoiding whatever caused the hemolysis. So if it was fava beans, if it was a Bactrim that we're taking, make sure that you get rid of the Bactrim, maintain hydration, okay? And then if it's extremely severe where they're very, very anemic, then you can do red blood cell transfusion when necessary. Okay, guys, so let's go into our... So what type of anemia did we say G6PD is? G6PD deficiency is going to be your anemia a hemolytic anemia, okay? We said it's going to be X-linked recessive. It's more commonly found in men, and usually it's a hemolytic anemia that happens with certain infections, and also with the patients taking certain medications like sulfonamides, macrobid, primaquin, dimercipal, those faba beans, okay? You're gonna be presenting with episodic hemolytic anemia, dark urine and jaundice. You're gonna see bite cells and Heinz bodies, and usually the treatment's gonna be whatever is the removal that was causing the hemolysis, and then make sure that the patient remains hydrated, okay? So real quick about anemias. So we have different types of anemias. We have our microcytic anemias, and then we have our um, normocytic anemias, and then we have our macrocytic anemia. So microcytic anemia is just going to be anything that is that involves the MCV being less than 80, or basically the normal mean corpuscular volume, which also means the mean cell volume being less than 80, that's going to be microcytic anemias because 80 to 100 is normal, right? So if it's less than 80 on your MCV and you're reading the question stem, you want to think about microcytic anemia. The most common one's going to be what? Iron deficiency anemia. And then we have 80 to 100, which is going to be our normocytic anemia. And then we have greater than 100 MCV, which is going to be your macrocytic anemia. The most common ones being vitamin B12 deficiency and folate deficiency. How I think about it is that with both micro and macro, there is a problem with production versus your normocytic, there is a problem with destruction. So in the anemia that we're just discussing right now that involves G6PD, it's going to fall with the normal cytic anemia, right? It's a hemolytic anemia. It's a problem with destruction, okay? All right, so now that we have that, why don't we go into our hypercoagulable states, okay? So our hypercoagulable states, the most common one you're going to see is going to be factor V laden. Usually I'll see them in a question stem where a patient has a his, has a is presenting with a DVT or a pulmonary embolism, and it tells you what was the culprit or my, what might have been the cause. And you have to know it's a hypercoagulable state and usually it's factor V leading. 
but there's different types of hyperquagulable states. You have factor five latein, protein C or, uh, slash S deficiency, and antithrombin three deficiency. Also, if the patient has any problem with their liver, like cirrhosis, because the liver is responsible for producing vitamin K. Also, if you have uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, which is usually associated with lupus. So let's go into the most common one that you're going to see, which is going to be factor V latin. Basically, what happens is that there's a point mutation where factor V is resistant to proteolysis by protein C, which causes overabundant conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. So once again, it's an over abundant conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, which makes you more hypercoagulable. So this is going to be autosomal dominant. Clinical manifestations, like I said, the patient's more prone to getting uh, DVTs and pulmonary embolism. So if you have a patient that has keeps getting these repeated DVTs, then you want to maybe test them for this hypercoagulable state if they don't know that they have a family history or a past medical history of it already. So some of the complications of factor V uh, laden is that the patient, of course, is not able to have children. If they do, they'll have preeclampsia, they'll have stillbirths, um, placental abruption with these patients. How do you want to work them up? You want to do a DNA test, and you can also do an APC resistance assay. And treatment's usually going to be anticoagulation to make sure that the patient isn't getting these recurrent, you know, venal thromboembolisms, right? These DVTs. Okay, so we did the hypercoagulable state, so let's go back to our anemia. So basically, the one that you need to know uh, is going to be iron deficiency anemia for this exam. So we discussed already the different types of anemia. So iron deficiency falls under what? It's a microcytic anemia. So your MCV is going to be less than 80, and it's due to a problem with production, right? So... Defe iron deficiency anemia is the most common cause of anemia worldwide. What are some of the causes of this? It's because usually um, in women, the most common cause, it's going to be your menstrual blood loss. Okay, so the patient's losing too much blood during their menstruations. Also GI blood loss. Okay, this is most commonly seen in adults, of course. And then if it's a child, then you want to think that maybe they're just not getting enough iron in their diet. So how is the patient going to present? They're going to be pale. They're going to have uh, generalized weakness and fatigue, dyspnea on exertion. They're going to be presenting with headache and tinnitus, palpitations, tachycardia. They'll also have symptoms of pica, where like they like to eat dirt. Um, they'll have glossitis, so that shiny tongue, angular colitis, which is going to be right here on the edges of the mouth. They'll also have cholinicia, jaundice, and splenomegaly. It, so I'm going to tell you guys a quick story. During my pediatric rotation, my doctor would make me go see patients. I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do. But he would make me go see patients. I would go see patients. And he would make me go see all the patients. And then after that, I would go and present them to him. And then he would go in there and agree or disagree with me. And so he would make me see all the patients that we had. Sometimes we had a lot of patients during the day, especially pediatrics. And so I remember we had one patient that I went to go see her. And the mother had told me. Like uh, we did an, an MC, uh, a blood test on the patient, so we did a CBC, and the patient's MCV was like at 76, 75. And so I had looked at it, and then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna tell the doctor. And then the mother was also telling me that the patient's been like eating dirt, dirt, something she never did, and she just started doing. She'll find her daughter outside, like just like eating dirt. And so that was a that was a sign of the patient had iron deficiency anemia. So yeah, they present with pica in children especially. So how are you going to work these patients up? You want to do a CBC. What you're going to see is that the reticulocyte, reticulocyte count is going to be low, but the red uh, blood cell distribution width is going to be high. So your RDW is going to be Hi, that's usually pathognomonic for iron deficiency. Make sure you know that because you're going to have that on your exam. So once again, CBC, reticulocyte count is going to be low and your RDW is going to be what? It's going to be high. RDW is going to be high. You're also going to do iron studies. You're going to see that the serum ferritin is going to be decreased. Okay, less than 15 is diagnostic. Their total iron binding capacity is going to be increased and, and their transferrin level is going to be increased okay 
their total iron binding cap capacity saturation is going to be decreased, and then their serum iron is going to be decreased, which makes sense, right? Serum iron is the total amount of iron that the patient has. It's going to be increased. Serum ferritin is going to be decreased once again. The only thing that's going to be increased is their total iron binding capacity, which is going to be increased, okay? So basically, the total iron binding capacity, it's looking for iron to bind to, and that's why there's so many of them, because there's not enough iron to bind to. That's why it's going to be increased, because everything else is decreased. Another thing you're going to see on your peripheral blood smear is that they're going to have microcytic hypochromic red blood cells. Also, they're going to have poikilocytes, which is going to be pencil or cigar shaped cells. Usually the gold standard for diagnosis for iron deficiency anemia is a bone marrow biopsy, but that's rarely ever done. Okay. Another thing about iron deficiency anemia is if it presents in an older patient, we want to think that it might be related with anything with malignancy, especially like if we, we want to suspect something like a GI bleeding. So in these patients, we want to do a colonoscopy and a white stool test if we see iron deficiency anemia, okay? Once again, iron deficiency anemia is going to be what? It's a microcytic anemia, right? So it's going to be MCV level less than 80. With these patients, they're going to be presenting with basically a reticulocyte count that's going to be low, and then the RDW is going to be high, right? And then when you do the iron studies, the serum ferritin is going to be decreased, their serum iron is going to be decreased, and the only thing that's going to be increased is going to be their total iron binding capacity, which is going to be increased. You're going to see on your peripheral blood smear a microcytic hypochromic red blood cell, and then also poikilocytes, which are these like pencil or cigar shaped cells. What's going to be the treatment? It's usually going to be iron replacement. Okay, it's going to be oral. That's probably like the best way to give it, and you're going to give it three times a day. So ferrous sulfate three times a day. Okay, usually oral. What you want to tell the patient is that they can take it with vitamin C. It's going to help them absorb the, air, the iron so they can take it with orange juice. Okay. All right. So let's go into our lymphomas. We have two types. We have our Hodgkin's lymphoma and then we have our non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay. So let's go into Hodgkin's lymphoma. So Hodgkin's Lymphoma is basically, or lymphomas in general, it's a group of cancer that are characterized by enlargement of the lymphoid tissue, spleen, and liver, okay? With Hodgkin's lymphoma, you're going to see Reed-Sternberg cells, also known as owl cells, this pathognomonic for Hodgkin's lymphoma. So remember how we talked about the leukemias, the way to differentiate it is how they're going to present on your blood work. We said that ALL is commonly found in children. We see, said that AML is going to present with your hour rights, right? We said that CLL is going to be your smudge cells, commonly found in older patients, older than 60. And then CML, CU, and Philly is going to be your Philadelphia chromosome. Well, with Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's going to be your Reed Sternberg cells, also known as your owl eyes. Another thing that you need to know, and I got like some questions on this one, is that Epstein Barr virus tends to be associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is interesting. So usually in these patients, it's going to be found uh, in the ages between 15 to 45. It's rarely found in children less than five years old. And with Hodgkin's lymphoma, it, it tends to arise from a single area and it spreads to the nodes next to it, okay? So it'll spread to the nodes next to it. And with these patients, they're going to be presenting with supraclavicular and painless lymphadenopathy. So supraclavicular, and it's going to be painless lymphadenopathy. They'll have itchiness, fever, night sweats, unintentional weight loss, and then they'll also be complaining of frequent infections. Usually how it's described is that they, if they have B symptoms, that's usually that they have poor prognosis. So B symptoms are basically where they have fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Okay, these patients can also present with hepatosplenomegaly, and then when you do a chest x-ray, you're going to see a mediastinal mass with these patients. So how are you going to diagnose this patient? Basically, you're going to do a CT scan um, of the neck, chest, and also the abdominal and pelvic area, and then also you want to make sure that you do a biopsy of the bone marrow. But basically, what you need for diagnosis is going to be the lymph node biopsy, and you need to see those read Sternberg cells, right, which are those owl eyes on your cells to confirm the diagnosis. What's gonna be the treatment? Usually the treatment for this patient is gonna be combo chemotherapy, 
okay? And if the patient is in stage A, which is where the patient does not have any constitutional symptoms, the constitutional symptoms were the ones that we talked about, the B symptoms, like your fever, night sweats, weight loss, B symptoms are poor prognosis. So if they're in stage A, and that means that they don't have any of these symptoms that I described, then you can do radiation, okay? But usually it's going to be combo chemotherapy once they've gone to the stage B. Once again, Hodgkin lymphoma, okay? It's going to be those reed Sternberg cells. You're going to do a lymph node biopsy, and that's what you need to diagnose these patients, and it's usually continuous. Uh, it tends to spread to the con to the lymph node next to it, so contigu contiguous lymph nodes. So next one's going to be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This one's more severe than Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? With non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there's a malignancy that arises from the lymphocytes, okay? 90% tend to arise from the B lymphocytes, and it's more commonly found in patients with HIV or if they have any type of immunodeficiencies with these patients. And with these patients, it's usually going to be an immunocompromised. When you see the question sum, it'll be a patient with like HIV. And how are they going to present? They're going to be presenting with diffuse or isolated, painless, persistent lymphadenopathy. This is usually the most common presentation. They're also going to have uh, GI symptoms, okay, with these patients. And also with these patients, uh, how are you going to diagnose them? Basically, it's going to be, these patients are going to be presenting with a persistent, unexplained, enlarged, painless lymph node that you're going to biopsy, okay? Usually exc excisional lymph node biopsy is required. We're also going to stage it with a chest x-ray and a CT, okay? And also make sure that we do an HIV serology for these patients. Like I said, so this one's more severe non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in regards in comparison to Hodgkin's lymphoma because this one can spread anywhere versus your Hodgkin's lymphoma, it'll spread to the node right next to it. But this one will usually just spread everywhere. So treatment's going to be based, of course, on the stage of the disease to see how, how much it has spread. If it has only involved a single node, then we want to do radiation. If it's a low grade, then we can do something like rituximab, okay, with or without chemotherapy. And then if it's aggressive low grade, then we're going to do a transplant, allogenic transplant. And if it's high grade or intermediate, then that's when we do chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant for these patients with non-Hodgkin. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is more severe than Hodgkin's lymphoma. And Hodgkin's lymphoma is going to present with what? Your reed Sternberg cells, which are going to be your owl eyes. To diagnose them, you have to do a lymph node biopsy. So let's go into our multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma is a malignant plasma cell pro proliferation and secretion of monoclonal pair proteins. So basically M proteins, okay? It's most commonly found in males, specifically African-Americans, and the males are going to be older in their ages of 60 to 70. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with bone pain. That's usually the most common symptom, and it's usually going to be in the back. It'll be back pain with these patients. Uh, the mnemonic I have is H-R-A-L. Basically, it's going to be H for hypercalcemia. R, they're going to have renal failure symptoms. Uh, they're going to have A, anemia, and then L is going to be lytic bone lesions. So H-R-A-L, hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, and lytic bone lesions in these patients. But usually back pain is going to be the most common one that they're going to be presenting with. So on labs, like I said, you're going to see what? You're going to see hypercalcemia. You're going to see anemia. Specifically anemia, you'll see Rolex formation. This is usually pathognomonic for multiple myeloma, which is basically where they have stacked red blood cells. You're going to see thrombocytopenia. And then on protein electrophoresis, you're going to see monoclonal spikes, so you'll see that M spike, and this is usually confirmatory, okay? And then you're also going to do a urinary protein excretion. This is where you're going to see the bone, Benz-Jones protein, which is diagnostic for these patients. If you do an x-ray, you're going to see lytic lesions in the skull and long bones and just generalized osteoporosis. So once again, the workup, and what you're going to see for these patients, you're going to see Rolex formation, and which is going to be your anemia. You're going to see your M spike on the protein electrophoresis. 
And then you're going to see your Benz Jones protein in the urinary uh, protein excretion. This is usually what's going to be diagnostics. This is very, very high yield. Make sure you know this. Multiply myeloma is usually going to be an older patient complaining of back pain. They're going to have HRAL, which is going to be hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, and lytic bone lesions with these patients. Okay. Treatment for these patients is uh, radiation, and you're also going to do uh, chemotherapy, and then hematopoietic stem cell transplants. What can you give for the hypercalcemia? You can give something like biphosphonates. All right, guys, so now that we've done that, we're going to go into sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia, I can spend like an entire video talking about this, like a 30-minute hour video talking about sickle cell anemia. But I'll just go and say what you need to know in regards to the UR exam. So, so sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is autosomal recessive. Make sure you know that I had a question on this, okay? Sickle cell anemia is autosomal recessive, and it's a hemolytic anemia. So it's a problem with what destruction, we said. Usually what is occurring pathophysiologically is that red blood cells have a hemoglobin S, which sickles under deoxygenated conditions, okay? And what happens with these sickle red blood cells is that they obstruct small vessels, and they can cause ischemia. It's most commonly found in African Americans, and these patients don't really have a good life expectancy. The life expectancy is between 40 to 50 years of age. So how is the patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with jaundice. They'll have gallstones, pigmented gallstones, right? That makes sense because these blood cells are sickling. They're getting destroyed, which makes them more prone to getting these gallstones, not the cholesterol ones, because we said there's different types. It's going to be pigmented ones. These patients also will have um, anemia. They might also present with high output heart failure with these patients. And then aplastic crises are very, very common in these patients. Basically what happens is that they tend to have like this very, very acute pain. And it's usually caused by like a viral infection. The most common virus that's going to cause your aplastic crisis is going to be which one for sickle cell anemia? It's gonna be your parvovirus B19, okay? Make sure that you know this. You're going to have a question on this, okay? So how is this patient going to present with aplastic crisis? They're going to have tenderness, fever, uh, tachycardia. They're going to be very, very anxious also. And then treatment is usually a blood transfusion for these patients. They will usually get better in about 7 to 10 days. So once again, sickle cell anemia, aplastic crisis. It's usually caused by the most common virus that causes it is going to be your parvovirus B19. And what it does is that it reduces the ability of the bone marrow to compensate. Once again, parvovirus B19, aplastic crisis, and sickle cell anemia patients. So with these patients, like I said, they're also going to have high output heart failure. And then this is uh, why some of these patients die from congestive heart failure. Also, these patients can present with um, complications due to vasoocclusion, occlusion, like we discussed earlier. And the most common clinical manifestations are usually going to involve the bone. So they're going to have severe bone pain. They can also have hand foot syndrome, also known as dactylitis, which is uh, sw swelling. It's very painful infarct of the dorsal of the hands and feet. They can also present with acute chest syndrome which is due to sickling within the lung. They're gonna have repeated pulmonary infarctions, which they present with like symptoms that are chest pain, fever, cough, tachypnea, okay? And then another thing is that these patients usually auto-infarct their spleen. So basically that means that their spleen is usually reduced or small, okay? Usually, it's large when they're like they're young, but since they keep having these splenic infarcts, then it's going to completely like I was hearing a podcast the other day and they were saying that by the time that they're adult, they completely infarcted their spleen. So their spleen just doesn't work anymore. And that's because of that sickling of that red blood cell. They also can complain of priapism, okay, which is just basically an erection and this happens from the vasal occlusion. They can also have ophthalmo ophthalmologic complications like uh, renal retinal infarct. So that's why we have to make sure that we do the red reflex in these patients, especially like the little babies, the kids, right? We do the red reflex. And then stroke also is very common in children, especially. Okay. 
So once again, we said these patients will like auto infarct their spleen. So they're more common since they've auto infarcted the spleen. They don't have their spleen anymore. Their spleen is responsible for helping with the immune system. So if you don't have that anymore, it's going to make you more susceptible to infections, especially the your encapsulated bacteria like your Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus pneumonia. So these patients need to be vaccinated against these encapsulated bacteria because the majority of them, like I said, by the time that they're older, they've already auto-infarcted their spleen because of that occlusion. So the artery going to the spleen that was, or the vessel going to the spleen that was giving, feeding the spleen has already, has been auto-infarcted, okay? So that organ's dead. Most of these patients have auto-infarcted their spleen. So that's why they need to be vaccinated against these encapsulated bacteria, like I said. Also, another thing that you need to know about that's very, very highly tested for sickle cell anemia is that if a patient has osteomyelitis, the most common bacteria found for patients that have sickle cell anemia is going to be salmonella. Salmonella is the most common cause of osteomyelitis in patients with sickle cell anemia, okay? So what's going to be the workup for these patients? You're going to do a hemoglobin electrophoresis, okay? This is going to be required for the diagnosis. And this is where you're going to see the hemoglobin S and red cells. Another thing you're going to see is on your smear, you're going to see sickled cells. You're going to see target cells. How will jolly bodies? You're going to see reticulocytosis, which makes sense because you're, all these cells are being hemolyzed. So they're like popping. So you're going to see reticulocytosis, which are going to be baby red blood cells. So they're going to be creating baby red blood cells. You'll see leukocytosis also. Okay. And how are you going to treat these patients? Basically, it's just educating them, okay? Telling them to avoid high altitudes. Um, I had a question about this the other day. It was a child that had sickle cell anemia, and you need to know what's going to be the education you're going to give to this patient. And basically, to tell them to avoid high, high altitudes, to make sure that they're drinking a lot of fluids also, okay? You also want to make sure, like I, I mentioned earlier, you vaccinate against these encapsulated drugs, encapsulated, encapsulated bacteria, since these patients are more prone to getting these infections. So you want to vaccinate them against streptococcus pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitidis. Sometimes they even say to give prophylactic penicillin in children that are younger, like between four months and six years old, since these you know children are prone to getting like strep infections. You can also give them folic acid because they are chronically causing um, hemolysis, right? And then hydroxyurea for sure, which enhances hemoglobin F levels, which interferes with your sickling process, okay? So just make sure it tells you, you read the question and it describes a patient that has sickle cell anemia. Make sure that you read it and you are thinking and at, thinking of what it's asking you. So if it asks you, like I said, like the question that I had earlier, what is the best advice you're gonna give these patients? Tell them to drink fluids, right? Tell them to avoid high altitudes. You're going to vaccinate these patients against these encapsulated bacteria. If needed, you're going to give prophylactic penicillin for children, okay? Folic acid supplementation also. But if it tells you what's the best medical treatment or like pharmacological treatment, then you're going to do hydroxyurea. Why? Because it enhances hemoglobin F levels, okay? And this interferes with the sickling process. So like I said, uh, sickle cell anemia is a lot what you have to know is that it's autosomal recessive hemolytic anemia. It's commonly found in African Americans, okay? With these patients, they present with a lot of symptoms. They're more prone to getting gallstones. They have the hand foot syndrome, okay? Aplastic crisis. It's usually due to what? The most common virus is going to be parvovirus B19, okay? Most of these patients have auto-infarcted their spleen. So that's why we have to, what, I already said it like three times because I had a question on this and I had multiple questions. We have to make sure that we vaccinate against encapsulated bacteria. okay? With these patients, if they have osteomyelitis, what's the most common bacteria that causes osteomyelitis in sickle cell? It's going to be your the salmonella, right? Okay? Okay. What are we going to diagnose them? How? We're going to do a hemoglobin electrophoresis. It's going to be your hemoglobin 
S, what you're going to see, this is going to be required for your diagnosis. Their hemoglobin F is going to be about 2% to 25%. They're going to have reticulocytosis, leukocytosis, hydroxyurea, the best pharmacological treatment for these patients. So sickle cell, they have the blood cells that look like they're crescent shaped. So that's why these are more prone to getting stuck in the vessels. So that's why they tend to have these symptoms of like embolism and thrombotic symptoms and why they auto-infarct their spleen because their cells are not normal like the circular ones that we have, the sphere-shaped ones that we have, not sphere because that's another disorder. They're not the normal red blood cells, okay? They are shaped like a crescent. So that's why these are more prone to getting stuck in the blood, in the vessels. Okay, so now that we've done with sequel cell anemia, why don't we go into our thalassemias, okay? Thalassemia. So thalassemia is an inherited disorder characterized by inadequate production of either the alpha or beta chain of the hemoglobin, okay? And it's classified according to whatever chain is deficient. Symptoms of thalassemia and signs, it's going to be your hepatosplenomegaly and your jaundice. So let's get into each one, okay? Let's start with our beta thalassemias. In beta thalassemias, the beta chain production is deficient, but alpha chains are unaffected, okay? Basically, you're going to have excess alpha chain. So that's why it's called beta thalassemia because the beta is the beta chain is what is deficient in beta thalassemias. It's more commonly found in Mediterranean, Middle East, Middle Eastern Indian ancestry, okay? And you have different types. So you have your thalassemia mi major and your thalassemia minor, okay? So how is this patient going to present? So if thalassemia major, they're going to be presenting with severe anemia with uh, thalassemia major. And what happens in thalassemia major is that they have a mutation in two beta chains in these patients, okay? They have a mutation in two beta chains for thalassemia major. They're going to have profound microcytic hypochromic anemia, and some of the complications of thalassemia major is going to be splenomegaly, cholelithiasis, and hemosiderosis, okay? So these patients are going to be presenting with massive hepatosplenomegaly. Okay, they're going to have growth retardation, and with these patients, they need to be treated with blood transfusions. They need lifelong blood transfusions. If they're not treated with uh, blood transfusions, they can die within the first years of life. Okay, and then we have thalassemia minor. Thalassemia minor with these patients, it's going to be a mutation in one beta chain. So most of these patients are asymptomatic and they're carriers. They're going to have mild microcytic hypochromic anemia. And like I said, they're going to be asymptomatic. So once again, major Cooley's anemia is going to be a mutation in two beta chains versus your minor is going to be a mutation in one beta chain. Thalassemia major, how, is it, how are we going to work these patients up? We're going to do a school x-ray and then on these patients, you can see the crew cut appearance, which is going to tell you that they have thalassemia major. But usually our diagnostic of choice is going to be our hemoglobin electrophoresis. Once again, hemoglobin electrophoresis. On these patients, we're going to see hemoglobin F and hemoglobin um, BA2 are elevated for these patients. Okay, In thalassemia minor, same thing. We're going to do a hemoglobin electrophoresis. How are you going to treat these patients? Like we said, thalassemia major, we're going to do frequent red blood cell uh, transfusions, and these are required to sustain life. For thalassemia major, some of these patients are, like I said, asymptomatic, so you usually do not need to treat them. You only treat them if they have iron deficiency, then you can give them iron if needed. So now we're going to go into our alpha thalassemias, okay? So with our beta chains, we have two, okay? Alphas, we have four. So if we miss one beta chain, we have thalassemia what? Minor. If we're missing two of them, so we're missing both of the chains, because we only have two beta chains, then we're having thalassemia major. And alpha, we have four, okay? So depending on whether you're missing one, two, three, or four, is going to tell you how the patient's going to present and how you're going to treat them and what type it is. So the patients that are carriers, they only have a mutation or deletion of only one alpha locus. These are the silent carriers. Alpha thalassemia trait or minor is a mutation or deletion of two alpha lo loci, and it's most commonly found in African-Americans. 
HBH disease, it's usually going to be a mutation or deletion of three. And then you have hydrops fatalis, which tends to present with patients that have mutation or deletion of all of the four alpha loci, okay? And this is usually fatal at birth. Like I said, it's described as hydrops fatalis or shortly after birth. Once again, silent carriers are only going to be missing one alpha locus. For alpha thalassemia trait or minor, they're going to be missing two alpha loci. For HPH disease, um, it's usually mutation or deletion of three, but hydrops fatalis is associated with four, okay? So patients that are only missing one alpha locus, which are your silent carriers, are going to be asymptomatic. But the patients that have HPH, where they're missing three or four, four, you die. They're missing three. They're going to be presenting with hemolytic anemia, splenomegaly, microcytic hypochromic anemia, which makes sense, right? It's a problem with the destruction of our blood cells. And how are you going to diagnose these patients? For alpha thalassemia uh, minor or trait, you're going to look at their labs. It's going to be mild microcytic hypochromic anemia. For HBH disease, you're going to do a hemoglobin electrophoresis, which is going to show you HBH. Treatment, if it's silent carriers, you don't need any treatment at all. If it's alpha, alpha thalassemia trait or minor, which is we're only missing two out of the four, no treatment. If it's HBH disease, which is they're missing three or four out of the four, Treatment's usually similar to patients with beta thalassemia major, so they're going to need what? They're going to need blood transfusions, and then splenectomy can also be helpful in these patients. All right, guys, so let's get into our next one. It's going to be a TTP. It's going to be thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura, also known as TTP. It's a rare disorder of platelet consumption, okay? The cause is usually unknown. What happened is that there's a hyaline microthrombi, which, occlu which occludes the small vessels and it can involve any organ, okay? This is a life-threatening emergency that can cause death. Some of the risk factors is gonna be if the patient's pregnant, if they, are, if they had a previous infection, if they're on certain medications, if they have HIV or AIDS, okay? And what happens in these patients also if they lack Adam's TS13, it can also cause uh, TTP. So Adam's TS13, just make sure you know that. I think I had one question on that. And I don't remember if it was on the exam or the practice questions I had, but just make sure that you know that. Adam's TS13 is associated with, with thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, also known as TTP. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have the classic pentod. The mnemonic I have for this is going to be fat RN, F-A-T space RN, fat RN. F, they're going to present with a fever. A, they're going to present with hemolytic anemia, so they're going to have anemia. So fever, A is for anemia. T is going to be for thrombocytopenia. R is going to be for renal failure. And then N is they're going to have neurological signs. So they're going to range, they're going to have a mental status changes. Even they can have hemiplasia. So once again, fat RN, that's going to be the mnemonic. How is the patient going to present on the signs? You're going to have non-palpable petechiae purpura. They're going to be presenting with seizures, stroke, focal neurological deficits, and a coma. How are you going to diagnose these patients? So basically, they're going to be presenting with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which is going to present with a high LDH. And then they're going to have a high reticulocyte count and a high indirect bilirubin, but they're going to have a low haptoglobin with these patients. And usually it's going to be um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, symptoms plus fever plus ultramental status. That's going to tell you that the patient has TTP. What is hemolytic uremic syndrome? What symptoms? That's microangiopathic hemolytic anemia plus thrombocytopenia plus renal failure. So it was at RN, right? Fever, anemia, N is going to be for neurological symptoms, so like entromental status. R is going to be for kidney problem, problems, so renal injuries. And then you have your FAT, thrombocytopenia, I'm sorry. The T is going to be for your thrombocytopenia. How are you going to treat these patients? It's going to be plasma phoresis, and you're going to give them fresh frozen plasma. This is going to start as soon as the diagnosis is established, okay? If you don't treat these patients, then it can be life-threatening, like I said. You do not give platelet transfusions in these patients. Once again, you do not give platelet transfusions in these patients. You're going to avoid aspirin also, okay? Once again, treatment for this is going to be with plasma phoresis. TTP is associated with the lack of Adams TS13, they're going to be presenting with a pentad of fat RN, fever for F, A is going to be for anemia, 
T is going to be for your thrombocytopenia. R is going to be for your renal problems, so renal failure, acute renal failure. And then we have R. And then N is going to be for your neurological symptoms. So you're going to have ultramental status. Okay. And you're going to treat these patients with what? Plasma phoresis. So our next one's going to be ITP, which is also known as what? Idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Okay. ITP. So ITP tends to result from autoimmune antibody formation against host platelets. So what happens is that these platelet antibodies, IgG, they coat and damage platelets that are then removed by the splenic macrophages. So there's two forms. You have your acute form and your chronic form. Your acute form tends to be seen in children, if especially after they had a viral upper respiratory infection, and it's the most common one, and usually it's self-limited, so it tends to go away within six months. And then you have your chronic form, which is seen in adults, especially women between the ages of 20 to 40 years old, and they tend to have spontaneous remissions, okay? So they have remissions and then exacerbations between in the chronic form. So how's the patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with petechiae, ichemosis on the skin, okay? They also might have uh, bleeding symptoms, um, bleeding of mucosa membranes like the gum, uh, vaginal bleeding, GI bleeding, bleeding in their urine, hematuria, epistaxis. And then if it's an acute, they're gonna, if it's an acute form of ITP, they're gonna be presenting with abrupt appearance of petechiae, purpura. Whenever I see petechiae and purpura on a question stem, I think about something involving the platelets, okay? So with acute, they're gonna be presenting with petechiae, purpura. They're also gonna be presenting with hemorrhagic bulla on the skin and the mucous membranes. Chronic, it's going to be more insidious, right? Makes sense. That's why it's called chronic. And with these patients, they're going to say that they've been having this a long history of easy bruising and menorrhagia, which is going to be your heavy menstruation. They also are going to develop petechiae on their skin, their mucous membranes. And how are you going to diagnose these patients? Basically, their bleeding time is going to be prolonged, which makes sense, right? Their PT and PTT is going to be normal. So just for repetition, because repetition is good. PT involves what? The extrinsic or intrinsic? So we said plain tennis outside, extrinsic. PTT is intrinsic, plain table tennis inside, and these are going to be normal in ITP. These patients are going to be presenting with thrombocytopenia. Basically, the platelet count is going to be less than 20,000. And then if you do a CBC, they're going to have iron deficiency anemia. Okay. And what's going to be the treatment? So like we said, if it's mild to moderate, it's usually observation. Tell them to avoid any contact sports, right? Because we said the acute form tends to go away by itself. But if you need to give them treatment, then you're going to give them IVIG for kids and then adrenal corticosteroids for adults, okay? If it's chronic ITP, then you can do a splenectomy. And this is only if they failed medical treatment. So you first do medical treatment for these patients. But like I said, you're going to give IVIG for patients, for children, okay, if they need treatment, and then adrenal corticosteroids for adults. So let's go into our macrocytic anemia. So remember we said micro, normal, and then macro. So micro was less than 80 MCV, normal is 80 to 100, normal cytic anemia, and then more than 100 is going to be macrocytic anemia, okay? And then we also said that... Microcytic and macrocytic are a problem with production, okay, of red blood cells. And then we said um, normocytic is a problem with destruction of red blood cells. So we're talking about macrocytic, it's a problem with production. So let's start with our, the two most common ones for macrocytic, and the two most common ones you're going to be tested on are vitamin B12 deficiency and iron def um, vitamin B12 deficiency and folic acid deficiency. Iron deficiency is microcytic anemia. So make sure you, you know the difference between folic acid deficiency and also vitamin B12 deficiency, okay? So vitamin B12 is found in meat and fish, okay? With vitamin B12 deficiency, there are several causes, but it's usually the majority of them is because there's impaired absorption. And there's different causes. Pernicious anemia is one of the causes for vitamin B12 deficiency. It's most common in the Western hemisphere. It's basically because the patient lacks intrinsic factor. So what happens is that there's an autoimmune destruction of the gastric parietal cells that cause atrophic gastritis, and it causes a lack of intrinsic factor production, which is required to 
for absorption in the small intestines. Also, if a patient has a history of a gastric bypass or gastrectomy, they're more prone to getting vitamin B12 deficiency. So if you have a question stem that says a patient just had like a gastric sleeve, you wanna think about vitamin B12 deficiency. Also, if they have a poor diet, if they're strict vegetarians, if they drink a lot, if they have any type of aerial bowel disease, like Crohn's disease, if they had ileal resection, because um, that that usually is the ileal is usually sometimes responsible. It's responsible for absorption of vitamins, and then of course other causes like your rare ones is like certain parasites. Like you have your fish tapeworm, which is your Diphyllobothrium uh, latum infestation. Okay. So how is this patient going to present? So they're going to be presenting with symptoms of anemia. So they have weakness, fatigue, bruising, or gum bleeding. They'll have glossitis, which is like the really, really shiny tongue. They'll have stomatitis, which is going to be on the sides here. They're also going to be complaining of neuropathy. Uh, this is going to help you distinguish between vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. Is that in vitamin B12 deficiency, the patient has neuropathy. Okay, they're going to have neuro symptoms. So they're going to have the peripheral neuropathy. They're going to have balance problems. They're going to have depression they're going to have increased deep tendon reflexes. They're going to have spasticity, weakness, a positive Babinski sign. I actually was diagnosed with vitamin B12 deficiency anemia. And I what I had is that I had tingling in my extremities, which is a peripheral neuropathy. This is only for vitamin B12 deficiency. This is what you can differentiate between vitamin B12 deficiency and iron uh, folic acid deficiency is that in vitamin B12 deficiency, you have neuro symptoms. In folic acid deficiency anemia, you do not. So how are you gonna work these patients up? You're gonna do a peripheral blood smear. You're gonna see megaloblastic anemia, right? Macrocytic anemia. You're gonna see hypersegmented neutrophils. Their vitamin B12 is gonna be low, less than 100. And then you're also gonna see that methylmalonic acid and homocysteine levels are both going to be elevated, okay? versus your folate deficiency, only the homocysteine levels are going to be increased. In um, vitamin B12, both the methylmalonic acid and homocysteine levels are going to be elevated, okay? You can also do a Schilling's test. This is going to tell you that there's antibodies against the intrinsic factor, and this is going to help you diagnose the pernicious anemia with these patients. So what's going to be the treatment? For uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, you're basically going to give him cyanocobalamin. So vitamin B12 intramuscular once once a month for uh, lifelong treatment. So that's when going to be your treatment for your vitamin B12 deficiency. So once again, we discussed that with vitamin B12 deficiency. What did we say? Vitamin B12 deficiency is going to present with neuropathy. So anemic symptoms and then on top of that neuropathy. This is going to help you differentiate between folate deficiency anemia. Vitamin B12 deficiency is a macrocytic anemia. So their MCV is going to be greater than 100. We get our vitamin B12 from where? From meat and fish. We want to think about a patient that might have vitamin B12 deficiency. If they have a poor diet, of course, right? If they're like a strict vegetarians, if they're alcoholics, if they had a history of having a gastric bypass, okay? And then we have pernicious anemia, which is due to autoimmune destruction of gastric parietal cells, which causes a lack of intrinsic factor, okay? With these patients, you're gonna present with what you said, neuropathic symptoms on top of anemia symptoms. Both their methylmalonic acid and homocysteine levels are going to be increased, okay? And cyanocobalamin or vitamin B12 is going to be giving intramuscular once per month for lifelong treatment. So that's going to be our vitamin B12 deficiency. So next one's gonna be folic acid, folic acid deficiency anemia. What we need to know is that our folic acid stores are limited and it's usually due when a patient does develop folic acid deficiency anemia, it's because they have inadequate intake of folate over a month period, okay? What's our main source of folic acid? It's green veggies. So sometimes if we overcook our vegetables, it can remove all the folate. What are some of the causes of folic acid deficiency? Once again, if the patient does not have a, a appropriate dietary intake, so like the tea and toast diet is the most common cause. If the patient is an alcoholic, okay? If there are uh, long-term use of like um, oral antibiotics that cause like folate synthesis inhibitors, if the patient is pregnant, 
if they are on folate antagonists like methotrexate, it's like the common one. Make sure that you know that. I had a question. Methotrexate associated with folic acid deficiency, anticonvulsants like phenotoin, and then also hemodialysis. So with these patients, how are they going to present? Once again, symptoms are going to be similar to your vitamin B12 deficiency. So they're going to have the weakness, the fatigue, the bruising, the gum bleeding, the glossitis, the somatitis, which is like the sore, the sore tongue. But these patients are not going to have any neurological symptoms, okay? And then remember, if a woman's pregnant and they have folic acid deficiency, they can have uh, spina bifida so, or neurotubal uh, defects. But once again, no neurosymptoms in folic acid deficiency. And then with folic acid deficiency, their homocysteine levels are going to be increased, but their methylmalonic acid levels are going to be normal. This is what's going to help you differentiate between um, vitamin B12 deficiency, because as I said, that vitamin B12 deficiency has both homocysteine and methylmalonic acids increased. In folic acid deficiency, they only have homocysteine levels increased and their methylmalonic acid levels are normal. Their serum folic acid is going to be low. And with these patients, they're going to be presenting also with micro ovalocytes and hyperpigmented uh, PMNS. This is usually going to be pathognomonic. So micro ovalocytes and hyperpigmented um, PMNS are going to be pathognomonic. And the treatment for folic acid deficiency is going to be daily oral folic acid replacement. All right, guys. So we finished with our immune. Now we're going to go into our, with our immunology and hematology. We're going to go into infectious diseases, which is going to be the last topic. Okay, so let's start with botulism, which is caused by Clostridium botulinum. Okay, uh, this is usually caused from ingestion of preformed toxins that are produced by the spores of Clostridium botulism. So once again, I had a question on this, so make sure you know this. It's caused by Clostridium botulinum, and it's caused because there's ingestion of the preformed toxins, okay? So it's the toxins that are produced by the spores of Clostridium botulinum. So what are some of the sources for botulism? The most common one's going to be home canned goods, okay? So home canned goods. And then also if there's any uh, wound contamination. How is the patient going to present if they have a... Uh, um, botulinum. So basically, they're going to be presenting with symmetric descending paralysis. It's going to be symmetric descending flaccid paralysis. These patients are also going to be presenting with double vision, pitosis, uh, GI symptoms like abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea. They can also be in respiratory distress, with, which can lead to death with some of these patients. Okay. So how are you going to diagnose these patients? Basically, you're going to diagnose them with the C. botulinum toxin serum, stool or gastric bioassay. Bio these are definitive for the diagnosis for botul botulism. And how are we going to treat these patients? Basically, what we want to do is what we want to contact CDC. It's usually supportive care for these patients. We want to make sure that we are monitoring their respiration. And then if we have a high suspicion that, of course, it's due to botulism, then we want to administer the antitoxin, the toxoid. Okay. So we're going to give equine serum heptavalent botulism antitoxin if the patient's greater than one year. And then we're going to give the human-derived botulism immune globulin if the patient's less than one year. So once again, botulism, it's caused by Clostridium botulinum. It, on the patient story, it's going to tell you that the patient that was eating canned foods, it's going to present with a symmetric descending paralysis, and the treatment's going to be an antitoxin. It's usually going to present in an infant. Sometimes you might even get a question with a child that was given honey, okay, honey or corn syrup, and the patient's going to be presenting with constipation. It's usually going to be described like a floppy baby, where like they're not even suckling correctly. They're having... Uh, hypotonia, okay? So th that's going to be for botulism. And then how are they going to present? It's going to be descending symmetric flaccid paralysis, okay? Descending symmetric flaccid paralysis. So sometimes if you do a deep tendon reflex, it's going to be decreased. They're also going to be presenting with postural hypotension. They'll have cranial nerve deficits like diplopia, 
Okay, so let's go into the next one, diphtheria. So diphtheria is most commonly caused by cor cornibacterium diphtheria, which is an anaerobic gram positive, and the patient's going to be presenting with an upper respiratory-like illness, sore throat, and low fever. On your physical exam, you're going to see a bull neck, so you're going to see lymphadenopathy, cervical adenopathy, pseudomembrane on pharynx, and grains of salts on the tonsils for these patients. These patients are also going to present with paralysis that's going to be descending, and they can also present with myocarditis. But usually what you're going to see on like the pharynx, you're going to see the, the gray membranes that are covering the tonsils. So whenever I read a question to them and it says that there's gray membranes, membranes that are covering the tonsils and the patient is not vaccinated, then I want to think about diphtheria. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? Basically, what we want to do is that we want to support the airway, okay, and then hospitalize and make sure that we isolate these patients. We also want to give them the horse serum antitoxin from CDC for these patients. And then antibiotics, we're going to give penicillin or erythromycin. So next one we're going to go over is candidiasis. So most common cause of candidiasis and the most common one, because there's different types, right? The most common one is going to be candida albicans. So people that are at risk for getting candidiasis is the patients that are diabetic. So if you want to think about a patient that has not been diagnosed as a diabetic yet, but they keep getting recurrent candidal infections, then you want to think about maybe this is due to diabetes, where the patient probably has an underlying uh, diabetes and they haven't been diagnosed with. Also, if the patient has been taking steroids, if you're immunocompromised, okay, if they have a history of taking antibiotics, especially like females after a round of antibiotics, sometimes they're more prone to getting candidiasis, the yeast infections. So usually what you'll see that how it's going to be described, it's going to be an oval budding yeast that's that uh, forms hyphae and long pseudo-hyphae for candidiasis. And how is this patient going to present? Basically, like we said, it's known as a yeast infection. You're going to see that thick white cottage cheese discharge in a woman, and it's going to be painless, and it's going to be very, very itchy. Sometimes they'll say that it's burning in the vaginal lips. But it can present anywhere. So that's a vagina. It could also present in the oropharynx or the mouth, and it's characterized like thrush. So it's usually going to be like a white plaque, and it's usually painless, and you're able to scrape it off with these patients. It can also present uh, cutaneously. So in those babies that we see that they have it in their groin area, that can be also candidiasis. And then, of course, it can present in the esophagus. Like I said, these patients will be presenting with trouble swallowing. And usually when it presents in the esophagus, we want to think about a patient that's probably immunocompromised. And then, of course, it can disseminate and cause uh, septic shock, meningitis, abscesses. And if it presents in a patient with AIDS, what does their CD4 have to be? So their CD4 has to be greater than 200, and these patients are more prone to getting these candidal infections, especially like the esophagitis. How are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to do a KOH prep, and then we can also do a blood or, tool, a blood or tissue culture if it's like invasive. So how are we going to treat these patients? So usually if it's like a vaginal infection, we just give them like oral fluconazole. Okay, they just take it once and that's it. If it's anything, um, it's also for vaginal, you can even do any of your vaginal creams. So any of your fungal, fungal medications like your Meconazole or clotrimazole cream, you can also prescribe these patients that. If it's on the skin, like the babies that get it in the diaper area with these babies, you can give them oral nystatin powder. But usually, like I said, it's going to be anything that ends in like your azel. So fluconazole orally for vaginal candidiasis. If it's a patient that has esophagitis and it's in the esophagus, and you can give them something like clotrimazole or nystatin. So next one is going to be uh, esophageal candidiasis. I know we briefly mentioned this, but let's just go into a little bit more detail. So there's multiple pathogens that cause it. The most common one is going to be candida albicans. There's multiple, multiple things and multiple organisms that can cause esophagitis, but one of the most common ones is going to be candida albicans. So for esophagitis, it's usually going to be 
found in a patient that is immunosuppressed. So it's going to be a patient that has AIDS. So remember, we discussed that their CD4 count has to be less than 200. This is where these patients are more prone to getting these esophageal candidiasis. Also, if patients have a history of getting an organ transplant, they're more prone to getting these candidiasis. And of course, if they're immunosuppressive, like if they have a lymphoma or leukemia. So how's the patient going to present with esophageal candidiasis? They're going to be presenting with painful swallowing okay, or trouble swallowing. And then once you do the exam, you're going to see the oral thrush also. And then how are you going to diagnose these patients? Basically, you're going to do an endoscopy with biopsy and brushings. And then the treatment for this is going to be usually fluconazole. You can give it for 14 to 21 days. Okay. Now, if it's due to CMV, cytomegalovirus, which is also found in patients that are immunocompromised, then we would give a uh, gangcyclovir for these patients. If it's due to herpes, then we would give them acyclovir. So oral candidi candidiasis is also known as thrush. So this is common, once again, in patients that are immunosuppressed, if they have HIV, AIDS, if they're diabetic, like I said, if they've been currently taking antibiotics, and also for patients that use inhaled steroids. That's why it's really important that whenever you prescribe an inhaled steroid or even like a, um, you're like albuterol for these patients that are asthmatic, make sure that you educate them on the importance of washing their mouth when they use it, after they use it. So another thing of how, how are these patients going to present? They're gonna basically present with a sore and painful dry mouth. They're gonna have burning mouth. They're gonna have trouble swallowing and a burning tongue also. And on your exam, you're gonna see a thick whitish patch on the oral mucosa that's gonna be rubbed off easily so you can take it off, okay? Versus your other ones like your leukoplakia, which are like the ones that are associated with cancer that are found in smokers. You see that in the mouth and you can't take that off. With this one, you're able to scrape it off with oral candidiasis. Diagnosis is gonna be uh, with the KOH prep, right? That's where you're gonna see the hyphae hy or the pseudo hyphae. And treatment's gonna be a topical antifungal, clotrimazole, you're gonna add. So our next one's gonna be chlamydia and gonorrhea. So I actually just saw these two cases in a patient yesterday during my family medicine rotation. So chlamydia is the most common bacterial STD, and it's usually co-infected with gonorrhea for um, these patients. So that's why we want to make sure that we treat for both. And that's what my doc doctor did yesterday. So risk factors for these patients uh, for chlamydia is that, of course, if they have multiple sexual partners, if they're not using protection when they're um, being sexually active, and it's most commonly found in females, so how is this patient going to present with chlamydia? Sometimes they'll be asymptomatic, but for men, they'll present with uh, painful urination, so dysuria. They can also have urethral discharge, but honestly, it's not very common. The case we saw the other day, the patient was only complaining of dysuria and did not have any urethral discharge. They're also going to be complaining of itching. They'll have a uh, fever. As for a woman, the women are going to be presenting with purulent urethral discharge. They'll have um, intermittent or postcoital bleeding and also painful urination. And then when you see the exam, like on a woman, you're going to see mucopurulent discharge. And it's going to be coming from the cervical os and then also a very, a very inflamed cervix. How are you going to diagnose these patients? You're going to do an NAAT, which is a nucleic acid amplification test. Do we do this in clinic? We don't. Sometimes we'll treat them unless the patient wants to make sure that they definitely have that. Then we can send it out for culture. So we do the NAAT. That's the most sensitive. We can also do a wet mount for these patients. How are you going to treat these patients? We're going to give them a one gram of azithromycin orally, or you can give them doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. But usually we just give them azithromycin because they just take it once and that's it versus doxycycline you have to give it uh, twice a day for seven days. So it's a longer regimen. You want to make sure that you also tell them to treat the partner that they were with or the partners that they've been with also. So what are some of the complications if chlamydia isn't treated? So the common one you're going to get tested in for a woman, it's going to be pelvic inflammatory disease. That's why it's really important. 
that we treat these because pelvic inflammatory disease can lead to scarring and it can lead to infertility in women. Also, in women, if chlamydia is not treated, it can lead to tubal ovarian abscesses, ectopic pregnancy, and then the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Okay, and then of course, like I said, infertility. All right, next one's going to be gonorrhea. It's most commonly caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. With these patients, uh, basically just know what type of bacteria Neisseria gonorrhea is because you're going to have a question where it'll just give you the name of the bacteria and you have to know which one it is. So Neisseria gonorrhea is a gram-negative intracellular diplococci. And how is gonorrhea transmitted? So the same way that chlamydia is, it is transmitted sexually. It's more commonly found in patients that have... Uh, multiple sexual partners, and the thing about gonorrhea is that it can also be transmitted uh, neonatally. So if the mother has gonorrhea, they can give it to the baby. And once again, it's co-infected with chlamydia. So out of chlamydia and gonorrhea, which one's more common? The most common one's going to be chlamydia. So once again, if we have a patient that's gonorrhea, we want to treat him with chlam for chlamydia because chlamydia is the most common uh, STD, bacterial STD. So how is this patient going to present with gonorrhea? So usually it's asymptomatic in women and then uh, symptomatic in men, okay? With these patients with gonorrhea, you want to make sure you're doing like that physical exam. You're looking at their throat. You're looking in the rectum, conjunctiva, right? Especially with little babies that can present with uh, gonorrhea in their conjunctiva. So how are men going to present? They're going to be presenting with urethral discharge, painful urination, They'll have erythema. They'll have a frequency in urination. Females, like I said, it's usually asymptomatic. If they do have symptoms, it'll be symptoms of like cervicitis, an inflamed cervix, urethritis. They'll have purulent discharge, okay? And also, they will be complaining of intermenstrual bleeding. And then also, another thing you want to know is that gonorrhea can also disseminate and it can cause meningitis. So just make sure that you are familiar with that. If you have a young guy that's coming in and they're having like meningitis symptoms and then they have a rash in their lower extremities and it tells you somewhere in the vignette that the patient's sexually active, you want to think about maybe uh, Neisseria meningitis. So just make sure that you have that in your back of your mind. I just had a question on that yesterday. So that's why it came up. So with these patients, how are you going to diagnose them? So basically you are going to do same thing, similar to chlamydia, you're going to do an NAAT test, nucleic acid amplification test. This is the most sensitive. You can also do a gram stain, okay, of the discharge, and then also uh, make sure that you culture it. You can also do that. So the next one that we're going to discuss is going to be, well, the treatment of gonorrhea. So how are we going to treat these patients? Basically, we're going to treat them with ceftrioxone. We're going to give them 250 milligrams uh, just once, also known as rosefin, right? Your rosefin shot. And then we're also going to add azithromycin. So you can either, either give azithromycin once or once again, we can give doxycycline twice a day for seven days. So you're going to put both of these together. You're going to do a ceftrioxone plus azithromycin or ceftrioxone plus doxycycline. So now that we've discussed that, what are we going to cholera? Cholera. So cholera is the most commonly caused by vibrio cholera. Usually in the history of the patient, it'll say that the patient drank contaminated water. The patient's going to be presenting with severe watery diarrhea, and it's going to be flecked with mucus, or it's going to be described as rice water. So now with the EORs, what they're doing now is that they're trying to get away from the buzzwords. So instead of describing it as rice water, they're going to describe it as Diarrhea that's flecked with mucus, and I know this because I had an exam for my EOR. I don't remember if it was for internal medicine or family medicine, where they tricked me and they said it was flecked with mucus. So just make sure that you know that. Severe watery diarrhea flecked with mucus. So physical exam, the patient's going to be very dehydrated. Um, if you look at the history of cholera, it's really interesting of how the cause was found because you had all these people that were dying it's really interesting and cholera is deadly and it's still deadly in certain areas of the world if they have outbreaks. So that's why they're very careful with the outbreaks of cholera because it basically dehydrates the patient extremely and the patient can die. So that's why in physical exam they're going to be dehydrated. So it'll have the decreased skin trigger, right, with these patients. So how are you going to diagnose these patients? So these patients are going to be diagnosed via stool culture or dark field uh, microscopy is usually 
diagnostic with these patients. Okay, and like we said, where does this come from? It's going to be usually from drinking contaminated water, also from undercooked seafood. It's it's usually um, transmitted fecal oral. So you all have a vignette that either says undercooked seafood or the patient drank contaminated water. And usually it's going to be a patient that traveled overseas. So how is going to be the treatment for Vibrio cholera? So what we want to do is a supportive care. We want to give them fluids because remember I said that these patients are very, very dehydrated and they can die from dehydration. So we want to make sure that we are giving them fluids and replacing all their electrolytes that they're losing. We also want to uh, treat them if it's like severe or moderate, then we want to give them fluoroquinolones, macrolides, and tetracyclines. And if the patient is, uh, of course, a child or if they're pregnant, we can't give tetracyclines, right? So we would give them azithromycin. All right, so the next one's going to be cytomegalovirus. I know I, bef I briefly discussed this when we were talking about candidal uh, esophagitis. So with cytomegalovirus, it's... it's um, also known as a human herpes virus type 5. So it's from the human herpes family. And basically, this is very commonly found in patients that are immunocompromised. So whether if the patient has HIV, if they have um, AIDS, or if the patient has also, if they just got a transplant, they're more prone to getting uh, cytomegalovirus. Okay. So... What are some of the risk factors for cytomegalovirus? Of course, blood transfusions, if the patient has multiple sexual partners, and it's transmitted from person to person, uh, blood transfusions, organ transplants, uh, sexually also, placenta and breast milk also. So how is this patient going to present? Usually they're say, asymptomatic, but if they do present with symptoms, it's going to be flu-like symptoms. So they're going to have the fever, malaise, myalgias, arthralgias. Okay. And on your physical exam, you're going to see lymphadenopathy. You, you may or may not see pharyngitis. And some of the complications of uh, CMV is that it can cause uh, esophageal ulcers. It can also cause encephalitis and then retinitis. So esophageal ulcers is common for cytomegalovirus in patients that have a CD4 count less than 100. And CMV retinitis, which is very, very commonly tested, is usually found in a patient that has a CD4 count less than 50. So just make sure that you know your differences. The most common one I kept getting tested on was a CMV CD4 less than 50, C CMV retinitis. So how are you going to diagnose these patients? Basically, what you're going to do is that you can do an antigen testing or a qualitative, uh, qualitative PCR. You can also do a tissue biopsy and then I also had a question on this, so make sure that you know this. On the tissue biopsy, you're going to see owl's eyes or intracytoplasmic inclusion. So tissue biopsy, owl's eyes, intracytoplasmic inclusions. So how are these patients going to be treated? Like I said, if it's a healthy patient, they're immunocompromised, and they don't have any symptoms, there's usually no treatment. But if the patient's immunocompromised, like if they have AIDS, etc., then we want to give them IV and cyclovir for these patients. And usually prophylaxis for CMV is given for patients that have a CD4 less than 50 and you're going to give them Bactrim. But usually the treatment if the patient has like CMV retinitis or CMV esophagitis, it's going to be what? It's going to be gang cyclovir. Although honestly, I read some book that say that they actually give Valgon cyclovir because it's a lot better than gang cyclovir. But just make sure anything that ends in gang cyclovir you're going to give for these patients. And then Bactrim is going to be for prophylaxis. So next one's going to be Epstein-Barr infection. This one's very commonly seen in adolescents, right? It's also known as the kissing disease, common in like college students. It's transmitted through saliva, kissing, if a patient shares like their food or drink. And usually if a patient's infected it with it once, they tend to develop lifelong immunity, which is interesting. So how are these patients going to present? They're going to be presenting with fever and malaise. They're going to have the exudative uh, pharyngitis also. They're going to be presenting with cervical lymphadenopathy. It's going to be more in the posterior, okay? So just make sure that you know that more in the posterior than the anterior. So you're going to see the exudates and you're going to see posterior lymphadenopathy. This always tripped me up when I was reading a question because I would read the question that sounded like strep throat. But then it would say it was had anterior cervical adenopathy, and I'm like, okay, that's that is strep throat. 
So anterior cervical endinopathy is more commonly found with strep. So posterior adenopathy is more commonly found with mononucleosis. So if you read a question stem, and sometimes it won't give you that it is, it won't give you the splenomegaly or anything that's going to point you towards Epstein-Barr virus. And it tells you the patient just has exudates and it's vague exudates. It's a teenager and they have posterior uh, cervical lymphadenopathy. You want to think about Epstein-Barr virus. But if it says exudates and then it says anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, then it's going to be more commonly streptococcus and um, cockle infection. So make sure that you know that. Also with these patients, they're also going to be presenting with uh, an enlarged spleen. So on your physical exam, you'll see that really, really big spleen. And then they can also be presenting with hepatomegaly. They might have a, a maculopapular rash also if the patient was given amoxicillin because say that they thought the patient had a strep throat, give them amoxicillin, then they have a rash if they had ended up having Epstein-Barr virus. So what's going to be the diagnosis for the patients? You're going to do a monospot, right? So a heterophile antibody test. So heterophile antibody tests for these patients. Another way that they'll describe to you is that they did a peripheral blood smear on this patient and they found atypical lymphocytes. You want to think about Epstein-Barr virus. That's another way that they can trick you. So they did a um, workup on this patient, a peripheral blood smear, and then they found atypical lymphocytes. But the diagnostic is going to be what? A monospot or a heterophile antibody test. So treatment for this is usually supportive. Um, tell the patient to drink a lot of fluids, uh, take analgesics, and then to avoid sports for three to four weeks to prevent splenic rupture. Once again, again, avoid sports three to four weeks to prevent splenic rupture. Okay, guys, so let's go into our next virus. It's going to be herpes simplex virus. So what we need to know about herpes simplex virus is that once a patient has gotten herpes, it's basically going to replicate in the dermis and the epidermis, and then it's going to move via sensory nerves to the dorsal root ganglia. Then it's going to stay there in the dorsal root ganglia, and so it's going to reside there as a latent infection where it can be reactivated by any time, at any time by reaching the skin through the peripheral nerves. So that's why they say once you get herpes, you have it for life. So we have different types. So we have the oral herpes simplex. We have herpes simplex virus 1, and then we have herpes simplex virus 2. So let's go into oral herpes simplex. So basically, this one's transmitted via contact with an active ulceration or shedding of the virus from the mucous membranes. So what triggers this, if a patient has already had a herpes inf infection, like an oral herpes infection, and it basically there's just a reactivation, what triggers this is usually if the patient's stressed out, uh, certain viral infections, and sunlight also will trigger this. So what's the treatment for this? Usually healing will, it occurs, and it occurs over several days to two weeks, uh, usually without scarring with these patients. Something else you can uh, put the patient on is uh, doco, docosanol, so D-O-C-O-S-A-N-O-L. This is used usually to, to treat the cold sores or the fever blisters from the herpes labialis. It can speed up the healing of the sores and decrease the symptoms like the itching, the burning. So next one's going to be herpes simplex virus 1 or herpes labialis. So with this one, this one's usually found in the facial area, right? Versus herpes simplex 2 is usually found in the general area. So that's how you differentiate between these two. So herpes simplex virus 1, it's usually commonly causes gingivostomatitis. So it's transmitted via saliva. Okay, uh, Sometimes it can be acquired in childhood. And it's interesting because more than 90% of people in the world are affected with herpes simplex virus 1. And with, with herpes simplex virus 1, basically it resides in the tri trigeminal ganglion. Okay. I had some questions on this, so just make sure you're familiar with that. So it resides in the trigeminal ganglion. So how is the patient going to present? The patient's going to present asymptomatic. They might have fevers and malaise. Uh, if it's herpes labialis, basically this one's going to be commonly found in the lips. So most commonly found on the lips, limited to the vermilion border involving the skin and the mucous membranes. It's going to be very painful. So herpes labialis, cold sores, or fever blisters. We also have herpes gingival, 
gingival stomatitis, where it's going to involve the gingiva and the vermilion border of the lips. Also, with these patients, they're going to be presenting with a very, very high fever. They might have presenting with a general malaise also, stinging mouth pain, drooling, uh, fetid breath, and then also cervical lymphadenopathy. It seems like whenever some, a patient has some type of viral infection, they present with uh, lymphadenopathy, right? These patients can also present with Bell's palsy. Other signs uh, is usually her herpetic whitlow. Hey, this one's usually seen in like dentists or healthcare workers or even children who tend to suck their, their thumbs or bite their nails. Basically, it's going to be a painful localized infection of the fingers, okay? And it's usually going to be from the, patient, the individual inoculating themselves. Sometimes they can have a vesicular and pustular with a local erythema pain and drainage. So usually, what's the clinical diagnosis for herpes simplex virus? What are you going to see? So it's usually described like a dewdrop on a rose petal. So it's going to be a vesicle on an erythematous base. That's why it's called a dewdrop on a rose petal. Because we have the rose petal, it's red, and then you put a drop on there, it's clear. That's why it's basically a vesicle on an erythematous base. How are you going to diagnose these patients? So... The gold standard is going to be the culture of the herpes simplex virus. Basically, you're going to swab the base of the ulcer, but the PCR is usually more sensitive than culture. Sometimes you might get questioned uh, telling you that there's that they did a zinc smear and they saw multinucleated giant cells. You can think about herpes simplex virus with this one. Okay, this one zinc smear is usually quick, but it doesn't tell you. It tells you that it's from the herpes simplex family, but you don't know if it's going to be varicella zoster virus or herpes simplex virus. That's why we do the culture of our HI, uh, herpes simplex virus, which is going to be the gold standard, but the PCR is going to be the most sensitive than the culture. And then, of course, the treatment is going to be oral acyclovir, your antiretrovirals, right? So what are some of the complications if the patient gets, doesn't get this treated? So we, the patient could get herpes simplex virus keratitis, which is like the tearing, the pain, erythema, conjunctival uh, swelling. So it's going to be involving the eye. Also, how I've seen this um, described on question is, is that they'll say there's um, dendritic lesions on the eye. So usually when I read that, I'm like, okay, that has to do with herpes simplex virus keratitis. And then herpes encephalitis, where it can cause personality changes. Um, the patient is not going to be alert. They're going to have seizures, fever. Okay, so that's why it's really important that we treat herpes simplex virus. So once again, herpes simplex virus tends to involve like anywhere on the face. And you treat that with oral acyclovir. It's usually going to be described like a dewdrop on a rose petal or a vesicle on an erythematous base. Okay, uh, Culture of this herpes simplex virus is going to be the gold standard. But PCR is going to be more sensitive than the culture. So let's go into general herpes, also known as herpes simplex virus 2. Once again, make sure that you know the difference between them. Sometimes I'll just show you a picture and you need to know that it's herpes simplex virus and it'll, they'll have HSV1 and HSV2. Make sure that you know that it's HSV2 if they show you an area of like a genital, like if it's a vaginal area or anything like that. So general herpes simplex virus 2 is transmitted via sex or from the mother, mother's genital tract during delivery. This one resides in the sacral ganglion. And with these patients, what we need to know is that they can also reactivate the herpes. They can reactivate it similar to how herpes simplex virus one is reactivated. So if the patient is stressed out, if they had a fever, even if they were exposed to UV light, okay? if they lost weight loss or if they gained weight, if they're immunosuppressed. So primary... Um, what's going to be the primary way that this is going to present? So it's usually going to present as severe prolonged symptoms that are lasting up to three weeks. If it's recurrent, it's a lot mild and shorter. So if it's the first infection the patient has had, it's going to be a very severe infection and it's going to, the symptoms are going to last a long time for up to th three weeks versus if it's recurrent, it'll be milder shorter in duration and it'll go away in 10 days but in general the patient is going to present similar to herpes simplex virus one except it's going to be in the genital area right 
they're gonna have fever, headache, malaise, uh, they're gonna have these very painful vesicles, pustules or ulcers that are in the perianal area or in the genitals. They're gonna have itching, painful urination, sometimes they'll have multiple of these vesicles. They're also gonna be presenting with tender inguinal lymphadenopathy and vaginal and or urethral discharge. Some of the signs that you'll see once you do your physical sign is that you'll see these tender vesicles that rupture and You'll see small ulcers on an erythematous base which crest over. That's usually pathognomonic. Whenever I see something that it's a vesicle that crests over, I want to think about something that's from the herpes simplex virus, okay? So just make sure that you have that in the back of your mind. And how are you going to diagnose these patients? Usually as a clinical diagnosis, you can do a Zank smear. And then once again, what's going to be seen on the Zank smear if it's from the herpes simplex family? You're going to see multinucleated giant cells, okay? And then you can culture the active lesion if it's present. Once again, the treatment's gonna be oral acyclovir for these patients. So let's go into our next one. Let's go into cryptococcus pneumonia. So cryptococcus pneumonia, uh, the most common cause of cryptococcus uh, pneumonia is going to be cryptococcus neoformans, okay? This one's very commonly found in patients that are immunosuppressed, especially the patients that have AIDS. It's basically caused by a budding yeast that's found in the soil that's contaminated with dried pigeon dung, cockroaches or bird droppings. It's very gross, right? So with these patients, how is this transmitted? So like I said, it's very commonly found in patients that are immunocompromised. So the patients that have uh, AIDS, if their CD4 count is less than 100, they're more prone to getting cryptococcus pneumonia. So make sure that you know that you are definitely gonna have a question on that. So if a patient has AIDS and they have a CD4 count that's less than 100, they're more prone to getting these type of pneumonias. And it's a type of fungal yeast pneumonia. It's also very commonly found in patients that also I said, if they're immunocompromised, whether they're taking immunosuppressants or if they had organ transplants. And it makes sense, right? So I just finished my rotation for my nephrology rotation. It was a great rotation. I loved it. And my doctor, of course, nephrologist, he treated a lot of patients that had kidney transplants. And most of the patients that he treated were on cyclosporin or immunosuppressants. So with these immunosuppressants, he has to be checking them regularly because with immunosuppressants, it makes you in an immunocompromised state. So you're more prone to getting these type of infections, okay? So just make sure that you have that in your back of the mind. You know, question stem, the patient may not have AIDS, but they may, it might say that the patient just had like a kidney transplant or a liver transplant. So how is this patient going to present? Basically, they're gonna be presenting with a fever. It's gonna be, they're gonna be presenting with a productive cough. They're gonna be presenting with dyspnea, so trouble breathing headache, weight loss, pleuritic chest pain also. And then on exam, you might see pleural fusions and lymphadenopathy. And how are we gonna diagnose these patients? Basically, we're gonna diagnose them with a chest x-ray. We're also gonna do, on the chest x-ray, we're gonna see a solitary or multiple nodules, granulomas, and patchy pneumonitis. Also, what's going to confirm basically that the patient has cryptococcus, so we've done the x-ray, we're going to do an India ink prep. This is going to confirm it. So we're going to see variable pleocytosis. And we're also going to see increased opening pressure. So once again, we're going to see the India. We're going to do the India ink prep of the cerebral spinal fluid. This is going to be what's going to confirm it. I think I had one question on this. So just make sure that you're familiar with this. So because it's, it's very specific for cryptococcus pneumoforms. Okay. So India Inc. Prep confirms basically that the patient has cryptococcus pneumonia, okay? And then of course, treatment is going to be, you can give them oral fluconazole, or if it's severe, then you can give them amphotericin B. So I'm gonna say a quick story about this. So my doctor was, um, so I'm currently during my family rotation. My doctor, we had a patient that came in and she had she was being, she, the doctor had already told me the history about the patient. The patient was complaining of severe shoulder pain. He had already sent her for MRIs and exams and referred her. And this patient just had really bad shoulder pain. They couldn't find the cause. They thought it was just severe arth arthritis, arthritic pain. 
And so she had really severe pain where she couldn't really raise her, her shoulder or move it or anything like that. Anyways, so then she got cryptococcus pneumonia. She got this type of pneumonia and my doctor treated her with amphotericin B. And usually when you're on amphotericin B for this, it's usually a week, several week long treatment. So when this patient was on amphotericin B, it was interesting that she, her, her shoulder pain went away. And so like when we'd see her and follow up with her, like she could like lift her arm up and like move it back and forth. I mean, like she was like, look down here, look what I can do with my arm. And she was like moving it. Like she had no issues. And so we were just in shock. And then once she finished the amphotericin B and she completed the regimen and then the pneumonia was wrong, was gone then the arthritis came back again so she couldn't move she was back to where she was before she started the amphotericin b so she wanted the doctor to keep her on the amphotericin b but of course the doctor didn't but i just thought that was a really really interesting case hopefully this case helps you like usually when i talk about cases during the videos it sometimes helps you cement the the topic that we're talking about so you can think about it whenever you're taking the exam so i just thought that was interesting so once again uh cryptococcus Pneumonia, it's a type of yeast infection. Um, with these patients, it's gonna be more commonly found in patients that are immunocompromised. So those patients that have AIDS and they have a CD4 count less than what? CD4 count less than 100. And then also these patients that are transplant patients, okay? The patient's gonna be presenting with symptoms of basically pneumonia, so your cough, your dyspnea, your headache. Also with these patients, what we're going to do is we're going to do a chest x-ray and then on the chest x-ray, that's where we're going to see the solitary or multiple nodules and granulomas. But what's going to confirm the diagnosis is going to be an India prep of the cerebral spinal fluid. We're going to treat these patients with oral fluconazole and if it's severe, amphotericin B. So now that we're done with this one, why don't we go on to the next one, pneumocystis pneumonia. So pneumocystis pneumonia used to be called pneumocystis uh, I think it was pneumocystis carini pneumonia. And I actually just got pimped on this like two weeks ago by my nephrologist. He was trying to give a patient prophylaxis for uh, PCP. And like I said, my nephrologist handles a lot of transplant patients. And usually when they're transplant, you immunocompromise them. And sometimes he, he will give them prophylaxis for like pneumocystis uh, pneumonia. So he told me, he was asking, he's like, I don't remember if it's, uh, what's a new name? And then I was like, I think it's a pneumocystis carini pneumonia. And he was like, no, it's not that, that's the old one. And he was right. So the new name is uh, pneumocystis uh, jurevicki. And this is caused by a fungus found in the lungs of mammals. And like I said, it's most, most common opportunistic infection in patients that are immunocompromised, especially those patients that have HIV and AIDS, okay? So how are these patients going to present? They're going to be presenting with fever, shortness of breath. They're going to have a non-productive cough, okay? Non-productive cough. And then they're also going to be presenting with weakness, weight loss, and fatigue. So what are we going to do to diagnose these patients? Usually our chest x-ray is going to be definitive for these patients. They're going to be presenting with diffuse or perihilar infiltrates, reticular interstitial pneumonia, or airspace disease that mimics pulmonary edema. Usually with the pneumocystis pneumonia, it's like the bat sign, right? The bat wing sign when you see the x-ray. Because it's perihilar infiltrates and reticular interstitial pneumonia. You can also do a sputum right GMC stain, but usually the definitive one's going to be your chest x-ray. How are you going to treat these patients? You're going to treat them with Bactrim. And Bactrim is also the same thing that you use for prophylaxis for these patients. So... What if the patient has a sulfa allergy, okay? Because Bactrim is made up of what? Sulfa methoxazone trimethoprim, right? It might throw this question in. This is why I am mentioning it. If the patient has a sulfa allergy, then we're going to give them Dapsone, okay? If not, then it's going to be Bactrim. So make sure that you're reading the questions carefully. Sometimes that will get to me because I'm trying to go through the exam as quickly as I can because I know I have 60 minutes and I want to spend time on the questions that are a little bit longer. But make sure that you're reading through the questions because sometimes you're reading through and you're like, okay, I got it. And then once you're at the end, they'll throw a curveball and they'll be like, okay, well, this patient's allergic to sulfa medications. You're like, okay, well, what am I going to do now? You're going to give them Dapsone, okay? Dapsone if the patient is allergic to sulfa. And once again, any patient that has a CD4 count that's less than 200 are more prone to getting the pneumocystis pneumonia. So with these patients, what you want to do is that you want to give them prophylaxis of Bactrim. 
Okay guys, so let's go into HIV. You will definitely have a question on HIV, okay? So what we need to know about HIV is that HIV infects cells expressing CD4 antigens, okay? How is it transmitted? So it's transmitted from blood to blood. Also, it can be transmitted with vaginal or anal intercourse. And it can also be transmitted from IV exposure and perinatal exposure also. So how are these patients going to present? Basically, most of them are asymptomatic. And then once they start having symptoms of like primary HIV infection, they're gonna be presenting with symptoms of fever, night sweats, weight loss, skin lesions, pharyngitis, swollen lymph nodes, uh, last six days of weeks. So that's why if we have a patient that comes in and um, they present with these symptoms, we wanna make sure that we're very thorough when we ask them questions. Sometimes I know it's a little difficult to ask questions about their sexual life, but I ask them about their sexual life. Are they sexually active with men, women, both, okay? And do they use protection? So what are the, some of the signs that the patient's going to be presenting with? They're going to have hairy leukoplakia. They'll have disseminated Kaposi sarcoma, which is very common in these patients with HIV. Cutaneous bacillary uh, angiomatosis and generalized lymphadenopathy also. So how are we going to work these patients up? Basically, we're going to do an HIV ELISA, and then the confirmatory one is going to be the Western blot for these patients. We can also do a CBC because we want to make sure that we look for anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. And then we want to look at their absolute CD4 lymphocyte count. This is going to tell you whether HIV is progressing or not. And we're going to monitor this every three to six months. And then, of course, we want to do a chest x-ray. This is to rule out, remember, the things that we discussed that are very commonly found in patients that have HIV or AIDS. So the common like pneumonias, like your pneumocystis pneumonia, your cryptococcus pneumonia and then of course we want to do a blood culture if they have a fever that's greater than 38.5 degrees celsius and how are we going to treat these patients basically what we want to do is that we want to start treatment regardless of the cd4 count that they have and we also want to make sure basically our primary goal in treating these patients that have hiv is complete suppression of the viral replication. So we wanna make sure that these patients have a low viral load, okay? And then we're gonna start them on combo therapy with at least three medications from at least two classes of the antiretroviral medications. So once again, we wanna make sure that we're treating them with at least three medications from at least two different classes. Another thing I wanted to discuss is basically that any patient that's placed on a protease inhibitor or NRTIs, okay, which are the medications for your HIV and AIDS, they should have a fasting serum cholesterol, LDL, and triglyceride levels checked annually. And the reason why is because these medications can actually increase your uh, cholesterol, so they can cause hypercholesterolemia with these patients. So let's go into prophylaxis basically for common opportunistic infections in HIV in patients, positive patients. So this is very, very highly tested on the exam. I don't think I had any questions on the treatment for HIV, like the NRTIs and then NNRTIs and proteus inhibitors and all that. I didn't have questions on those. So that's why if you notice, I'm not spending too much time on the treatment. Just make sure that the patient is going to be treated with basically a combo therapy with at least three medications from at least two different classes. But what is heavily tested when I was studying is basically what's a prophylaxis for common opportunistic infections, and then when do they present, at what CD4 count they present. So this is why I'm gonna go over that. So patient that has any CD4 count, okay, they've been diagnosed with HIV, any CD4 count, is basically more prone to getting Kaposi sarcoma, pulmonary tuberculosis, herpes zoster, bacterial pneumonia, and lymphoma. So once again, Kaposi sarcoma, any CD4 level, pulmonary tuberculosis, herpes zoster, bacterial pneumonia, and lymphoma. Now, if a patient has a CD4 count that's less than 250, they're more prone to getting esophageal candidiasis, 
herpes simplex virus, and then a patient that has a CD4 count that's less than 200, they're more prone to getting what? PCP pneumonia or PJP pneumonia, which is a new, new name, the pneumocystis pneumonia. If they have a CD4 count less than 100, they're more prone to getting uh, cerebral toxoplasmosis, HIV encephalopathy, cryptococcus, miliary tuberculosis, and then if it's less than 50 with their CD4 count, they're more prone to getting CMV retinitis and mycobacterium avian complex for these patients. So once again, make sure that you know these. I'm actually going to go through them one more time, but we're actually going to go now uh, through the prophylaxis for common opportunistic infections in HIV positive patients. And then I'm just going to say a quick story just so uh, you can sediment this in your mind. So there's a really good movie called And the Band Played On. I think it's made in the 1990s, 1994. It's called And the Band Played On. It's a really good movie. I really, really recommend it. Um, if you've seen this entire long EOR discussion, I discuss several movies that are pertinent to, pertinent to whatever topic we're top, talking about. And I always did that when I was studying because it was a form of enjoyment for me and then a form of relaxation, but it also allowed me to cement whatever topic I was studying. So for during my pediatrics rotation, there's a really good documentary on Netflix. It's called the, it's called the Gabriel Fernandez trial. It's basically a very severe case of abuse, um, child abuse. Uh, so I watched this during my pediatric rotation because I was in clinic and my doctor had recommended it. And so I watched it just basically to see and how to see what signs present in a patient that in a child that's being abused. So I watched this uh, documentary series and it really solidified that in my brain. And when I was studying the HIV topic, which is, I still find it very, very difficult and a very difficult concept, especially when it comes down to the drugs, because the drugs are very new. I watched the movie and it's called And the Band Played On. It's a really, really good movie. I really recommend it. It's basically about what happened when the AIDS and HIV epidemic happened here in the US and how it started, how the doctors were seeing all these patients and how these patients presented. So these patients presented with these symptoms of pneumocystis gergicke pneumonia, which these doctors were just like in awe. They presented with uh, toxoplasmosis gondii, which is basically a parasitic infection that's not very common. And these patients were presenting with that and they couldn't find the cause. Why were these patients were presenting with all these? And not only that, their CD4 count was so low and what was causing their CD4 count low. They were presenting with Kaposi sarcoma and these patients were dying. And so it's a really, really good documentary, a really, um, documentary movie. I really recommend it for those of you that have time. You know, just uh, just give yourself a treat. That's what I would do usually when I studied a long time. I would then at the end of the day, I would watch a movie that was something pertinent to whatever I was studying. And it really helped me sediment that topic in my mind. So I really recommend that. It talks about HIV and the AIDS epidemic and how they struggled to find treatment and how they struggled to name the disease, and also how they came up with the name of uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome and then human immunodeficiency virus. So how they come up with those names. I really recommend this so if you have time. It's a really good watch. Okay, guys, so going back, I'm sorry, I went into a rant. Going back, talking about the prophylaxis for common opportunistic infections in HIV-positive patients. So PCP, we said that was more commonly found in patients that have the CD4 count less than what? CD4 count less than 200 or PJP. What's going to be the treatment for these patients? Bactrim is going to be both the treatment and the prophylaxis for these patients. If they're allergic to sulfa and they have pneumocystis gerbic pneumonia, then we're going to give them Dapsone, okay? What about toxoplasmosis? So this is a parasitic infection. This is a really, really interesting parasitic infection. So if we have time, uh, definitely look it up, but basically it's transmitted. It's most commonly found in the, so it's commonly found in the feces of cats and it's also very commonly found in contaminated food. So it gets, it can cause very serious complications for patients that are pregnant. So that's why they say to not handle cat litter with these patients that are pregnant or also patients that are immunocompromised like once again, these patients have AIDS or HIV. 
So toxoplasmosis, with these patients, you're going to have a CD4 count less than 100. This is where they're more prone to getting toxoplasmosis. Treatment for this is going to be with Bactrim again. And then we have Mycobacterium avian complex, CD4 count less than 75. And then we're going to give patients azithromycin for this. And then we have cytomegalovirus, CMV, CMV usually retinitis. With these patients, it's more going to be more commonly found if they have a CD4 count less than 50 and treatment's going to be with a Bactrim. And then we have Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Usually with these patients, they're going to have a positive PPD, of course. And then how are we going to treat these patients? Uh, we're going to give them the INH and perox pyridoxine for 9 to 12 months, okay? So... Now let's go into AIDS. So we discussed HIV, let's go into AIDS now. So usually with, with AIDS, the diagnosis for these patients is when they have a CD4 count that's less than what? CD4 count that's less than 200 with these patients, okay? So that's why we, when a patient gets HIV, we wanna make sure that we are uh, monitoring their CD4 count and seeing where it's at because once they get at 200, it's um, less than 200, it's classified as AIDS. And then once they have AIDS, they tend to start having these diseases that are commonly found in patients that have AIDS, like we talked about, uh, PCP, your mycobacterium avium complex, toxoplasmosis, all these diseases. So with these patients, like I said, that have AIDS, they're going to be presenting with all these diseases. Um, also, Kaposi's sarcoma is very common in these patients. Remember I discussed this uh, this was what was commonly seen when I watched the movie. Uh, in these patients that came in, they were coming in with a Kaposi's sarcoma and it happened at any age. And basically what is Kaposi's sarcoma? They tend to have these lesions that appear everywhere. So they can appear on the eyelids, conjunctiva, pinna, uh, palate, the toe webs. And these lesions are usually like a purplish color and they're non-blanching papules or nodules. And they tend to go away once the patient is placed on uh, art therapy, so the, your antiretrovirals. These patients can also present with lymphoma of the brain. Also, a common one is a primary non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This one's very commonly found in patients that have uh, HIV and AIDS. And then, of course, like we discussed, uh, tuberculosis. They also can present with HIV wasting syndrome, which is due to decreased caloric intake and increased metabolic rate. So these patients are really, really, they're losing a lot of weight. They're very skinny. They're very frail. Um, they're basically anorexic. They have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And then once again, the treatment for HIV wasting syndrome is going to be art therapy. We're going to treat if they have any underlying opportunistic infections like that we discussed. We want to make sure that we're giving them food supplements, including a TPN, and then also growth hormones and anabolic steroids. Okay. So once again, the diagnosis for these patients, for a patient that has AIDS, is a CD4 count that's less than 200 or a CD4 count that's less than 14%. With these patients, they're going to be treated with the antiretroviral therapy, right? So the ART therapy, antiretroviral therapy for these patients. So AIDS, CD4 count less than 200, and they're going to be presenting with the signs of AIDS, uh, usually these um opportunistic infections like we discussed, which are PCP, your CMV retinitis, your toxoplasmosis, and, uh, toxoplasmosis, etc. And like I said, I really, really recommend that movie. It's called And the Band Played On, a great movie. It'll help sediment that in your brain. Okay, so the next one's gonna be influenza. influenza. So influenza is caused by a virus from the orthomyxoviruses. So it's caused by an orthomyxovirus. It's very contagious, okay? And we have two types, right? Well, we have three strains. We have A, B, and C. Influenza A is more pathogenic, and this one has major mutations that can cause antigenic shifts. It can also cause minor mutations, which can cause um, antigenic, antigenic drifts, okay? So... Clinical manifestations, how is the patient going to present if they have influenza? So they're going to have, of course, the symptoms of an abrupt fever, and they're going to be presenting with chills, malaise, muscle aches. They'll have a fever that lasts just one to seven days, and it's going to be accompanied by a non-productive cough, so it's going to be a dry cough, coryza, 
photophobia. They might also be presenting with sore throat, uh, burning eyes, flushed faces, wheezing, ronchi also can be heard. They'll have cervical lymphadenopathy and then sometimes children present with diarrhea with these patients. They'll also be complaining of joint aches, muscle aches. How are we gonna diagnose these patients? Uh, basically, we're gonna do a PCR. This is basically the most sensitive and specific and it'll tell you what type of flu the patient has, influenza A or B. They usually say that the A one is the worst one. So how are we gonna treat these patients? Basically, we're gonna treat them with supportive care, of course, because it's what? It's a viral infection. So we're gonna give them something like NSAIDs and Tylenol, NSAIDs for the pain, Tylenol. And then also we can give these patients um, basically our neuroaminidase inhibitors, which are our uh, <clears throat> Zanemavir or also Tamavir, okay, which are Tamiflu, right? But usually these are only initiated within two days of onset. So if the patient has been having symptoms for more than two days, we don't really give these. So make sure that you know this. You're definitely going to have a question on this on your exam. It'll be a patient and the symptoms been going on for more than three days and then it'll have Tamiflu on there or Osotamivir. Do not choose that because it's only used within two days, right? For Tamiflu or Osotamivir. But what you can use that's effective for up to five days after onset is your like adamantine agent. So amantadine and romantadine is what you can use if the patient's been having symptoms up to five days, okay? So what are some of the complications of Influenza, of course, bacterial pneumonias. Why? Because usually what does a virus do to your body? It makes you more immunocompromised. So that's when you, bacteria takes advantage of your lungs and you can get bacterial pneumonia. Another one that's very common is a Rice syndrome. And this one's usually if a child is given aspirin. So this is why we don't give aspirin in children, except for what? We only give aspirin in children if they have Kawasaki's, okay? So only if they have Kawasaki's is when aspirin is indicated in patients, okay? Well, children. But besides that, we do not give aspirin. So the reason why is because the patient can get Rice syndrome, okay? And it's a fatty liver with encephalopathy. It develops two to three weeks after the onset of influenza or varicella infection, especially if the patient was given aspirin. How's the patient going to present? Vomiting, lethargy, seizures, hypoglycemia, elevated liver enzymes, and ammonia levels. They'll have changes in mental status and then increase PTT. Okay? So make sure that you know this. You are definitely going to get a question on Rice syndrome. I had a question actually on my pack rat like a few weeks ago and I was able to pick it out because it said that the patient had just it didn't tell you that the patient was given aspirin but you knew it was a child that they just had influenza and they were presenting with these symptoms of like uh, lethargy ultramental status uh, hypoglycemia seizures like fatty liver with encephalopathy and I'm like okay that's Rice syndrome and it was so treatment for this is going to be supportive usually for Rice syndrome all right, guys, so let's go into our next one. So next one's going to be Lyme disease, okay? Oh, I love Lyme disease. I love anything that's infectious diseases. So this is actually one of my favorite topics to discuss. So I'm sorry if I'm talking too much. So Lyme disease. How is a patient with Lyme disease going to present? So Lyme disease is more commonly found in the northeastern seaboard, okay? the Midwest and the West Coast. With these patients, Lyme disease, what you need to know is that it's transmitted by a tick, okay? It's transmitted by a tick. And it's caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. So make sure that you know that. Sometimes they'll give you a vignette and you know that it is Lyme disease and then they don't have Lyme disease on there. It'll tell you what is, what what causes what organism causes this and you need to know that it's borrelia burgdorferi it's a spirochete sometimes even you won't even put borrelia burgdorferi they'll just put a spirochete as an answer so make sure you know it's a spirochete borrelia burgdorferi it's caused by a tick it's more commonly found in the northeastern seaboard so like maine to maryland also in the midwest west coast okay so I'm currently here in Texas, I live in Texas. I don't think we have any cases that I know of of Lyme disease that I've seen yet, 
or that I've heard from a doctor that they've told me, unless the doctor, of course, worked in a different state, but no. So there's different stages of Lyme disease and let's go through each one, okay? So stage one is gonna be the first stage. Usually this patient's gonna present two to four weeks after they've gotten the bite from the tick. And the hallmark for this is gonna be erythema migraines, okay? Erythema migraines. That's usually pathognomonic for Lyme disease. So if you see that on the question, you're thinking about uh, Lyme disease. So basically what this is, it's a large, painless, well-demarcated target-shaped lesion on the trunk where it's most commonly found, but sometimes it can be in the groin, the axilla, or the thigh. I've seen it in question stems where it's on the axilla and it throws me off, but usually it's more commonly found on the trunk. It's a painless target shaped and it's well demarcated lesion okay that's stage one stage two this is where it's disseminated this tends to happen days to weeks the patient's going to be presenting with flu symptoms so they're going to have this headaches they're going to have the fever the muscle aches the malaise the fatigue the chills the stiff neck and with these patients <clears throat> after several weeks in stage two they can also present with symptoms of Bell's palsy, okay? That's another thing that you need to know is that Bell's palsy is associated with um, Lyme disease. So Bell's palsy is associated with Lyme disease. And then within weeks to months, a patient can also present with an AV block, carditis or pericarditis. So they start having cardiac symptoms. So once again, this is all in stage two. So stage two, you have your flu-like symptoms, and then you have your Bell's palsy, and then within weeks to months, the patient can present with AV block or carditis. So sometimes they'll just give you an EKG. You have to know it's a, a block. You see it's a block on the EKG, and then they give you a vignette of a patient that traveled or they were outside in the mountains, and that's when you know it's related to Lyme disease. And then finally, the, the third stage, the late stage, this is where the patient has been having this for months to years. So late persistent infection, they're gonna have arthritis, usually in the large joints like the knee. They also are gonna have a central nervous system disease, okay? They can have mild encephalitis, transverse myelitis. So how are we gonna diagnose these patients? Basically, what we wanna do is that we wanna do ELISA. ELISA is usually gonna be done in the first month and to confirm it, we're gonna do a Western blot, okay? Once again, ELISA and a Western blot is going to be used for confirmation. How are we gonna treat these patients? We're basically going to give them oral doxycycline, okay? So oral doxycycline, and for these patients, if they're pregnant or if the child is less than 12 years old, then we can give them amoxicillin, okay? Once again, treatment for this is gonna be what? Doxycycline. Cycling, doxycycline, and it's oral doxycycline for 21 days. If it's a child or if it's a pregnant woman, if it's a child less than 12 years old, then you're going to give them amoxicillin, okay? Amoxicillin. Once again, treatment's doxycycline, but if the patient is a child less than 12 or if it's a pregnant woman, then we're going to give amoxicillin, okay? So once again, just to recap, Lyme disease, it's going to be caused by a tick. Okay, usually in the question stem, the patient's gonna be outside and the, they were like hiking or outside in the forest, etc. And then they're presenting with these this rash, okay? So it's gonna be caused by a tick. It's usually found in the Northeastern seaboard, Midwest or West Coast. It's caused by a spirochrete Borrelia burgdorferi. And there's different stages. Usually the first stage and the one that you'll see described on your question stem is where the patient presents with this target-shaped lesion. It's large, it's painless, and it's well demarcated. It's gonna be found on the trunk. This one's called erythema migraines or erythema chronicum migraines, okay? And then in stage two, they're gonna be presenting with flu-like symptoms. This is where it's disseminated, okay? So the first stage is just localized. The second stage, it's already disseminated. So these patients are also gonna be presenting with Bell's palsy, and then once it's been weeks to months, they're going to be presenting with symptoms of cardiac symptoms. So you'll have your AV block, your carditis. And then stage three, which is like the late stage where it's been already months to years, these patients are going to be presenting with arthritis, okay? Arthritis.
<clears throat> treatment is going to be with what? Treatment is going to be with doxy uh, doxycycline, oral doxycycline. And then if it's a child or if it's a pregnant woman, the child is less than 12 years old, we're going to give them moxicillin, okay? And then the clinical diagnosis is going to be done with what? A Western blot for definitive diagnosis. And you can also do an ELISA in the first month. Okay, so that is Lyme disease. So let's go on to our next one, which is going to be our Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So this one's found in the southwest, I'm sorry, southeast, southeast, Midwest, and Western U.S. It's transmitted by what? A tick. It's going to be a dog tick. And the bacteria that causes it, it's Rickettsia rickettsii. So make sure that you do not confuse this with Lyme disease. Lyme disease is it's called by Borrelia burgdorferi. Rocky Mountain Spotted Disease is called by Rickett, caused by Rickettsia rickettsii. I memorize as R and R, right? Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever has an R. Plus, it sounds like Rickettsia, Rocky Rickettsia, Rickettsia rickettsii. So how is this patient going to present? You usually have symptoms within one week of being bitten by a tick. And they're going to be presenting with a sudden onset of fever, chills, or have a headache, photophobia, nausea vomiting, malaise myalgias, They'll have thrombocytopenia and also hyponatremia. They'll have a, a papular rash that's going to present after the fever. And it begins usually with this rash peripherally. So it's going to start in the wrists, the forearms, the ankles, and then it's going to spread centrally to the rest of the body. So to the rest of the limbs, the trunk, and the face. So it begins as a maculopapular rash, so non blanchian petechial rash. And it can lead to several things, respiratory failure and or CNS involvement. So with this rash, what we need to know and how it's commonly described is that it starts in the wrists. I've read it and it says the patient has a rash and noticed it that it started in the wrist and it started on the forearms or the ankles and then it spread everywhere else versus your rash for Lyme's disease, right? It's just a target rash and it's usually on the trunk, that's it. This one, no, it's a rash, it starts on the wrists, the ankles, and the forearms, and then it spreads centrally to the rest of the body, okay? So that's how you can differentiate between these two. So, what's gonna be the diagnosis for these patients? We're gonna do labs for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. We're gonna do labs, and it's gonna be elevated LFTs, like I discussed, thrombocytopenia also, hyponatremia, and what's going to be the confirmatory test? It's basically an immunofluorescent staining of the skin biopsy that's going to tell us that the patient had Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. What's going to be the treatment with these patients? It's going to be doxycycline, 100 milligrams orally twice a day for seven days. Okay, so once again, doxycycline for these patients. And with this one, this is the one where you can you can give doxycycline to patients that are for, for children. This is the only one that you give doxycycline for for children, okay? Versus uh, Lyme disease, you can give amoxicillin for children. With this one, it's always doxycycline. Okay? Well, according to the book I'm reading, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, most of the questions that I've had, it's doxycycline, no matter if it's a child, okay? Because this is where <clears throat> you want to make sure that you're treating the disease because this one can be deadly. So once again... Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, it's caused by a tick, a dog tick. It, it's caused by the bacteria uh, called Rickettsia rickettsii. This patient, usually how they describe it, it's going to be a rash that started in the wrists, the forearms, and the ankles, and then it spread to the rest of the body, okay? It's going to be a maxillopapular rash that's non-blanching with particular rash. And this patient is going to have elevated LFTs and thrombocytopenia on labs. You're going to treat this with doxycycline no matter if they are a child. Okay. Now, if they're pregnant, then you can treat them with chloramphenicol. But I don't think I've had a question with a patient that's pregnant and they had Rocky Mountain spider fever disease. It's usually it's a child or an adult. So doxycycline, no matter a child or an adult, versus Lyme disease, it's going to be amoxicillin, right? If the child is less than 12, some textbooks I've read say less than 8, but just know if it's a child. Okay, guys, so let's go into our parasitic infections, my favorite. So parasitic infections. For those of you who like to listen to podcasts, I really recommend the podcast called This Week in Parasitology. He has a parasitologist in there and a virolog virologist and infectious disease doctor. Basically, what they do is that they go through cases, like parasitic cases, and the infectious disease doctor, he travels all over the world. 
and he does a lot of work in rural countries and he sees a lot of parasitic infections. So they go through a case in each episode and they try to dissect the case and I, I, I love it because it's, it's really, really cool. I like parasites and I like infectious diseases. So he talks about some weird stuff that you never learn in PA school. So I really, really recommend that podcast. It's called This Week in Parasitology. I'm going to add the link below. Okay. So parasitic infections. So let's start with cryptosporidiosis, which is caused by cry cryptosporidium. Okay. So with these patients, uh, how are they going to present? It's transmitted uh, fecal oral. They're going to be presenting with water diarrhea. We're going to do a stool sample. We're going to see OO sites. And basically, the treatment is supportive for these patients. Next one's going to be amoeba amoebiosis, which is caused by an amoeba. It's the most common one. It's going to be intamoeba histolytica. This one's transmitted fecal orally, uh, usually in contaminated water, food. And then also, how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with bloody diarrhea, tenismus, right, where it's that rectal heaving, abdominal pain, and then also... They may or not present, may or may not present to with liver abscess because this intamoeba histolytica, this um, amoeba likes to go to the liver. So treatment for this is going to be, uh, I'm sorry, the diagnosis is going to be with a stool sample. You're going to do what? Once again, uh, trophozoites, and then treatment is going to be iodoquinol or peromycin, and then flagell for the liver abscess. Next one's giardiasis. So this one's very, very highly tested. So make sure that you are familiar with this one, okay? So giardiasis is caused by Giardia lamlia. It's a parasite, once again, because we're under parasitic infections. It's extra protozoa. So this one is transmitted fecal oral, food or water, or person to person, okay? This one's the one that presents with that fatty, foul-smelling diarrhea. How is it going to present? It's going to be the fatty diarrhea. It's not going to be bloody. It's going to be a chronic diarrhea where the patient presents with cramps. They're going to have nausea, anorexia, malaise, bloating, and flatulence also. Basically, in the question when you're reading it, it's very common that it's going to say that the patient just went on a camping trip and they were drinking water from like the stream. I even saw one where they were like canoeing and they were drinking water from a stream. So the patient's going to be presenting water diarrhea. Um, and usually with these, with this type of protozoan infection, they're going to be presenting with weight loss also. How are you going to diagnose them? So if you notice the trend for all of these parasitic infections, we want to do a stool sample. And then depending on what we see on the stool sample, it's going to tell us what the cause is. So this one's going to present with cysts or trophozoites. And usually for this, the treatment for these patients, it's going to be supportive. If you do put them on an antibiotic, you can give them tinidazole, which is going to be first line. Okay? Tinidazole first line for these patients for giardiasis. So once again, giardiasis is gonna be that fatty diarrhea. It's not bloody, it's very foul smelling, okay? It's a chronic diarrhea. The patient's gonna be presenting with flatulence, bloating. And then also the, on the question stem, it'll say that the patient was just on a camping trip or the patient was drinking from a water stream, okay? Treatment's usually supportive, but if you do need to give them an antibiotic, you would give them something like a tinidazole for these patients. I've also seen some questions say metronidazole, but I think it's been, the reason why they're switching in onto uh, tinidazole is because it's been a little resistant to metronidazole. So whichever one's on there, if it's metronidazole, then choose metronidazole. If it's tinidazole and they have metronidazole also on there, then choose tinidazole. So next one's gonna be roundworms, ascariasis. So the common one's gonna be ascaritis lumbricoides. This is a type of nematode. So when we think about parasitic infections, there's different types. So this one's a, a nematode, okay? This one's transmitted from ingestion of human, human feces, whether it's through water or food. And usually with these patients, how they're gonna present is that they can be asymptomatic and symptomatic. If they're, if they're symptomatic, they're gonna pre be presenting with postprandial abdominal pain. They're gonna be presenting with vomiting. Sometimes these worms can be so big that they can actually obstruct certain parts of the body i know gross right so they can get so big or there can be so many that they can obstruct so they can obstruct usually the pancreatic duct they can obstruct the common bile duct also and then of course anywhere in the bowel how are you going to diagnose this once again we're going to do a stool sample and we're going to see eggs or adults worms that's gross we're going to treat this with albendazole or mebendazole 
okay? Albendazole or mebendazole for these patients with roundworms escherichias. Next one's gonna be our hookworm. Uh, there's two common causes of hookworms. It's gonna be ankylostoma duodenale or Necatora marcanus. So this one's transmitted from what happens is that these patients invade the skin and they go to the lung and they go to the lung, we cough and we swallow them and then they will stay in the intestine. Usually these patients are asymptomatic. If they do have symptoms, they're gonna be presenting with cough. Another sign is gonna be malabsorption, which makes sense because if they're in the intestine, the worms are just gonna be eating everything and all the nutrients that you're getting. So that's why these patients can present with weight loss or malabsorption. Another thing is that once you do lab works, remember if we do lab works and we see any type of xenophilia, we wanna think about an allergic reaction or a parasitic infection. So they're gonna be presenting with xenophilia and also they can be presenting with anemia because what does this type of hookworm do is that it colonizes with this uh, hookworm is that basically what it does is that it goes to the intestine and it colonizes the intestine, right? So it causes malabsorption, so it can cause anemia. So like your uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, your folate deficiency. What are we gonna see or how are we gonna diagnose these patients? Is that we're gonna do a stool sample and then we're gonna see the adult worms and then we're gonna do mebendisol for these patients. And then this one's very, very highly tested. So I'm gonna emphasize this one, pinworm. What is it caused by? Enterobius vermicularis. So you're gonna get a question that describes pinworm, okay? And then you're gonna know, I know it's pinworm and it's not gonna be pinworm on there. It's gonna be enterobius vermicularis. So make sure that you know the name of it. Enterobius vermicularis pinworm. It's transmitted uh, fecal oral. So basically from the anus, the hands to the mouth, usually patient, that's why it's more commonly found in children because this causes pruritus, so it's very, very itchy in, um, in the anus. So it'll cause perianal pruritus. These patients will itch, and then sometimes they're very, the children like to put their hands in their mouth, and this is how they're incubating themselves. Or, so how's this patient gonna present? Once again, it's gonna be the perianal pruritus, so the itchiness, and it's gonna be worse at night. Why? Because they come out at night. How are you gonna diagnose these patients? You're gonna do a tape test, on the anus and then you're gonna see the eggs on the tape and then you're gonna give them mebendazole. Next one's gonna be our tapeworms. So we have different types. We have our Tania saginata. This is one is going to be the beef tapeworm. It's the one that's commonly found in beef that is not cooked. You have your Tania solium, which is found in uncooked pork or pork that's cooked, but there's hookworms in there. And then we have Diphilobothrium latum, which is the one commonly found in fish. So once again, Tinea saginata, beef, Tinea solium, pork, and then Diphilobothrium latum is going to be in fish. It's transmitted by what? Like I said, raw or undercooked meat. These patients could present similar to asymptomatic. Sometimes they don't even know the worm, they have a worm. They have a really cool show called Monsters Inside Me. And it talks about like the weirdest stuff and usually it's parasites. And some of these patients can have tapeworms and they can't, they could have been infected like years ago and they're just presenting with symptoms now. So it's interesting because they can live in your body. Any type of these parasites can live in your body for a while. So if they are symptomatic, they're gonna be presenting with abdominal pain, nausea, weight loss, which makes sense once again, right? Because these, they're feeding off you. That's why they're called parasites. Also, they can also have anemia, so they can have vitamin B12 deficiency. And then how are we going to diagnose these patients? Basically, we can do the type test for Diphilobothrum latum and then the stool sample where we're going to see the eggs. And usually the treatment is going to be prosequantal for these patients. And then the next one's going to be schistosomiasis. This one's caused, so there's multiple types of schistosomiasis or uh, uh, schistosoma it's from this this parasite. So you have your Schistosoma mansoni, Schistosoma hematimbium, and then Schistosoma japonicum. Japonicum because that's where they found this one was in Japan. It's transmitted basically from contaminated uh, fresh water. So usually with this one, it's usually found in snails. So that's why they, they think that the snails are the causes of the Schistosomiasis. And usually in um, certain like lakes, there's a, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but there's a lake in Africa where they 
they usually in the question stem it'll say that they were swimming in the lake and it's in Africa or somewhere. And this is where they got schistosomiasis. It's usually found in freshwater where these snails are. And that's why they're the culprit of schistosomiasis. So what they do is that they go through the skin. Okay, that's I know you're like walking, you go inside, you're walking in the lake. They go through the skin and what they do is that then they go through the lungs, the portal vein, and the venules of the mesenteric bladder and ureter, uh, uh, ureters. So they go through the skin with these type of parasites. I know that's really, really gross. And they have a female and a male too also. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have dermatitis, localized erythema, pruritic macular papular rash. And it's usually going to present within two, uh, two to eight weeks. And if they have this for two to eight weeks, they're going to be presenting with abdominal pain. They can also be presenting with hepatosplenomegaly, headache, cough, bloody diarrhea, and lymphadenopathy. And basically, you're going to see eggs in the urine or feces, and prosequential is going to be the treatment for this. So from all the ones that we discussed, I know it's a lot. And what we need to know, the common ones are going to be giardiasis. This one's very, very highly tested. Also, your pinworms is going to be very, very highly tested. So make sure that you're familiar with them. Giardiasis, giardia lamellia, right? This one is going to present with an acute, profuse, fatty diarrhea. It's going to be a foul-smelling diarrhea. These patients are also going to be bloated. On the question stem, it'll say that they were somewhere on a stream, like, and they drank water from a stream, or they went on a camping trip. Treatment for this is going to be tinidazole, first line. If they have metronidazole on there, then pick it. If they don't have metronidazole, choose tinidazole. If they have both, choose tinidazole, because I've gotten tricked by that already. Pinworm, the most common cause, the, the cause or the name of the organism is going to be Enterobius vermicularis. This one's very commonly found in children. With this one, the patient's going to be presenting with perianal pruritus, so it's going to be very itchy, itchy in the perianal area, and it's going to be more commonly at night. It's going to be worse at night because these come out at night. These type of parasites come out at night. Treatment for this is going to be with mebendazole, or you can also give a parental pomoite. Okay? So once again, these are the most commonly tested ones. You may or may not get on the questions on the other ones, but I think I've rarely had questions on them. I don't think I've had a question... Maybe I had like one or two, but I mean, the common ones are your pinworms and then your giardiasis. Okay, next one's going to be pertussis. So pertussis is caused by Bordetella pertussis. This is a gram-negative coxobacilli. So make sure you know that. Pertussis, Bordetella pertussis, gram-negative coxobacilli. Okay. This is transmitted via droplets and it's very highly contagious, especially during the catarrhal phase. So there's different phases of the pertussis, whooping cough. So I'm actually going to go through each one, okay? So we had the catarrhal phase. This one lasts one to two weeks. With these patients, like we said, this is the most highly contagious stage is going to be the catarrhal phase. The patient's going to be presenting with a fever, a cough, a rhinorrhea, okay? They're going to be presenting with conjunctival injection and excessive lacrimation. This is going to be stage one, lasts as one to two weeks. If they ask you which one is the most infectious stage, it's going to be the catarrhal phase. And then we have the paroxysmal phase, which lasts two to six weeks. It begins during the second week of illness, and this is where they're going to have that whooping cough, okay? That's why it's called the paroxysmal phase, because they have that <gasps> paroxysmal whooping cough. They're also going to be presenting with inspiratory strider, not expiratory, inspiratory strider for stage two. Stage three is going to be your convalescent phase, lasts one to two weeks, and usually with these, this phase, the patient is already getting better, so they're having reduction in their symptoms. Once again, what's the most infectious stage? It's going to be stage one. The catarrhal phase lasts one to two weeks. What stage is where they're going to be presenting with the whooping cough? Stage two. Last is two to six weeks, and which stage are they uh, basically getting better? It's going to be in the convalescent stage. And also another thing that you want to think about is that usually, of course, when we think about pertussis or the whooping cough, we think about a child, but it's also found in adults. So sometimes they'll trick you like that in the question stems because I had a question that tricked me. If you have a patient, an adult, that has a cough that's persisting for more than two weeks and no other cause, you want to think about pertussis, okay? 
So how is the patient going to present with whooping cough? So they're going to have that whooping cough, right? And it's going to be so bad that they're going to be gagging, okay? Sometimes it'll be even cyanotic. And you'll see that they have trouble breathing. So they have that increased work of breathing. Mm -hmm. How are we going to diagnose these patients? So usually with these diagnoses, the culture is usually going to be the gold standard. But usually diagnosis is clinical and the cough needs to be going on for more than two weeks in order to be diagnosed for portatella pertussis, okay? But the culture uh, is usually gold standard and we usually get that from the posterior nasopharynx. And then treatment for this is usually going to be with macrolides, so you can give them erythromycin, azithromycin, or clorithromycin, okay? But usually erythromycin is going to be the drug of choice. So once again, pertussis, it's caused by bordetella pertussis. You have three phases, okay? You have your first phase, which is going to be the catarrhal phase. This is the most infectious phase. This patient's going to be presenting with fever, cough, uh, rhinorrhea, excessive lacrimation. And then you have your second phase, the paroxysmal phase. This is where the patient's going to be presenting with that paroxysmal whooping cough. Sometimes in the question stem, it'll say that the patient vomits with the cough because they're coughing so much and they're gagging. The third stage is going to be the convalescent phase. This is where the patient has already had a reduction in the symptoms. Uh, usually the treatment is going to be with erythromycin, any of your mycolides, but erythromycin is going to be the drug of choice and it's caused by what? Bordetella pertussis. Okay, next one's going to be rabies. So rabies, this is a very deadly disease, okay? That's why it's really important that we diagnose these patients and they come in quickly to be treated because it's very deadly. Um, I think I was listening, I looked to listen to the podcast. I was listening to a podcast and I think it was on, it was This Week in Virology. It's a good podcast, talks about viruses. It was a doctor that was talking about how they had a child that came in first day, got sent home, came back the second day and had died, uh, ended up having rabies. So that's why it's really important that we treat these patients immediately. So rabies, it's uh, basically a deadly viral encephalitis. It's caused by a bite or scratch by an animal that's infected, okay? They can also be, rabies can also be infect. the patient can also be infected with rabies from a corneal transplant also. And with these patients, how are they going to present? And once they start having these symptoms, it's because it's already prolonged and it's very high likelihood that they're going to uh, die from this. So with rabies, they're going to be presenting with prodromal symptoms of a sore throat, fatigue, headache, nausea, vomiting. They'll also be presenting with encephalitis symptoms, so like fever, seizures, uh, confusion. Sometimes they might be aggressive. Um, hyperactivity, hydrophobia is a huge one with ra with rabies. So this one's usually pathognomonic for rabies. Hydrophobia, which is where they are not able to drink, okay? They have a laryngeal spasm with drinking, hypersalivation, foaming of the mouth, right? This is the one where you see dogs that have rabies, like foaming of the mouth. And then ascending paralysis. How are you gonna diagnose these patients? Basically, we're gonna do a virus or viral antigen from the infected tissue or from the saliva. And then we're gonna do a histology, okay? The histology is gonna show us nigri bodies. What's going to be the treatment for this? We of sure want to clean the wound thoroughly, okay? If it's the animal still alive, then we want to make sure that we send the animal for immunofluorescence of the brain tissue. Well, that's if they're, they're dead, I'm sorry. But if they're alive, then we want to capture them and observe them for 10 days. If the patient does have rabies, we want to give him passive immunization, so human rabies um, Ig 40 units into the wound in gluteal region. And then active immunization, also human diploid cell rabies vaccine in three IM doses into the deltoid or thigh over 28 days. It's usually going to be at day three, three, day seven, day 14, and day 28, which is good because they used to do this rabies vaccine like in the umbilical area, and it used to be very painful. So now they, they've moved to doing it in the um, deltoid or thigh. So that's good. So once again, rabies is very, very deadly. And... Usually what's pathognomonic is that they're presenting with hydrophobia, which is where they have, um, they aren't able to drink, and this progresses to coma and death with rabies. 
And what you're going to find is you're going to see nigri bodies in histology. So if this is anywhere about nigri bodies, think about rabies. So next one's going to be salmonellosis. This one's very, very highly tested, so make sure that you're familiar with this. Usually a patient's going to have a history that they ate uh, chicken, meat, or eggs, sometimes even turtle exposure. Um, how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with fever, a bloody diarrhea, and abdominal cramps. Okay. And then the diagnostic study is going to be, you're going to see uh, white blood cells. And treatment is usually going to be ciprofloxacin. Another thing that you need to know about salmonella is that it's the most common cause of osteomyelitis in what type of patients? Sickle cell disease. Remember when we talked about during our hematology and oncology discussion, discussion some of the things that you need to know is that the bacteria more commonly caused in osteomyelitis is going to be in patients in sickle cell, it's going to be salmonella. So make sure that you know that. So how do we treat salmonellosis? It's going to be with ciprofloxacin, usually in severe illness. Okay. Another thing I wanted to discuss about rabies is that um, bats are very commonly known to transmit rabies. So sometimes I had a question like with a patient was just in the room and there was a bat that flew in the room and the bat was like flying around and you need to know that the patient was prone to getting rabies, okay? Because bats are known to carry rabies. So not only dogs and like your wild animals, bats. Okay, next one's gonna be sugalosis. With uh, sugalosis, the patient's gonna present with uh, bloody and then they're gonna have mucus in, the, mucus in their stool. So it's gonna be a bloody mucoid diarrhea. And the patient can also present with seizures, but seizures is usually more common in children. Basically, you're going to look at the, uh, you're going to do fecal studies or you'll see fecal red blood cells and white blood cells. And usually with these patients, treatment is going to be ciprofloxacin, which to get some of the complications is that it can cause hemolytic uremic syndrome and then, of course, reactive arthritis. Okay, so if you notice the difference between shigellosis and salmonellosis, because I get them very, very confused, is that with shigellosis, they're going to have a bloody mucoid diarrhea versus salmonellosis is just going to be a bloody diarrhea, okay? Shigellosis, mucid, bloody diarrhea, so mucus and then blood in the diarrhea. And then for shigellosis and salmonellosis, it's going to be just a fever and bloody diarrhea. Of course, you have fever also in shigellosis, but you only have bloody diarrhea and salmonellosis. All right, next one's going to be syphilis. So syphilis is, is caused by a spirochete, okay? What other disease that, infectious disease that we talked about today, I know there's a bunch of them, but the one that we discussed today so far is also caused by a spirochete. It's going to be what? Lyme disease, okay? And Lyme disease is caused by what? What's the name of the spirochete? It's going to be Bor Borrelia burgdorferi, okay? Syphilis is another spirochete, and the spirochete name is Treponema pallidum. Make sure that you know that. This is usually caused by or transmitted through sexual contact. How is the patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with a painless, once again, it's going to be a painless canker, okay? Make sure that you know that because there's different types of cankers that you're going to see. Some of them are painful and, and painless. If it says it's painless, think about syphilis. So it's going to be a painless canker. This patient's also going to be presenting with inguinal lymphadenopathy, this is usually the primary stage, so we have several stages in syphilis. The secondary stage, this is where the patient's more contagious. This is where they present with their flu-like symptoms of having a sore throat, weakness, headache, and it tends to develop about 48 weeks after the canker has gotten better, so it's healed. These patients are going to be presenting with a macular papular rash. It's going to start in the sides of the trunk. And... Some of these patients can also develop aseptic meningitis, alopecia, and hepatitis. And then you have the latent phase. With these patients, basically, they're going to have presence of positive serological tests, but they're not going to have any clinical signs or symptoms. So that's why it's called the latent phase, is that they usually remain asymptomatic, and then once they get to the tertiary stage, that's when they start having symptoms again. So the tertiary stage, this occurs like years after they started having after the primary infection. And some of the, how are these patients gonna present in tertiary? They're gonna have neurosyphilis, okay? Cardiovascular syphilis also, and then gummas, which are these subcutaneous granulomas. 
They can also present with neurosyphilis, um, tabes dorsalis, which is a posterior column degeneration. They have loss of coordination and movement. But usually we don't see patients that go on to the tertiary phase because um, of course, usually with these patients, we're able to treat them, okay? But before penicillin was treated, but penicillin was invented, a lot of these patients did progress to the tertiary stage. But nowadays, we don't unless, of course, they come from, uh, from another country. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to do usually a dark field microscopy. This is going to be the gold standard. So a dark field microscopy is going to be the gold standard. The next thing I'm going to discuss, you have to know because you're going to have a question on this. We're going to do, usually usually what we do is that we do serological tests. So we do the RPR and the VDRL, okay? So RPR stands for Rapid Plasma Reagent, and then VDRL starts for Venereal Disease Research Laboratory. These are going to be done for screening, okay? This is going to be a screening test. But what's going to help us confirm it? What's going to help us confirm it is going to be the fluorescent triple nemo antibody absorption test. So the FT-ABS test. So that's going to help us confirm it. And then we want to make sure that we test all these patients for all other CDs or AIDS, HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Okay. So once again, with syphilis, it's caused by a, trep uh, a treponema pallidum, which is going to be a spirochete. We have our primary phase, our latent, and then our tertiary phase. I'm um, sorry, primary, secondary, latent, and tertiary. So with primary, usually this is where they just got infected. They're going to have this painless crater-like lesion, and it's going to be indurated. These patients are also going to be presenting with inguinal lymphadenopathy. And then we have the secondary phase. This is where the patient's very, very contagious. They're going to have flu-like symptoms, and they're going to develop this maculopapular rash and it's going to start in the size of the trunk. Usually, it, uh, the secondary phase happens after the canker has healed. And then we have the latent phase. The latent is basically where the patient has positive serological tests. So they have on their test, it shows that they're positive for syphilis, but they don't have any signs or symptoms of syphilis. Most of these patients will then go on to tertiary phase, where this is it's been years already since the patient got infected, and they're going to be presenting with neurosyphilis, so have cardiovascular syphilis also, gummus, neurosyphilis also, tabes dorsalis is a common one. And how are we going to diagnose these patients? What's the gold standard? It's going to be a dark field microscopy. If it tells you what's the next best step or the next screening, we're going to do an RPR VDRL. This is just for screening. And then our um, confirmation is going to be our FTA-ABS, which is going to be our fluorescent trepanemal antibody absorption test. And then you want to make sure that you test these patients for all other STDs, AIDS, HIV, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, okay? And how are we going to treat these patients? We're going to treat them with penicillin G benzathine. It's usually one dose. Once again, penicillin G benzathine, okay? Okay, guys, so it's going to toxoplasmosis, specifically cerebral toxmos toxoplasmosis. So this is the most common central nervous system infection found in patients that have AIDS, especially patients that are not compliant with their medications or patients that are just basically not being treated with medications because they don't know that they have AIDS. So with these patients, um, how are these patients going to present and what's the most common cause of uh, toxoplasmosis? So it's going to be toxoplasma gondii. This is a type of parasite. It's an intracellular parasite. And the host, like we discussed, it's usually found in cat feces, okay? and it's transmitted orally. So it can also be transmitted from like any type of soil or food, water that's contaminated. Cat litter box, that's why we say that we tell pregnant women not to handle cat litter boxes because it's of this parasite. So the patient is basically gonna be presenting with a headache, they're gonna have fever, ultra mental status, they're gonna be presenting with seizures also, okay? cervical lymphadenopathy also. And how are we going to diagnose these patients? So what we want to do is that we want to do a contrast CT with these patients. It's going to be a contrast CT, double dose contrast CT, and we're going to see multiple peripheral ring enhancing lesions, okay? Usually in the basal ganglia. This is going to tell us that the patient has uh, 
toxoplasmosis or cerebral toxoplasmosis. If you see ring-enhancing lesions on a CT scan, then you want to think about toxoplasmosis. Also, we can do uh, serum IgG and IgM antibodies for toxoplasmosis, and then you're going to see the IgG titers that are going to be present in these patients. And CD4 count for these patients. Remember we said toxoplasmosis is more commonly found in patients that have a CD4 count less than 100 if they have AIDS. And then if we do a cerebral spinal fluid test, we're going to see elevated intracranial pressure. We'll see pleos, uh, mononuclear pleocytosis and then increased protein and gamma globulin level. But make sure that you know that you, on your contrast CT, you're going to see ring enhancing lesions for these patients. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? First line is going to be sulfadiazine and permeth permethamine. Okay. So once again, first line is going to be sulfadiazine and permeth per per pure methamine. Okay. And you can use Bactrim as prophylaxis. So if a patient has a CD4 count less than 100, then we want to give them Bactrim for as prophylaxis. But if they have toxoplasmosis, uh, cerebral toxoplasmosis, then we want to give him sulfadiazine and permethamine. All right, so that was cerebral toxoplasmosis. It's usually going to be a patient that has AIDS, and they're going to tell you that their AIDS counts less than 100. It'll tell you that they have a ring enhancing lesions on a CT. So you want to think about toxoplasmosis. Okay. Next one's going to be tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is commonly caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is an acid-fast bacilli. It's really transmitted by aerosolized droplets. It's commonly found in patients that are immunocompromised, like we discussed. So if a patient is on an immunosuppressant, like if they have organ transplants, if they have HIV or AIDS, also in patients that are immigrants, right? If they immigrate from another country, any patient that works as a health worker, that's why they test us yearly as for students that are rotating for any health worker for tuberculosis, alcoholics also, uh, IV drug abusers. And the patient is going to be presenting with fatigue, weight loss, fever, night sweats, and then also a productive cough. But usually it'll say that the patient has uh, fatigue, weight loss, fever, and night sweats. And Usually the weight loss is, I'm like, okay, this might be tuberculosis. And if it tells you that the patient mi migrated from another country, you want to think about tuberculosis. How are we going to diagnose this patient? We're basically going to do a sputum stain. We're going to do an acid fast bacilli. And usually the sputum culture is going to be positive for tuberculosis. We're also going to do a PPD, but usually the PPD is not very, uh, it's, it's, it'll, it's positive, but sometimes we have a better, u better test, which is going to be the sputum stain. Okay. And then also we're going to do a chest x-ray. This is where we're going to see caseating granulomas. Usually the pulmonary opacities are going to be found on the apex of the lung, okay? And the treatment's going to be with ripe uh, therapy, which I'm going to discuss in a little bit more detail. So we have primary, secondary, which is a reactivation, and then extra pulmonary tuberculosis. So with primary tuberculosis, what happens is that the patient inhales, of course, the tuberculosis, and then these granulomas form. They basically wall off the bacteria, and then that's where it remains dormant in the body. And then you have secondary tuberculosis, which is going to be reactivation. This is where in your immune system, for some reason, has decreased, whether you got a malignancy, uh, you're not eating well, diabetes, HIV, surgeries, and then this is where the tuberculosis is going to come back and it's going to reactivate. It's going to be found usually on the apical posterior segments on the lung. And that's how you're going to tell that it's a reactivation or secondary tuberculosis is that it's found in the apical or posterior portions of the lung. And then we have extra pulmonary tuberculosis. This is where impaired immunity cannot contain bacteria, so it disseminates. This is usually uh, commonly found in patients that are immunocompromised like HIV. So what is going to be the treatment for these patients? So we're going to do the ripe therapy, right? The rifampin, isoniazide, the perzinamide, and then the ethambutyl. So which is very highly tested for these drugs, okay? Is that rifampin causes hepatotoxicity. With rifampin, these patients can also present with red, orange, 
um, urine, tears, okay? And then that's why with these patients, we want to make sure that they are careful with their contact lenses if they're on rifampin because it can stain their contact lenses. So with pathognomonic for rifampin, it's a red, orange in um, urine, tears, and sweat, okay? With these patients, we want to make sure that we check their LFTs before we're putting them on rifampin because it can cause hepatotoxicity. Isoniazide, with these patients, it can cause peripheral neuropathy and a rash. This one can also cause hepatotoxicity. Once again, we want to make sure with isoniazide, we're getting LFTs. With isoniazide, also with these patients, we want to put them on vitamin B6 because it can prevent neuropathy. Okay? I had a question on my pack rat a few uh, weeks ago over isoniazide. It was a patient that developed vitamin B6 deficiency, and then it um, told me what was a culprit, and it was isoniazide. Another way this question was asked was the patient was presenting with uh, per, with neuropathy. The patient was on isoniazide, and then it asked you which vitamin, um, if the patient would have given be given this vitamin, then what would have this patient would would have not presented with these symptoms. Which vitamin was it? And you need to know it was vitamin B six. Sometimes it won't say B six; it'll say vitamin A, B, C, D, like broad like that. So just know it's vitamin B. Vitamin B six with isoniazide, you give it because it can prevent neuropathy and it causes peripheral neuropathy if you don't give once again um, you don't give vitamin b6 with isoniazide and then we have perizinamide which causes hepatotoxicity it can also also cause hyperuricemia so with these patients we want to make sure that we test them uh, their lft once again and then we get a uric acid before we put them on perizinamide per 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 and then we have ethambutyl this one causes a rash but it's known for causing Optic neuropathy. How I memorized it was E, E for eyes, E at the mutal. It causes a red and green color blindness. So make sure that you know that this is very, very highly tested. So that's why I went through each one. So once again, rifampin, it's going to cause the red, orange, urine, tears, sweat. Isoniazide is going to cause peripheral neuropathy. That's why we want to make sure that we're giving vitamin B6 with isoniazide to prevent this peripheral neuropathy. And then perizinamide, with this one, it causes hyperuricemia. And then ethambutyl will cause optic neuropathy, so the patient will have the red-green color blindness. So that was the ripe therapy, okay? All right, so now that we've gone over that, let's go over our last topic for infectious diseases, which is going to be varicella zoster. Varicella zoster, we usually present varicella zoster by vaccinating patients, right? Who are we going to vaccinate? We're usually going to give Zostavax, which is this live attenuated virus. It's going to be given to patients that are 50 to 59 years old who are not immunocompromised. They're not pregnant, okay? So varicella zoster, it's more commonly found in patients that are older. So if they're older than 50 years old, and what happens is that there is is a reactivation of the varicella zoster virus. Like we just discussed, this virus remains dormant where? In the dorsal root ganglia. And it's reactivated when the patient is stressed out, if they had some type of infection, or if they're ill. It occurs only in patients who have had chickenpox. It's very contagious. So what are some of the signs that the patient's going to be presenting with herpes zoster? They're going to have severe pain and a rash, but it's usually going to be described in a dermatomal distribution. So once again, it's going to be in a dermatomal distribution. It's, they're going to have pain before the patient develops the rash. The thorax is actually the most common area. And then usually they'll present also with vesicles that are going to become postular. And then these pustules are then going to crust um, by seven to 10 days. And usually whenever we see crusting, that means that the patient's no longer infectious. So how's it gonna be described? It'll say, once again, grouped vesicles on an erythematous space, remember? So dew drops on a rose puddle. Some of the complications and the reason why we need to treat herpes zoster is that the patient can present with postherpetic neuralgia, okay? Which is a very excruciating pain that after the lesions have gone away, <clears throat> you have this. So how are we gonna diagnose this patient? We can do the zinc smear, but we wanna make sure that we do the culture of the fluid. That's usually going to be what's going to confirm, uh, confirm it, okay? So once again, culture of vesicular fluid is going to tell us that the patient is gonna have varicella that's confirmatory. 
How are we going to treat these patients? Basically, we can give them analgesics. Um, we can also give them antivirals like acyclovir. And then also to make sure that we vaccinate these patients, okay? All right, so that was varicella zoster virus. And we are done, guys. That was all of um, internal medicine. You are, that, those were all the notes that I had um, when I was studying. And I went hopefully through what I remember being tested, what it was, whether it was through questions, practice questions that I was going through or questions that I remember when I was taking the EOR. So hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. I know it's long. It took me a long time to record. So if you keep seeing me change backgrounds and changing clothing, it's because I recorded this over probably like a two month period. So I would record this whenever I had time. I got out of clinic or I had free time before going to clinic. Like right now I go to clinic at one. So I had some free time and I said I wanted to finish this video. So hopefully this video is helpful. If I made any mistakes, please, please correct me because I know sometimes if I'm really tired, especially if I'm doing it after clinic, I'm I'm doing this video after clinic, I might miss some stuff or miss say things. So please correct me. If you have any cool mnemonics of ways to remember certain things, make sure that you comment below so you can help other students, okay? And then like I said, when I was studying for this, I basically focused the three weeks on learning the information. And then the last two weeks, I did a lot of practice questions like a lot, a lot, a lot. I mean, I think I did over like 500, I think, for for this rotation for internal medicine because it's a hard exam. It was actually one of the harder ones for me. It's very hard. So make sure that you study well for your internal medicine uh, rotation exam. You do lots of practice questions. I really recommend it because then you start seeing patterns as you saw me discussing the things that I went over. And if I repeated it over and over again, then it's because it's something that I saw that was very highly tested or something that I kept getting questions on over. So if there was things that I didn't spend too much time on, it's because I didn't see this topic tested. But if it's something that I kept repeating over and over again, and I kept re-emphasizing, it's because it's very, very highly tested. And repetition is a key. I really recommend flashcards. Like I said, on day one, when I started studying, I started with flashcards until the day before I took the exam. I did flashcards the entire time. And I did flashcards over the topics. And usually, like I said, in those two weeks, when I did the questions, whatever my subject that I was studying for was weak, like my weak subjects, as you can tell, is definitely endocrine. Endocrine is like one of my really, really weak subjects. And so what I did is that I would focus on endocrine and make sure that I knew the information before I went and took the exam. Your EOR for internal medicine is very heavily based on cardio, and that's what your pants is also. Your pants is like 20%, correct me if I'm wrong, of cardiology. So make sure that you know your cardiology. Make sure that you know your murmurs. Make sure that you know your EKGs, okay? I hate EKGs, and to this day, I still struggle with them. But for your exam, you're going to have a lot of that. So just make sure that you know that. And once again, repetition, repetition, repetition. I know this video is a little long, but if you listen to them when you're driving, on your way to clinic, on your way back to clinic, especially for those of you who have long drives, I would listen to podcasts, YouTube videos from other medical students that were talking about their shelf because it has similar topics to our EORs. I would listen to their videos whenever I was driving, if I was working out, if I went out for a walk, if I went out for a run, if I was cooking, I even listened to them. So whenever I cut, I listen to them. It's basically repetition, and that's how you're going to learn the information. And like I said, I also recommended certain movies. Um, and usually if you have free time, I know sometimes it's hard, but if you have free time, try to watch those just as a free time, and it will really help cement that idea or whatever topic you're studying in your written. And that's what I did. So that's what it helped me out. And I did really, really well in this exam. So... Hopefully, my notes will help you guys out. If you have any questions, please comment below. And like I said, if I made any mistakes, please let me know. Okay? Thanks for watching my video, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.